So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto was born with Sharingan. The movie. If you guys enjoy this, what if? Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. The Blue Eyed Ichiha Chapter 1. The birth of a legend. The night was that of a Friday, I know that doesn't matter in a ninja village, but this night was special as. Ah hurry up and get this baby out of me. Somebody was giving birth. And yet at the same time, it was a day of destruction as a demon was attacking the village. Except this wasn't just some weak run-of-the-mill type of demon, no, this was the Kaiubi no Kitsune, the strongest demon known to man. Why was it attacking the village, that is a question no one knew, and they weren't going to ask it as it was killing every ninja that was in its range. But with tales that, with a single swing, can cause earthquakes, tsunamis, and many other natural occurring disasters, everything was in its range. In the hospital, Namaki's Uzumaki Kashina was not what you would call a patient person, she was yelling to the doctor to hurry up and deliver her baby. Come on keep pushing, I can see the head. The doctor spoke as she helped Kashina give birth. Her husband, Namaki's Minato, was right by her side encouraging her and having his hand squeezed. Come on honey breathe, breathe, A-A-A-H-H-H. He yelled as his wife squeezed his hand a little too hard. The doctor had most of the infants out, alright give me one last big push. Ah, congratulations Namika's sama he's a handsome and healthy baby boy. She said as she let Minato cut the cord and clean the baby off before handing the baby to the tired mother. Ashina smiled down to her newborn child, hello little one, I'm your Kasan, welcome to life. She said softly as the infant began to cry, before she started to rock it gently to calmness. Minato-kun, what do we call him? She asked her husband, knocking him out of his stupor, of finally becoming a father. Minato wrapped his arms around his wife and kid as he made a shadow clone to take their first picture as a family. We'll name him Naruto, Namek is Uzumaki Naruto. He said, but unfortunately the moment was interrupted when an Anbu came in. The Anbu bowed as he spoke through his dragon mask, Hokage-sama, the Kaiubi is nearly at the village, you have to help us. The Anbu begged as the Yandane dismissed him with a wave of his hand. Minato then turned to his wife who had tears in her eyes, it's time isn't it? She said under her breath as she continued to rock her child. Can I just have a little more time with him? She asked this time kissing her son all over his face. She kissed his head again as he opened his eyes and she saw his freshly blue gray eyes. She smiled down at him as her own emerald-like eyes bled into red as her Sharingan came to life to help memorize her son's smiling baby face. You have to understand her history first, her grandmother on her mother's side of the family was an Achiha, and her grandfather on her father's side of the family was a Senju, but not just any Senju, this one was Hashirama himself. She herself married an Amakas and she's in Yuzumaki, so her child was literally going to be the strongest ninja in history, maybe even exceeding the Rikidu Senen. But the Achiha's bloodline, the Yuzumaki's longevity and large chakra reserves, the Namakas's stamina and amazing techniques, and the Senju's military intelligence, analytical minds and their uncanny ability to be cage level, then it's no question just how strong Naruto will become. She could tell that she didn't have much time, since she had lost a large amount of blood, and no amount of blood pills would bring it back. Her fully matured Sharingan eyes morphed into that of a four-pointed star, Tsukuyomi. She whispered as she sent her son into a three-day-long Jinjutsu that only lasted a single second in real life. What she did in the three-day span will most likely be known later in his life when the memory of the event is systematically unlocked later in his life. What was weird though was that her chakra levels seriously plummeted, the machine monitoring it was going crazy at the sudden drop. Minato had seen what his wife did, but like always, he didn't have time to panic as she was done a second later, but who said he didn't panic as he watched a machine go crazy a second later, as his wife's chakra levels dropped down from 85% to 25%. Oh shit. He muttered as he quickly stepped to her bedside and popped a soldier pill in her mouth, and her chakra levels rose to 35%, but he didn't see that, all he saw was her Sharingan fade from view. He wasn't the Yandane for nothing as he noticed a slight flux of energy enter Naruto before disappearing altogether, who I understand now. He thought as Kashina gave him one final kiss to Naruto's head then gave him to her husband saying in a very low and raspy voice, go save the village. She said that with tears in her eyes as they shared one final kiss, knowing they weren't going to see each other in this life. Just when he stopped the kiss and left, the nurse finally entered to check on Kashina after hearing the chakra machine. Kashina gave last thought as she felt her life slip out of her body, take that, Kaiubi, it's time for you to enter yet another Yuzumaki, and after this one, you'll never experience freedom ever again. She thought as she fully passed, with a smirk on her face. On the battlefield, the ninja of the village were still doing battle with the Kaiubi, when the Yandame appeared on top of the toad boss summon, Gamabunta, the chief toad. 
Yandame is here, we're saved. A random Jounin yelled. Another giant toad appeared, on top of this one was Jureya, and the Sandame, this toad was Gamakin. And Jureya were even more saved. The same Jounin yelled again. And though reinforcements had arrived the Kaiubi was still doing damage to the village, and he even winded Gamabunta in his left eye. That was seconds before the retreating shinobi witnessed a bright flash of light, and when the battlefield became clear again, they only saw Gamakin, with the Sandame and Jureya on his head. No Minato, Gamabunta, or even Kaiubi. It took a second for them to realize that the Kaiubi had been defeated, they expressed their immense joy at the defeat of the great Kaiubi no Kitsune. And it was all thanks to the Yandame, and speaking of the Yandame, hey where's the Yandame? A Jounin asked a question that made many shut up and think about it. They now knew that the Yandame gave up his life to get rid of the great demon fox, they took about a second to mourn the loss of their Yandame, before they renewed their cheering of their victory over that of the Kaiubi. Closer to the disappearance of the Kaiubi was Jureya and Hiruzen, and they were searching for the body of Minato. Even after a thorough search for the body they still couldn't find it, even after a flux of chakra filled the air minutes ago, they just couldn't pinpoint the location it came from, with all the leftovers in the air. They were beginning to give up on the search, until they heard the sound of crying inside of one of Kaiubi's larger and deeper footprints, at least a dozen feet deep. We found them. An Anbu yelled to his leader. Soon Jureya and Hiruzen and a squad of Anbu were at the site. Sandame and his student jumped into the crater and walked to the blonde pair. Minato was pale like his soul was recently taken from him, and little Naruto was still crying, nobody knew what was happening to him, but the Sandame took a closer look as he bent down to pick him up, what he saw nearly made him faint. In the child's eyes was a fully matured Sharingan, and the commas were spinning crazily before vanishing from view, returning the infant's eyes to their original blue-gray. This truly was the birth of a legend. Chapter 2 decisions. The Sandame, Jureya, and the Anbu were jumping towards the hospital to return the child to his mother, when a toad appeared in a puff of smoke on Jureya's shoulder and whispered in his ear. He stopped and listened to the toad, this made the others stop as well. What is Jureya Kun? Sandame asked his only remaining student as he carefully held the infant in his arms. Jureya's eyes were getting wider and wider the more the toad said. The toad disappeared as his missions were successful. Jureya handed over the body of his student to the nearest Anbu, after saying a quick prayer for his lost pupil, Sensei, Gamasui just informed me of Orochimaru's last whereabouts, you know I have to go and check it out. He also told me that he recently joined an organization of some sorts, and I need to check what kind of organization. I'll be back whenever I have the time to, Ja. He said as he body flickered away. Sandame's eyes narrowed after hearing about his once favorite student, he knew he should have just killed him, a couple of months ago, for his treasonous acts, but he just couldn't find it in him to commit the deed. He sighed as they finally reached the hospital to return the baby to his mother and to tell her the grim news about her husband. He looked at the only Anbu that remained at his side, the others had gone to take Yandame's body to the morgue. This Anbu wore an Inu mask, and behind that you would see the face of a battle-hardened 15-year-old, the third shinobi war was truly devastating to all. The top of his head you could see silver hair that seemed to defy gravity as it stood up, diagonally, in the air. He wore the standard armor required for Anbu and carried the standard ninja too that Anbu carried as their weapons. They would have walked into the lobby of the hospital if the head doctor wasn't there to stop them. What is it you want, Nico, sunlight? Asked the Sandame. Nico, the head doctor, bowed, I'm sorry to disturb you Hokage-sama, but I must tell you that Yuzumaki Kashina passed away a half hour ago. She said bowing again, this one lower than the last. Both the Sandame and Inu's eyes widened, Kashina was dead, no it couldn't be. They blasted past the doctor and into the building, but halfway to the room they saw her being carried in a body bag. As the body passed Naruto, woke up and began to cry, reminding them that they still had him. I guess that he somehow could sense the death of his mother, just like he had with his father. What are you going to do with the child now, Hokage-sama? Inu asked his leader, who was trying to calm the child down, but it was to no avail. Sandane gave him a long and heavy sigh as he started walking out of the hospital. I don't know, I have to get the council together for a decision on the boy's future. Two hours later, Sandane gathered the council for the meeting. He only wanted the shinobi council, but he had to call in the civilian council to talk about the reconstruction process. After talking about all of that, Shimura Danzo spoke up, so are you going to finalize your decision on being reinstated for the seat of cage? Because if not I think that will do a great job on being the goddamn of Konoha he said after a moment of thinking. The others were nodding their head at the first question, only the civvies and the other elders were nodding their heads at the second statement. The Sandame looked at the bandaged man, yes, I reinstated myself as the Hokage. He said, causing Danzo to frown. Now I have something more important to tell you. You know when I said earlier that the Kaiubi had been killed by my predecessor, well that wasn't entirely true, the Kaiubi was in fact defeated, but it was not killed. He said with a straight serious face. 
What is it you have to say Hokage-sama? Hai Ugehiashi asked, this man was the leader of his clan just like the other members of the shinobi council. He was considered a genius in the uses of his clan's dejutsu, the Byakugan. He was 34 years old and stood at 5 feet 7. He had pale skin and the wide eyes associated with his clan. Yes, what is it you have to tell us that was so important that it wasn't the first thing to talk about? Asked Ichiha Fugaku with a tone that told everyone he was irritated that the meeting had to continue. He was the leader of his own clan and also the leader of the village's police force, so we all could understand why he was acting this way. He was 35 years old and was 5 feet 3 inches, he had lightly tanned skin and black eyes that would turn red and show his clan's dejutsu, the Sharingan. He also had a three-year-old son named Itachi, who was already showing that he had skills in the ninja arts. The sand aim lightly glared at the two, well I would have told you if you hadn't interrupted me. Now, like I was saying, Kairubi wasn't killed, but it was sealed into a newborn baby. As he said the Kakashi entered the room with Naruto in his arms. It took a moment for the information to register in their minds, before some of the room's occupants started yelling for the death of the baby Kairubi. Haruno Sakumi's banshee-like voice far surpassed that of the others as she yelled, Hokage-sama I beg of you, you must kill that demon. It killed my entire clan. The voice screeched loudly shutting everyone up and also making Inuzuka Tsum and her ninja dog cover their ears. But everybody didn't really care about the pink-haired family of banshees, every person in that Kami-forsaken clan was just as loud as she was, even the old people. One person spoke up, I mean no disrespect Sakumi, but who the fuck cares? Mitakato Hemura asked, shocking everyone at the explicit, as they all looked at him. What? He asked again. He was part of the elder council with Danzo and his old teammate Yudatane Kaharu. Before the Sandane could talk, laughter was heard in the room, it was loud and boisterous. It was coming from a woman, she had wild and spiky brown hair, red fang marks going down each of her cheeks and brown eyes with a slitted pupil. Going further down you could see her jown in flak jacket and brownish shirt, hiding what I believe to be a small D-cup breast. She stood at 5 feet 5 inches, and she was 23 years old. She was in Yazuka Tsum, and sitting next to her was her companion Kurameru. He was a gruff and tough-looking dog, he had an eye patch over his right eye and was tall enough to reach Tsum's waist. He had a bluish coat on top of his body with a white coat for his underbody. Man for an old bastard, you sure can make jokes. She said laughing more, the weak Kai coming from Sakumi wasn't affecting her in any way, but the Kai coming from the Hokage made her stop laughing. She chuckled weakly as she said, sorry Hokage-sama, continue please. She said adding the please for an added measure. Saratobi nodded at her accepting the apology, now Sakumi, I'm sorry, but I can't kill this child. He said, raising his hand, stopping her retort. I can't and won't kill this child because he has the strongest lineage this village has ever produced. I'm sure you all remember the Uzumaki clan. He asked the council, watching them nod their heads, well this is the heir to that, but not only that clan, he is also the heir to the Namika's clan. He added watching their reactions. The room was yet again sent into an uproar, many saying liar and others saying where's the proof. It wasn't until Aburam Shaibi spoke up, you're right I can see the resemblance, it's as clear as day. Who else in this entire village has blonde hair like that? If you take away the whisker marks on the boy's cheeks, then you have an exact replica of the Yandame Hokage. The man spoke, shutting up everyone with his general logic. This man stood at 5 feet 8 inches, he was 30 years old. I'm sorry, but that is all I can tell you as he was wearing a dark grey coat and hood that took away all of his features, he also wore a pair of black shades to take away the colour of his eyes. But all of this didn't make everybody respect his logic, it was because he is considered the strongest in the village, thanks to clan's Kikai bugs, but even his clan's bugs didn't do squat to the Kaiubi, as it destroyed every one of the bugs most of his clan members sent at it. He lost many of his clan members tonight. Well nobody asked you, you freak. Sakumi muttered under her breath, it didn't get on Shaibi's nerves like many thought it would, but it did get on somebody else's. Deep it quiet, some people are trying to sleep, this whole meeting is troublesome. The man said as he tried to attempt to go back to sleep. He was Nara Shikaku, he had black hair and a pineapple-like style, lazy brown eyes, and wore a jown in flak jacket and some kind of deer fur over it. He also wore some mesh under this with a black shirt going over that. He stood at 5 feet 7 inches and was 27 years old. Both of his teammates were on either side of him, Akamichi Chauza and Yamanaka Inoichi. Chauza was a large and kind man that was always eating, he wore some kind of armor and had a single purple squiggly thing on each of his cheeks. He was 27 years old and stood at 5 feet 6 inches. Yamanaka Inoichi was also a kind man that could be fierce when he wanted to, just like any other ninja in Konoha. He wore the regular Jounin outfit and had some kind of faded blonde hair and a long ponytail. He stood at 5 feet and 11 inches and was 27 years old. These three men made up a special group called Inoshikacho. 
they were put together in the Second Shinobi War and were made famous with their impressive teamwork. Everything to you is troublesome, Shikaku. Both Chaozi and Inoichi said. The Hokage cleared his throat to get the attention on him again. Well, if all of you are done interrupting this meeting, I would like to continue. Now where was I? He asked himself. Oh that's right, why I couldn't or wouldn't kill the child, not only because it is the heir to both the Uzumaki and Namika's clans, but there's one other thing that I suspect each and every one of you will be surprised by, none more than Yufugaku. He said looking at the Ichiha clan head. This made the Ichiha confused as he didn't know anything that could really surprise him. What is Hokage-sama? He asked, feeling anxiety at the moment. The Hokage tilted his hat down, shadowing his eyes as he spoke, it's the real reason why I won't kill the child, it's because he has. He said. Everyone's eyes widened to epic proportions as they couldn't believe the information that was just given to them. Even the civilian's eyes widened, the same civvies that didn't know a single thing about the ninja world. The biggest surprise didn't even come yet as the Sandane continued speaking, also the Sharingan is fully matured. He added, making most nearly faint at that last piece of information. Anzo couldn't let the opportunity pass up as he quickly stood up, Siratobi, you must let me train him to properly teach him what he needs to survive, the harsh realities of the shinobi world. Under my tutelage he'll soon become the strongest in the village, maybe even the whole elemental nations, and he'll be loyal to this village. He said with his power-hungry voice. No, Hokage-sama, you can't have him train Naruto-san, he'll make Naruto-san loyal to only him. Since he does have the Sharingan that means that he is in Achiha and thus should be trained by my clan and live in my compound. Fugaku spoke in a strong voice as he too stood up to his feet. Before the Hokage could give his answer, he was interrupted again, pardon my interruptions Hokage-sama, but if I may ask, how exactly did the child gain a fully matured Sharingan in the first place? Shikaku asked, getting everyone's attention, as they too pondered the question. This also got the Hokage thinking as he too pondered the question himself. Flashback, the Kaiubi had just been sealed into the child when it entered the child's mind where it would rest up, but before it did, he noticed something off about this baby. Wait, this feels familiar. Wait a minute this is in Yuzumaki baby, Nuu. It started to make noise as it crashed around in his cage. In heaven a woman with red hair and angel wings suddenly found herself smirking for no apparent reason. Iwubi continued to crash into his cage when he noticed something on the other side of his cage, two something as he looked at them. One was a big red ball of energy and the other was a big ball of blue energy. He then noticed something else about his new container, and this boy is a descendant of one of my creations, like Kishina. He thought the name Kashina was poisonous to his mind. I don't know any other people I hate more than her. Well maybe Madara, but he's burning in hell, so he doesn't count. Well with this child I'll set my mistake straight and have him kill the ones I want. He thought as he made his chakra move quickly and release both of the energy balls, causing them to spread around the boy's chakra system, enlarging his chakra coils and making the child cry at the act. Shut up Brad it's getting noisy in here, I can't concentrate. He spoke to nothing as he made his chakra hurry up before the seal could finalize itself and shut off his chakra. He used his chakra to try and release the restrictions to the boy's Sharingan, being the creator gave him the ability to do just that. As he finished a luminescent eye appeared in front of him, showing different forms of the Manjiku Sharingan, before it rested on the same four-pointed star Kishina had, it then it went through the regular Sharingan forms before it rested on the three spinning comma form and then disappearing altogether. He marveled at his work before making himself comfortable and falling into a deep sleep, awaiting the time when he finally meets his container face to face in the future. Then flashback, the Hokage shrugged his shoulders not knowing the answer, I guess that having the Kaiubi shoved his gut made his bloodlines unlock themselves automatically. He said not knowing he was half right. So if you can't kill it, what are you going to do with the boy? Yudatane Kahara asked. She was an old woman that was on a genin team with Hamura and Hiruzen, they all were taught under Taburama, the nidame of Hokage. What I'm going to do Kaharu is my own decision, this meeting is over, you're all dismissed, leave my sights. He said putting his head in one hand and waving the council away with his other. Finally. Yelled Shikaku as he literally ran out of the room. His teammates chuckled slowly, I wonder when he'll remember about his wife waiting at home for him. Chaoza asked. Soon the room was empty, and we see the Hokage in his office with Inu, who took off his mask to show him wearing another mask underneath it. But now with his mask off we can call him Hata Kakashi or the copycat ninja. So Hokage-sama what are you going to do with Naruto-kun, you know I could take him in as my son if what you're saying is true about him being sensei's kid. He said handing the child over to his leader. Tsuritobi shook his head, no Kakashi, I still need you in Anbu, the child will go live with the Achihas. But don't worry about that he will also join my Anbu forces. He said holding up his hand seeing Kakashi about to disagree with him. 
that's my decision, and plus after releasing all of that information about the child's heritage, I fear that I will, will try to abduct him sometime in the future, it's for his own safety, he must live in the darkness to keep others safe. I'll release him to the Achihas when I deem him strong enough to protect himself from most Jounins. Bakashi was surprised at this. Really Hokage-sama, who do you know that can do that in the village? Kakashi asked. The Sandame looked at him like he was stupid, well, I don't know, maybe me. He said sarcastically, making Kakashi's eyes widen a little, I mean, come on, how hard can it be? He asked looking at the child on his desk. He had no idea what he was getting himself into this time. Chapter 3. Unexpected results and welcomes. Okage's personal training ground. Right now we see little Naruto and Sarutobi sparring in the training ground behind the Hokage Tower. And even with the Hokage's knowledge of the shinobi arts he was stumped, and still is, for the past six years while training this boy. He couldn't believe the kid, as soon as he learned to walk, he was training, absorbing all kinds of information like a sponge. And he was still learning everything he threw at him, it was getting frustrated finding things to teach the boy, he knew all E, D, C, and B, rank in the village already, okay he was exaggerating he didn't know all of the for those ranks, but he knew most of them, and of all elements too. Let's not forget about Tujutsu either, since he was very old, he called his village's Tujutsu expert, Mido Guy, a truly weird individual, but was faster and physically stronger than all in the village, without the use chakra, so even his student Sanadi would get beaten by this guy in a straight up Tujutsu fight. He was around 24 years old and wore the most hideous green spandex suit in the whole elemental nations, most like the whole world, but it had its purpose in getting rid of the air resistance when he was moving, making him even faster. Well like he was saying Guy began to teach young Naruto, he was a little against it as his training really pushes the muscles to their limit. And then when the warm up was over the real training began. And since Naruto had been getting trained by him since he was age 3, that means that he was a little more buffer, lean, a little bit too strong for someone his age. And even then his training had to progress faster after what happened, sometime before Naruto turned 4, it was the reason why he enlisted Naruto into the Anbu Corps shortly after. Two years ago, give or take a few of the months, Naruto had just gotten out of training with his sensei, Guy, and he was super tired from the brutal training he was put through. And even though he had been doing this kind of training for a couple of months, he was still tired, and yet he never complained, since Tajutsu was the only thing he could work on, for the time, since Hokage Jiji said that even though his chakra reserves were higher than everybody's in the village, that he had to let it settle before he started to do anything chakra related. He was sore as he wandered through the forest, in search of the Hokage's compound, around the area, it was always a little hard to navigate through the forest during the new moon, as even his demon-enhanced eyes needed just a little light to fully work, so everything he was seeing was just a little fuzzy. After a while of walking his ninja senses started to go off, and he jumped to the left, evading a couple of kunai. He activated his Sharingan and looked at his attackers, and even though Jiji told him not to do anything chakra-related, it was just second nature for him to activate his Sharingan. In front of him were five anbu, or they looked like anbu, he did notice the scent of wet soil and magnesium, a common element in Tsuchi no Kuni, so that meant they were ninja from Awagakur. Jiji had warned him of that village, he said information, no matter how important to a village, will somehow end up being leaked outside of the village. That was something he told him when he first began his studies. He also told him, because you hold the Kaiubi and the public knows this they will try to do things to take their anger out on you, even if they have to give up the air to important clans of the village, vengeance and revenge, it's very important not to have these emotions corrupt your mind, you understand Naruto-kun. He had asked him. Well, 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 look at what we have here, it looks like the son of the great Kiroi no Senku is all alone and with no one to protect him. Aw oh, come on guys let's take care of him for a while. The man in the middle said, indicating that he was the leader of the squad. The man on the right side of the leader began chuckling. Yeah and by take care of you, he doesn't mean we're going to sit down to a nice cup of tea. He means we're going to beat you up. He said laughing hysterically. The leader looked at him, thanks Jackal, you're the best subordinate I have ever had. He said sarcastically. What I thought was the best, that's not fair, I work way more than he does. A very tall and muscular man said from behind the leader. No raccoon, you're also my best subordinate. The leader said. This time another tall man became loud, what Taicho? I thought I was the best, you just said yesterday. This man was just as tall as raccoon, but not as muscular. The captain then looked at him, now boar, now is not the time to get pissy, you're all my best minions, yes even you gecko. He said looking at the last member of his team, this one was by far nearly shorter than Naruto himself. And speaking of Naruto he knew he should have left her attacked by now, but he was rooted to his spot, and he didn't know why, as he watched as the team of dust members argued with each other, with a huge sweat drop behind him. 
he cleared his throat, um yeah, so as much as I would love to hear you five argue, I got to get home and get some dinner and rest, so yeah. He said as he started backing away from them. They turned their attention to him and the leader began talking, yeah sorry about that kid, so where were we? Oh yeah, now we're going to kill you, so it's only respectful to know the names of the one who is going to kill you. I am the leader of this elite fighting force, Captain Goat, and we are the men who stare at goats. He said as he and his whole team struck a pose together, making Naruto's sweat drop becoming even bigger, nearly toppling him. Naruto did shake his head after a while as the team stayed in their pose. I'm going to have nightmares of these people after this is done. And even though, like I said earlier, he was still tired from his earlier training, so he only had one chance of getting out of the situation alive and sane. He quickly took out a pellet from his pocket, dug his nail into it, and quickly threw the pellet into the air, where it exploded in a bright flare of fire. It was a signal flare the Hokage gave to him, he had it specially designed for people that couldn't use chakra for the original signal fire. And before the pellet even exploded he had turned around and bolted out of there, in hopes of getting to the Hokage, before they caught up to him. And catch up to him they did, as they appeared in front of him, but he was still going, and the first attack went through the dust member, Gecko, as his fist went through the mask and into his face, shattering the skull, and it was all thanks of the speed he was moving and the strength behind his strike. This was his first kill, but he didn't have time to be devastating at taking a life as the others responded. Dackel sent a punch at his face, Boar tried to sweep him under his feet, while Raccoon came from above with a downward strike, using both hands clenched together making a much larger single fist. And everything was timed perfectly, from getting punched, then swept, and then pummeling into the ground, except he was a regular person as he had his Sharingan, which predicted the whole thing, so he simply jumped backwards, where Goat was waiting for him. But back to the other three they had crashed into each other, Or was hit with Raccoon's attack, and his legs snapped, nearly making him scream in pain, and if it wasn't for his pain tolerance training he would have, let's not forget about Jackal. Raccoon's attack had went through his shoulder and continued onto Boar's leg, he was the one that screamed. Now back to Naruto, he was trying to avoid the captain's strikes, and it was only because of the Sharingan that it was happening, he was quickly getting more exhausted as time went by. He was also fortunate that he remembered about the others, and while they were arguing with each other to watch where they were going, he quickly sent a kunai at their heads, two out of three wasn't so bad, as Raccoon had dodged his, seeing it coming. And now it was two on one, and they got their break as fatigue fully set in for Naruto, as he couldn't dodge the recent snap kick from Goat. And that was when the beating started. They started kicking and punching him in all places, as they were doing damage to his little hard body. It was a full 30 seconds later that the Hokage and a full platoon of Anbu appeared at the scene and killed the intruders. The Hokage quickly and carefully picked up Naruto's beaten and battered body, he had a completely swollen face and blood coming out of cuts and bruises all over his body. His clothes had been nearly completely torn off of him and his arms and legs were crushed but looked like it was beginning to slowly heal as the Kaiubi was doing everything in its limited power to heal up Naruto's body. And it had its work cut out for it, as Naruto suffered many broken ribs and internal bleeding, not to mention a cracked skull. It took three full months for Naruto to completely heal from the damage that his body had sustained. Sandane walked into the hospital room, like he had been doing for the past three months, and checked on Naruto. He awoke with the head doctor in the room with him, finishing up her analysis. Well Naruto it looks like you're completely healed and healthy, now remember no training for another month to let your muscles finish healing. She said knowing that he was being trained by the Hokage himself and was pretty strong even now. Naruto grinned, thank you Kachan. He said happily as he hugged his mother figure, she had helped him these past three months with so much, like his first kill problem. That first month was hard on his mind, as he wished he wouldn't survive his injuries. But Niko-chan helped him with everything, telling him that he shouldn't even be training or fighting so early in his life, he was only there for Kami's sake. But she soon started to understand that without his training, he never would have known how to signal help and fight off the enemy until help arrived. They finally noticed the Hokage in the room, oh Hokage-sama, when did you get here? Niko said, looking at the Hokage, but still had Naruto in her arms. Hey Jiji. Naruto said, waving one of his hands to Sandame. Hiruzen smiled at the sight, ever since Naruto-kun had met Niko, he had become attached to her, calling her Kasan, and she always called him her Sachi she never had. Was it because Niko had also been an orphan in her younger days, or was it her womanly charms? Oh I've been here for a while now, can I have a moment with Naruto, alone please? He asked a woman who nodded and walked out of the room. I've been thinking about what happened three months ago, and I came to the decision to put you in the Anbu Corps, you will be seriously trained and groomed to become a fully-fledged Anbu in time. This means that I'm going to up your training. I have no doubts that in the beginning you start to curse my name, but soon, you'll start to see the results of your training. 
and then after giving you a simulated mission, we'll see if you'll be capable of finally becoming an Anbu, so what do you say, would you like to become stronger? Saratobi said as his eyes burned with fire at the end of his speech. Naruto just smirked and jumped out of bed, did you really have to ask that Oji-san, I'm not going to have my ass handed to me after what happened, no more I say, next time they won't even have a chance to apologize to me, they'll already be dead. Naruto said with his eyes burning at the end of his speech. And plus hospital food sucks. He ruined the moment and made the Hokage laugh. And flashback, and now after all that training, he was as strong as his elite Jounin, so he may have gone a little overboard with the training, but it had to be done. On the day of his simulated Anbu-like mission he passed with flying colors, and even when his teammates were captured, and he had that decision to either save them or complete the mission, he didn't panic and did both, using the forbidden, the shadow clone technique, he was able to have them complete the mission, which was to blow up a bridge to prevent enemy troops from crossing over, while his shadow clone stealthily stormed the place where his teammates were captured and saved them, and they all went home, mission accomplished. Later that day, Saratobi told him that the mission he had done was one his father had done with his team, Rin was the one captured and Kakashi and Abito had that decision of completing the mission or saving a comrade, and the end result wasn't pretty as Abito later lost his life, Kakashi became more secluded and Rin, well and not even he knew where she went. He then told him about Kakashi's father and how he had a similar dilemma and he saved his comrades other than finishing his mission and was ridiculed because of it, which led him to take his own life. Learn from past experiences and you'll know, when the time comes, what choice is the right choice. Okay back to them, they had ended the spar, you just keep getting stronger and stronger Naruto, so are you ready to fully join the Anbu, you've just received the okay from the Anbu commander, Tora, so when you're ready we'll go over there and you'll receive your armor, mask, codename, Anbu registration number, and lastly your Anbu tattoo, later you'll be put on a team to work with. Saratobi said moving around and then taking off a part of his battle armor, as Naruto's strength had put a huge dent in it. His armor was getting older and more rusty the less he used and polished them, and he hadn't done that in the last decade, so he needed new ones. Damn Dorito you broke my armor, you need to watch your strength. He said as he fully took the broken piece of armor off. Naruto chuckled sheepishly and rubbed the back of his head. Sorry about that Jiji, it's just that I know where your armor's weak points are and I had to exploit it. But maybe I did use too much power. He said getting into his thinking pose which was to rub his chin and narrow his eyes a little. So Oji-san, can we go to HQ now? I don't want to keep the Satecho waiting, now do we? He said after a while of thinking. The Hokage smirked, I thought you'd never ask. He said as he grabbed Naruto's shoulder and their body flickered away. Later they appeared in front of a rundown old building that was a part of Kanoha that was destroyed by the Kaiubi years ago. The commander felt that it was a great idea to put headquarters here in the place that no person will ever go again. So they closed it off, built a giant wall around it, and then a wall to protect the HQ, and yet they only use one building, kind of a waste of space if you ask Naruto. The Hokage opened the door, and they met darkness. After walking in that darkness for what felt like hours, but was only a couple of minutes, Saratobi opened another door, and then they entered the real HQ, after going down the elevator that was in the previous room. It was there that they felt more eyes on them, there were Anbu everywhere in the large and spacious room, some with their masks on and some without, the ones without were people he most likely already seen, so they wasn't worrying about putting their mask back on, because if what they heard was true, then the kid will join them in secrecy pretty soon. They entered another room where someone was waiting for them. It wasn't the commander, just someone else, Yusagi, if what he could make out of the person's mask. Alright, we already had your measurements so, here goes your armor you wear whenever you do your Anbu mask. The woman said as she gave Naruto his armor. Naruto then went to a changing room and changed into his armor. It was deep black colored, a nice color if you ask him, must have been specially made by the Hokage, since the others he had seen had something that looked like light gray. He walked out in his armor and Sandame nodded his head in approval. I knew black was going to be a good color for you. He said as he handed him something else. Here this is what you'll wear when you're undercover and what not. He said as he handed him a black cloak. Naruto nodded and put it on over his armor and kept the hood off. After that Saratobi and Naruto entered another room, this one was completely dark, save for a couple of spotlights, showing dozens of masks behind protective glass. Naruto knew what he had to do, so he walked around, looking for a mask that would fit his personality, and he saw the perfect one, it was a kitsu mask, and he picked it. An Anbu appeared out of nowhere, wearing a Sarah mask. Hmm so you picked the kitsu mask. Did you know that this mask has not been picked ever since the Kaiubi attack, and the only one that had it later killed himself because he was representing such a monster? He asked the boy, don't answer that, of course you don't know. She said after seeing Naruto's confused face and got the mask for him. 
and Naruto put it on, making it stick with chakra, he was also getting the feel for it, like checking the weight it had and if he could see clearly through it. He liked what he was seeing, as he activated his Sharingan for a quick second to check with it, he deactivated it and took off the mask and put it slanted on his head and nodded to the man. Garazin then spoke from behind him, OK Naruto, your Anbu registration number will now be 01TA8579N6. He said writing it down in the Anbu's registration manual. They left and entered another room, this room was round and had a balcony going around it, and in the middle of the room was a chair that he knew was where he would get his Anbu tattoo and become a full-fledged Anbu, a rookie, but an Anbu nonetheless. Up in the balconies were the entire Anbu Corps, and they were there to witness the induction of their youngest and most known member. Everyone in the Anbu Corps knew about the young blonde, he was the son of the fourth Hokage and Yuzumaki Kishina, those two were legends in their lifetime, and even to this very day, legends there remain. They also knew about the Sharingan he had since birth, Inu, Kakashi, wasn't going to be the only one in the court to have a Sharingan now. Naruto sat in a chair when somebody sat down in the chair next to him. He sat down some items next to him, this was the Anbu commander, Tora, it was customary for the Anbu commander to finalize any inductee by tattooing the Anbu symbol of their left shoulder. Give me your arm, boy. He said in a stern voice. Naruto held out his left arm and Tora took some blood from it and put Naruto's blood in the bucket of ink and mixed it around. The wound then closed up with a little vapor coming off of it. After properly mixing the blood with the ink he held it up to Naruto's hand. Put some of your chakra in the ink. He said again as Naruto did as he was told. He watched as his chakra fused with the ink and yet the man kept the bucket up to his hand, now add some of the Kyubi's chakra in there. He said and Naruto struggled but accomplished the task of adding Kyubi's chakra into the bucket and watched as the ink bubbled for a while before it settled. The man nodded and proceeded to give him a tattoo of the Anbu symbol, Naruto didn't scream or wince at the pain, because somewhere in his subconscious, he knew that this was a test to check his pain tolerance, and if he couldn't handle it, then the tattoo wouldn't get complete and he'll be kicked out of the Anbu before he could even start. The man finished the tat and stood up, congratulations, you are now Anbu. The man said with his gruff and stern voice gone, it was replaced with a deep and yet easy going voice. He began to speak louder, as he was talking to the whole core now, I want you all to welcome our newest member, Kitsune, know that because you are the Jinchuriki for the Kaiubi that you will not be treated in any less way and receive the same kind of respect from all members, am I right everybody? He said as the Anbu all around began to cheer for their newest brother. The man turned back to Naruto, now you have your first mission. Naruto looked back to the man, what is the mission and I'll see that it is completed quickly and successfully. He said as he stared at the man in his eye. The man smirked at the kid's determination, your first mission is to swear your loyalty to the Hokage. He said, watching Naruto nod and turn around facing the Hokage. Naruto stared at the Hokage, activating his Sharingan, and bowed on his knees, I Namak is Yuzumaki Naruto aka Kitsune, member of the elite Anbu Corps, swears allegiance to the Hokage of Kanahagakur. I swear to protect and serve this man and achieve anything and everything I am told. He finished talking and stayed on his knee and left his head bowed. The Hokage looked at him, raise your head. He spoke in a commanding voice and watched as Naruto did as he was told. He then took out a scroll and unsealed four swords, a katana, nadachi, kadachi, and a ninja too. He laid them on the floor and said a simple phrase, choose wisely. He said. Naruto looked at each of the swords, knowing that whatever sword he picked will be his weapon until his death or if he ever leaves Anbu, but that'll never happen. Right. He picked up the katana, knowing that even though he was short now he'll grow taller and be able to use it properly. He took his sword and strapped it to his back, under his cloak, making the handle stick out at the top. It was like the sword was compared to the kit as it was nearly taller than he was, sword. Three feet, Naruto. Three feet four inches. Hora walked up to the kid and clasped his hand on his left shoulder, I would like to personally welcome you to what we jokingly call the Brotherhood. The man said as he and the rest of the Anbu all laughed heartily at the joke, it didn't take Naruto a long time before he too started laughing. A week later, Naruto and Saratobi were walking to the latter's office after their afternoon training, they entered to see Ichiha Fugaku. And he was sitting at his desk waiting for them. Oh hey Fugaku-san, is it time already? He said as he sat down in his big all comfy chair, sighing as he did so. The man nodded as he looked at Naruto, standing beside the Hokage. I can't believe this is the first time I actually got to meet you, Naruto-kun, it's nice to meet you. He said, putting out his hand for a shake. Naruto looked at the hand weirdly before shaking it. Uh not to be disrespectful but, who are you? He said, causing Fugaku to laugh a little. The Hokage looked at Naruto. This is the man I was telling you about just now, this is Ichiha Fugaku, he is adopting you into his family, the Ichiha clan. Their compound is where you will now be staying and trained, no, but we talked about this also. 
since you were born with a Sharingan, this man feels that you should live with others that have the Sharingan, and they will teach you how to use your Sharingan properly. He said holding up his hand to prevent Naruto from saying but. But Jiji, I already know how to use my Sharingan properly. He said activating his Sharingan and making it spin very quickly. Fine. He said as the Hokage didn't budge in his decision. He turned to Fugaku, so do I have to call you Tusen or something? He asked the man, making him laugh again and shake his head no. No my boy, you don't need to call me your father, but you will be staying in the same house as my family, though my wife will love it if you called her Kasan. He said as the Sandane finally gathered the papers he was looking for and gave them to Fugaku for signing and jotted down his final approving, Naruto's new name was Namikaze Uzumaki Ichiha Naruto, and he had a new home to go to. After Naruto also signed his name, the one before and the one after, he left with Fugaku. They walked through the village, many looking at them curiously, because they wanted to know why the demon was walking with the Ichiha clan head, they seen them enter the Ichiha compound and came to the conclusion that the demon was adopted into one of the most prestigious clans of the village, meaning that they better had changed their minds on him or suffer the wrath of the Ichiha. Naruto had only been in public a couple of times in his short six years of life, and out of all those times he liked this one better, the other times, he would always be glared at, even if he was with the Hokage of the village, and even if he was the son of the Yandame, though he didn't think they knew that detail, just the demon part. He couldn't help but smirk at the look on their faces after seeing him walk with the Hedicha. Maybe being with this family won't be so bad after all. He thought as he watched the man nod to the passing Ichiha and some of the girls giggling at him, he guessed that they loved the color of his eyes, blue-gray is the best of them all, it's like a cloudy sky. They soon walked up to his new home, when they entered they saw two boys talking about the training that the eldest promised to put the youngest through. A woman came from the kitchen, with an apron, over her dress. Boys, boys, calm down, your father will be here any moment and you don't want him to see you two argue. She said to her two sons, as the eldest poked his younger brother in the forehead. Too late said a voice from the doorway. I'm already here, with a new addition to the family, go on, introduce yourself. He said to the boy, lightly moving Naruto in front of him. Naruto sighed as he was moved, he waved his hand, hi my name's Namikaze Yuzumaki Ichiha Naruto, and I was just adopted by this man here. So I hope you respect me as I'll respect you. He said to the family. Makoto nearly squealed, hi I'm Makoto, you can call me Kasan, and these are my sons Itachi and Sasuke, you can call them your brothers said Mikoto, she was a beautiful woman, around 29 years old, a medium-sized D-cup breast, she had long black hair that reached her shoulder blades. She wore a brown dress and had a beige apron over it, which she just took off, she was wearing any shoes as that was some kind of tradition in all households. She was a retired jounin that stood at the height of 5 feet 2 inches. He knew that because she suddenly appeared in front of him and hugged him to her breast. Welcome to the family, we have been expecting you. She let him go after she heard him gasping for breath, sorry about that, I'm just so happy. She grabbed his hand and dragged him to the table and sat him down. Lunch will be here any minute now, wait right there. She said, skipping to the kitchen humming a small tune. Naruto was just staring at her as she skipped to the kitchen, he was a little embarrassed at what had just happened until he remembered she said something about lunch. He looked at her two sons, what is she making for lunch? Is it dango? Naruto said eagerly. Itachi said, no, she's making yudin. Itachi looked like a nice boy, he had a mysterious line on each side of his nose, he was wearing the clan's regular high-collared dark grey shirt and black shorts. He was around the age of 9 and stood at 4 feet 5 inches. He was sitting at the table cross-legged and he was eating some paki from under the table. You say that you hate Yudin, Itachi Nai. Sasuke said from beside his brother, Sasuke was Itachi's younger brother, around the age of 5, he was still rubbing his forehead where Itachi had poked him. He too wore a high-collared shirt, his was black, and he wore light grey shorts. His hair was unlike his brother's which wasn't spiky like his, his brother's hair framed his face in front and was tied in a short ponytail in the back. He also framed his face but got spiky in the back, making it resemble a certain animal's backside. I do like it, I was just answering his question. Whatever, so Naruto do you have anything you like other than Dango? He asked him curious about his new family member. Naruto went into his thinking pose, well I like many other things, they're just too many to tell you, but I do hate salted octopus, it tastes weird to me, if you leave the salt out of it, then I'll gladly eat it. He said as Makoto came out of the kitchen, with a bowl of yudin in each hand, and one balanced on her head. Makoto-san he started to say when she glared dangerously at him, air, ka-san, I'll be glad to help if you want me to. He said pointing to the bowl on her head. Oh, that's so nice of you, too bad none of my other kids have manners like you do. She said letting him get the bowl from her head, just for that you can get seconds whenever you like. She said, smiling at him. The other boys in the room yelled, what, I do have manners, I just didn't know you'll come out of the kitchen carrying all the bowls. They said at the same time. 
she just said, excuses, excuses. Naruto rubbed the back of his head sheepishly, aw that's nothing, teaching me manners was the first thing Jiji taught me. He said, chuckling nervously, as both of the boys glared at him. They all sat down and ate after Makoto and Fugaku from his study to join them in having lunch. All of them were chuckling and enjoying each other's company as Naruto thought, this isn't so bad, this family is nice to be with, and plus I better enjoy myself while I'm with them because I'm going to have to do some missions pretty soon, I can feel it in my bones. He thought as he finished his yudin. Later that night, he knew that he'll have to do a mission soon, as an Anbu wearing an Inu mask appeared in the room he got from Makoto, it was a nice and clean room. He got up and unsealed his Anbu attire from his colorless seal located on the back of his right hand. He got dressed and donned his kitsu mask, and they soon left the compound towards the village's eastern gates. Not knowing that Itachi saw them leave through his bedroom window. They reached the gate and met up with two other Anbu members, one wearing a Nico mask and the other wearing an Hibi mask, they both had their Anbu tattoos on their right shoulder, showing that they were females. When I was here, I had to get him for his first real mission. Inu said from behind his mask. Well at least you're here now, let's get started, the mission isn't going to finish itself. Hebe said she had purple hair and pupil-less brown eyes. She stood at 5 feet 3 inches and had light gray armor under her black cloak. You're so impatient why don't you just calm down? Nico said and they began to argue with each other. Then both of you be quiet, Nico, why don't you at least act like you're my lieutenant, and Hebe, we leave right now, just calm down. Inu commanded them calmly, he then looked at Naruto. Don't worry about them, they are really good friends. Now show us why the Hokage himself put you in Anbu. He said as they all vanished and started their nighttime adventures. Chapter 4. Congratulations and relax. Outside of Kanoha's walls, the forest was always peaceful at night, the stars were out and the moon shining on the forest below. Animals turning into sleep and predators relaxing after a great meal. And do you know the best thing? The Anbu team didn't disrupt the atmosphere at all. Following the team, we see three figures, wait, that's four figures, the fourth was just short. And yet his height didn't hinder him at all, as he was keeping up with the other's speed. Hitsune was irritated as he was jumping from tree to tree. Why, because he couldn't believe what his first mission assignment was as an Anbu. Border Patrol. Seriously, they woke me up for this. He thought happily that his face was covered by his mask so that his squad members couldn't see his scowl. Well at least he thought that they didn't notice, his comrade Nico turned to him, what's wrong Kitsune kun She asked noticing his tense neck muscles. Hitsune turned to his worried squad member, why would you think something is wrong? He said. She quietly giggled, because your neck has been tense ever since the mission briefing. Hitsune's eyes widened a little at that, until he remembered that she was Anbu, and that was one of the skills in being Anbu, being able to notice the little things and use them as an advantage for other things. You don't have to be so tense, you never know what could happen on these missions, but it's best to always hope for the worst, so that you'll never be surprised during the mission. You understand? She said after a while. You know she is right, Kitsune kun but she left out the most simplest detail in being an Anbu, you have to always be on your guard when on duty, you can never relax until you are off duty, so for now on be prepared to be awake for many nights in a row. Hebe said, slightly turning her head and looking in his eye holes for a brief second, seeing his activated Sharingan eyes. Earls quit pestering Kitsune. This is his first mission, Border Patrol is always Anbu's first mission, it's to prepare them for long nights of sleep and being on guard and some other stuff I forgot. Inu then gave a deep reminiscent sigh, I remember my first mission. I slept for days after it. He said, holding up his hand signaling his subordinates to halt. They stopped and overlooked the clearing in view, seeing a bandit camp, inside of Hai no Kuni, now that was something they couldn't have that. Looking in the campsite, they could see a total of 14 bandits, and though they didn't see any civilians they could smell the heavy scent of blood and burning flesh, meaning that they had people there earlier and burned the bodies, likely to get rid of evidence of them even being there. Okay these goons must be eliminated, they cannot continue living if this is what they're going to do with their lives. He then looked at his rookie Anbu. Are you okay with killing others, I am unaware if you have killed before. Inu asked, keeping his voice down. Yes I'm okay with it, I had my first kill a few months before I turned 4, I'm pretty sure I can handle these weak bandits. He said ignoring the concerned words of the female members of the squad. Oh you poor baby. Nico said pulling Kitsune into her chest, the only things keeping his face from her breast were his mask and her armor. I'm okay Nico, I killed three out of the five, but I was put in the hospital for three months. Let's not talk about this now, we have to get rid of these bandits. He said as Nico let go of him, and they all looked over the camp. Alright squad this is what we are going to do, Kitsune I want you to take all the bandits in the east of the camp, Hebe you got west, Nico you get south, and I'll get north. Alright you have your orders, I want these kills to be silent, wait for my signal and then attack. Inu ordered as they all went to their positions. 
it soon went to the east of the camp, and if you divide the camp up correctly then that means that he has six bandits to kill. No wait seven, the food was being served in the east, and they were eating. Fortunately for him their backs were turned to the forest, meaning he could easily kill them all when the signal was given. Nico went to the south, the area where only three bandits were, this area was where the tents were, and her targets were busy sleeping after having a busy day. DB went to the west where three bandits were, these bandits were towards the middle, using the light of the fire to play poker, and from the looks of it they sucked, they all were getting bad cards. She sighed a Kitsune having the most bandits on his side. Lucky Brad. She thought. Inu stayed in the north and watched as the leader was coming up with a plan to attack the nearby village again, and this time take more than just money and women. Maybe I should kidnap the mayor's daughter and get some money and food out of that and he'll get her back after I had my fun with her. The bandit leader said loud enough for Inu to hear. And speaking of Inu, he held up his hand in view of his team in the open palm position and when he closed it the attack started. The team of Anbu launched into the clearing stealthily and killed the ones they were assigned. Kitsune threw multiple kunai at his targets and before you know six were down, he only threw six because he wanted to do this personally, he ran up to the remaining bandit just as he noticed his comrades were falling to the ground. He was about to yell out to the boss when his throat was cut and all that came out was the gurgling sound of him drowning in his own blood before quietly setting in. Nico ran through the tents quietly slitting the throats of the bandits, Hebe jumped high in the air and landed on the table, and while the bandits looked surprised, she spun in a circle and decapitated all of them with her ninja too. Inu just dropped from his perch and sliced the leader down the middle with his own ninja too. They met in the middle where Hebe was sitting on the table without an ounce of blood on her. She leaped off and landed in front of her comrades. That wasn't so bad, but I still don't like the Kitsune Kun got the most bandits to kill, it's so unfair. She said, crossing her arms. I'm sorry Hebe-chan. Is there something I can do to make it up to you? Kitsune asked him, not seeing or hearing the rest of his teammates waving their hands in the no motion. Hebe just gasped happily, sure there is, the minute we get back to the village you can treat me to some dango. She said moving her mask to the side a little bit and kissed him on the cheek and started skipping away happily. Kitsune just stood there in disbelief, what did I just get myself into? He asked out loud. The others shook their heads, she's going to stick to you like glue now. They both said and followed Hebe out of the clearing. 6 a.m. The next day, the team returned after a short time doing border patrol. Usually a team would do border patrols for a week and up, but since this was Kitsune's first mission, the Hokage didn't want his skills to be wasted on doing border control. When they reached the gates Kitsune let out a big yawn, he had been doing this for the past hour and a half, and his team was getting annoyed at its consistency. Okay that's the last straw, either stop yawning or I'm doubling the amount of dango you're treating me to. Hebe said, exploding upon hearing the latest yawn. Hebe, what did I tell you about yelling at Kitsune-kun, you have to remember even if he has the skills to be an Anbu, he's still a kid and kids need sleep. Nico said, defending Kitsune. Hebe gave a deep and heavy sigh as they passed the gate, only two more years of this and I get to become a full interrogator and torturer. She thought dreamily. She stopped thinking when they entered the huge red tower the Hokage works at, ready to give her report. They all appeared in front of the Hokage and said at the same time, well bowing, mission accomplished Hokage-sama. Their voices matching perfectly, almost making it seem like one person talked, you could tell they were working on this. Hiruzen looked up from his paperwork and even though he would never be working on paperwork at this hour, he was bored at the moment. He finished his book already and reading it again took away the surprises that came the first time. Ah Team Omega, I've been expecting you. He said happily that something took him away from his paperwork. Tell me, how was Kitsune Kun's first mission? He asked me to light his pipe. Inu smirked behind his mask. Well he did very well, we encountered a bandit camp a couple of miles away from the northern border and quickly dispatched them. Yeah with Kitsune Kun taking most of the kills, that's why he has to treat me to dango after this meeting. Hebe said, crossing her arms, causing Kitsune to chuckle nervously and rub the back of his head at having to be reminded of that. Tsuritobi chuckled, as did the other members of Team Omega. Will I feel sorry for you, now Kitsune can take off your mask for me please. The Hokage said, as Kitsune did, and Naruto's face appeared, wearing a very bored face. You did great Naruto-kun, congratulations. He said smiling at his young charge. Naruto rubbed the back of his head sleepily, before lightly glaring at the Hokage. Jiji, if I get another border patrol mission I'm going to quit. That was the most boringest thing I have ever done. He said, running his hand through his hair. Naruto-kun what did I say about Boringus not being a word, you have to quit using it. Saratobi reprimanded his student. Naruto just sighed, yes Oji-sensei. He said, but then something happened that he didn't want to happen. He yawned. And Hebe promptly exploded. That's it, we're going to the dango stand, you guys could take care of the rest of the report right. 
she said, taking off her mask revealing a face that made Naruto's face turn red. It was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen, and he had seen some beautiful faces, like Niko Kachan, Makoto Kasan, there was one when the Hokage took him to the Hyuga compound to have tea and learn proper manners, it was the hidden Chan, the Hiyashi's wife. And even when he was given his Jinjutsu lessons from Yuuhi Kurunai, the Jinjutsu mistress herself. It didn't matter if she was only a Chunin, with the Jinjutsu she knew she could probably take on some of the most strongest, weak-minded shinobi in the elemental nations, she had eyes that were similar to his Sharingan, and they had the same hypnotizing ability, you could really just get lost looking into her eyes. Of course, you would think that just because he's only six, that he wouldn't know what he's talking about. I only have this to say, age ain't nothing but a number, now maturity is what he is looking for, and his revealed face showed a whole lot of maturity. Everybody was staring at Naruto, who was staring at Hibi, he had been doing this for the past minute or so, and it has been creeping Hibi out, ah kid, you there. Hello. She said snapping her fingers in front of his face, only then did Naruto get out of his trance. Huh wa, oh sorry. He said rubbing his head in embarrassment, he didn't have any more time, as Hibi put her mask back on, and started dragging him to the window before body flickering out, and to HQ to change their clothes before going to the dango stand. Five minutes later, Naruto walked out of his room in HQ and waited in front of Baby's room, waiting for her to finish changing, so he could get this over with, he didn't like giving up his dango for someone else's sake. But when Hibi walked out introducing herself as Midrashi Anko, he said out loud, but for you I will make an exception. She made a face that showed her confusion before perking up, well come on let's go get me some dango. She said, grabbing his hand and dragging him outside HQ, before body flickering out and appearing in a nearby alley. There was barely anybody outside, and the ones outside were only opening their stores and getting ready for their day with a morning walk. Or run. As guys stopped in front of them, Naruto-kun, my youthful student, how's life treating you? I bet it's pretty youthful, am I right? He asked. So how about we get some morning training done, Anko-san you can join too. He grabbed both of their hands and sped off into the distance. Five hours later, Anko and Naruto slumped their way into the dango stand at 11 am, when they walked in they saw a girl with familiar purple hair and kurunai, eating dango. Oh here they are Nai-chan. The purple haired girl said. Anko perked up a little at seeing her friends and walked over there, and Naruto followed, yawning as he sat down. Anko let it slide as she too yawned, after seeing him do it. I'm never training with guy ever again. Anko said, taking one of the dango skewers off the plate in the middle of the table. Naruto looked at her sleepily, oh Anko-chan at least you finished the warm-up, that's great, not many people can't say that trained with Gai-sensei and passed the warm-up. Naruto said proudly letting out another yawn. Waitress, can I have a cup of coffee, please? He asked. She looked at him funny, kid we don't serve coffee to minors. She said walking away. Naruto sighed, he called her over again, waitress, can I please have a cup of coffee? He said, his eyes turning red for a while before going back to normal. She perked up, sure, how would you like to have it? Naruto smiled and said, surprise me please. She nodded and went on her way. He looked at the table's occupants and found them looking at him. What, I don't feel like having any problems today and not getting served coffee just because I'm a kid was definitely going to be a problem. He said, putting his head down, go on Anko-chan, order all the dango you want, as long as you save me some. He said, waving his hand in the air, waiting for his coffee. You know you Chan, we should have seen this coming. Anko said, ordering herself about three dozen skewers of dango and a bottle of sake. I mean he just goes off on an all-night mission and then gets dragged into training with Guy for the past five hours, I'm surprised I'm not passed out. Anko added. Yeah I heard about Guy, he calls himself Kanoha's green beast, I hear he's wicked strong and incredibly fast, and yet even with all that he has no sense of fashion. Kurunai said, taking a bite out of her own dango. The waitress came back and tapped Naruto on the shoulder, waking him up instantly. Here you go, I got you black, with sugar and cream. She said putting his coffee down. Naruto thanked her and gave her a 50 yen tip for the 10 yen coffee. She thanked him and went to her next table. Naruto took a sip from his coffee and looked around the table, so what's your name, pretty lady? He said not want to say Nico while in public. She smiled at him, well Naruto-kun, my name is Yuzuki Yugao, it's finally nice to meet the real you. She said, flipping her hair a little. Now that I think about it, shouldn't you be getting back to the Ichiha compound, I bet Matoko-san is worried about you, she doesn't know anything about, for all she knows she probably thinks you've gotten kidnapped. Yugao said. Naruto shot up in his chair at the mention of the Ichiha, oh yeah, I forgot all about them, well I'll just tell them that I got up really early to train with Gai-sensei, since it's the truth. He said taking another sip from his coffee and getting up from his seat, before Anko yanked him back down. Hey where do you think you're going, don't try and skip out on paying for my dango, now sit and watch us beautiful girls eat. 
she said, causing the other girls to giggle. Naruto's head dropped to the table, and the last thought before he fell asleep was, Mikoto Ka-san is going to kill me for worrying her. The three girls looked at the sleeping boy, aw he looks so cute when he's asleep. Yuga said quietly so as to not wake him up. Ho-chan, are you sure that it was a good idea making him stay here, I mean that chair is doing nothing for his back. He should be asleep in a soft bed. Kurinai said, fine I'll take him to your house and he can sleep in your bed, are you happy? Anko said, smirking at Kurinai's blushing face. We'll give him a couple of years, and then he'll get invited to my bed. She said on accident. Or was it? She didn't have time to cover her mouth though as the other two girls gasped. Nai-chan do you like Naruto-kun? Whatever happened to Asuma-kun, weren't you going to try and get with him when he came back from the capital? Yugao asked, looking at her friend. Of course you like her Nai-chan, you don't have to lie, you like him to Yukon, there's no doubt about that. Anko said taking a bite from her last dango skewer and drinking the rest of her sake. So that means you like him in Kochang. Yu Gao asked her skimpy dressed friend. Of course I just spent a nearly a day with the kid, he has loads of stamina and he's incredibly strong, intelligent, his chakra reserves are through the roof, and lastly, in the future he'll grow up to be a very handsome and even more powerful young man, and since we have already established ourselves as the sexist in the village, there is no way that he won't grow more attached to us. She said, finishing her long speech. Chapter 5 new team, Naruto was now 8 years old, well it was a little under 9 years old, his birthday was in a couple of months. Not that it mattered, he knew that he was going to be active on that day. He just took off his Anbu armor and sealed the rest of his equipment into the seal on the back of his hand when Inu, his captain, walked into his quarters. Ah Naruto come, I caught you in time. He said, taking off his mask, showing Kakashi. Naruto looked over his shoulder, hum Kakashi senpai, what do you need? I thought you'd be home, relaxing after the mission we just had. Naruto said putting on some regular sandals. Oh I am going to be, I just came here to get you first. The Hokage has something to tell the entire core. He said leading Naruto into the squad room, it's like a living room, where some of the individuals in the Anbu could go to just hang out when they don't want to go out in public for reasons no one cares about. They walked in to see the Hokage in the middle of a raised earth well, it wasn't high, just enough for him to see all of the core. He noticed Kakashi and Naruto entered the room and began speaking. Now that everyone is here, I have some dire news to tell you all. He said as they all listened to their leader. Naruto and Kakashi walked to the front, but instead of stopping with the others, Kakashi kept going and stood before the Hokage. I must inform you that our beloved member Hada Kakashi, aka Inu is retiring from the core and will become an active elite Jounin. It's his choice so talk to him about it. The Sande matted after a moment. The others were shocked, Kakashi the famed Sharingan no Kakashi was retiring, he was one of the strongest of them all. But the one shocked the most was his team, Yu Gao and Naruto, Anko had transferred to the torture and interrogation squad to further learn under Marino Ibiki. They had stayed a three-man squad since that had happened, and not even a month later, Kakashi decided to retire. Before any of them could voice their disagreements the Sandame spoke again, but a stepping down of a captain means that one of the members of Team Omega needs to be promoted to the rank of captain, and the only one that I think has the necessary skill and experience is another Sharingan user. So will Namaka's Yuzumaki Ichiha Naruto please step up here to receive your new rank. The Hokage said, smiling down at the young Anbu member. Naruto stood shocked, so much so that the snapping of fingers in his face, courtesy of Yu Gao, didn't get him out of his shock. But the clapping of the other members did, he looked around to see his brothers clapping for him, congratulating him on his promotion, a captain was the highest rank you could get without being the commander of the Hokage, not even the most political assets in the village, stood higher than being a captain of an Anbu squad, that was why Naruto was so shocked. He slowly walked up to the makeshift podium and got patted on the back by Kakashi, who did his usual eye smile. Congratulations Naruto-kun, you deserve it. He said, unsealing his captain cloak out of one of his storage scrolls, giving it to Naruto. It's clean, you don't have to worry about that. I washed it okay, I'm serious. He said seeing Naruto slightly sniffing it. The others laughed seeing this, and they all began to pat Naruto on his back, and some of the female members gave him a kiss on the cheek. The new blonde-haired Anbu captain was blushing the whole time, feeling embarrassed the whole time. They each turned to the Hokage when he began to speak again, that's not everything I have to say, now Team Omega is still down a member, so which one of you would like to join this squad? He said looking at the members, before his eyes landed on Naruto, it's your choice Naruto-kun. He said. Naruto knew that a three-man squad wasn't a full squad, so the Sande must have had a reason to only let him pick one member. He looked around and checked all the members, they all had their masks off to show their faces, but he could still see them on their heads. He searched for minutes before stopping in front of a rather tall and buff individual. I picked you Kuma, welcome to Team Omega. He said, shaking the man's hand and turning to the Hokage. 
So Hokage-sama, who else is going to be on this squad? I would love to congratulate the person as well. He said looking at his sensei. Oh thanks for reminding me lad. He said, turning his head, you can bring him up now. He spoke to one of his ambu guards. Soon the sound of somebody getting off the elevator was heard before the person appeared out of the shadowy area. The figure was Ichiha Itachi, and he was going to be the new member of Team Omega after joining the core. He didn't change in the past three years, he was a little over 11 years old, and he too had a fully matured Sharingan, everyone could see as it shined and spun in its hypnotizing circle. Itachi-kun here will be joining the core, it's a shame everyone knows about it, but he will do well here, isn't that right Itachi-kun? He asked the young man. Itachi nodded his head at the Sandane, yes I will Hokage-sama, I will do my best on Naruto Otto's squad. He said, turning his head back to his little adoptive brother. I knew you were Anbu Itoto, that is why I too decided to join. He said smiling and ruffling his little brother's hair. Naruto struggled under the attack on his hair. Come on Itachi, you know I don't like it when you do that. He said getting from under the elder Ichiha's hand. The Hokage began to speak yet again. Now can we induct our newest member or are we going to keep on congratulating little Naruto, come on everybody let's give Itachi-kun his equipment. The old man said, jumping off the wall as it crumbled to the ground and disappeared. A half an hour later, Itachi walked out of the last room, dressed in all of his new Anbu armor. It was similar to the others, you know dark grey, he picked a ninja too for his primary weapon and chose a weasel mask, making everyone chuckle, since his name meant weasel. He wore his Anbu tattoo proudly as he walked out the room. So what are we going to do now? Itachi asked out loud as he stood in front of his new team. That's easy, I have an assignment for you four. A boy said as Saratobi walked by them. I have gotten word that one of our neighboring countries, Nami no Kuni, is being taken over by a tycoon by the name of Gato, the CEO of Gato Incorporations. Well I just heard that, all of that is a front as he is a drug lord that makes and sells drugs, he is now using his vast resources to drain Nami no Kuni of its money. They spent all of their money to pay for this air rank assassination mission. I want this to be an in and out job, am I clear? He spoke to them, and they saluted the man yelling hi, Hokage-sama, and leaving HQ to start their mission. Naruto donned his new Anbu captain cloak after properly making sure it was clean. It was a little after 4 o'clock so many people could see them on top of the eastern gate. You're very lucky, you know that Itachi. Kitsune said in his full Anbu armor, he was a little annoyed he had just gotten off of a mission, but it wasn't the first time that this has happened. Why do you say the Kitsune Taicho? Itachi replied, as he put on his mask. Guma answered before his captain could, because from what I know, Taicho's first mission was border patrol. He said, chuckling with the others. Silence, now in formation, I'll be in the front, Itachi you're in the back, Nico, on the right, and Kuma, on the left. Even though this is supposed to be an in and out job doesn't mean that we can't get ambushed on the way, so Itachi keep your eyes peeled and keep your senses up. He ordered everyone as they stood at attention and got into formation. Soon they became blurs as they ran through the forest. Seconds turned to minutes and minutes to hours before they made it to the port village. They ran on the water, using the mist as cover. They appeared inside of the village square, seeing a whole lot of people in front of a cage. They saw a man dead, it seems the whole village just witnessed an execution of some poor soul. They each saw a short stout man holding the dripping blade, laughing at the man he had just killed. Let this be an example to those that want to be heroes. He had said as he and his bodyguards hopped on their boat and left. Deciding to let the town mourn for their loss, they jumped from their overlooking position and followed Gato through the mist. And sooner than they had thought, they appeared at the man's base of operations, on a remote island, 20 minutes, on a boat, away from Nami no Kuni. It soon signaled his team to stop, high in the nearest tree. They each crouched up there keeping quiet as they had seen some former ninja turned mercenaries, like one of the former seven swordsmen of the mist, Mamachi Zabuza, talking to Gato, he wanted to get paid for his service as his mercenary. Gato denied him his pay and told him that somebody was trying to build a bridge that will no doubt ruin his plans for the village. They each wanted to attack them right now but knew that they had to do it when the short man was alone. Kitsune turned to Kuma, okay Kuma, I want you to shadow Zabuza and his protege and make sure they don't get in the way of the mission, if you must knock him out, we can most likely get some information out of him about Kiri. He told him as the tall man nodded and disappeared. It soon then turned to Nico, Nico, I want you to find a safe way inside of the building, if you must kill a couple of mercenaries to make the area safe, please do so. He told her as she nodded and vanished from her spot. Wait about me Taicho. Itachi asked Kitsune. It soon turned to the newest Anbu, Will Itachi, and we were going to find our own way inside the building. Kitsune said as he used some chakra to his feet and launched himself on top of the building, with Itachi following shortly. He then flared a small amount of his chakra and Nico appeared in front of them. Let's go, we're going through the roof. He said. 
moving to the roof's door and his fingers started to get very hot, they knew this because when he pressed it against the lock it melted off. They opened the door and they ran through the base, and in a show of perfect stealth, did Kitsun pass right by Gato and chop his head off right after he had opened the door to his vault to check his money. Itachi from behind Kitsun quickly took out a storage scroll after seeing what was going to happen with his Sharingan and sealed the head. Nico killed the two guards by Gato before they could even realize their leader had been decapitated. It soon turned to Nico, sealed the money, with it the village's financials will raise, great job Itachi, that was a nice catch. You'll go places with that kind of quickness. He said as Nico sealed the money in a scroll. After Nico appeared from the doorway, they began to leave the same way they came, now on the roof, did Kitsune flare his chakra again, and this time Kuma appeared with Zabuza draped over his shoulder and the little boy, around the age of 10, hooked under his arms. Mission accomplished Kitsune Taicho. Kuma said as they left the base. They ran across the water and soon appeared on land, and now with the mission over, they decided to take a little break in the little port town. Naruto pulled out a scroll that had the name of the man that paid for the mission, it was the bridge builder Tazuna, no known surname. It had his address and who was living with him. He was around 55 years old and had a daughter around the age of 25 years old and she too had a child named Inari around the age of 4. They appeared at the residence and knocked on the door and the woman answered the door and screamed seeing them, thinking they were going to take and kill her next. Kittison spoke, no need to fear us, ma'am we just came to tell you that you don't have to worry about Gato any longer. He spoke, calming the women down. So you're finally here, but you're too late, Kaiza is dead. She said as Tazuna came walking down the stairs with a bottle of sake in his hand and started to drunkenly comfort his daughter. Am I to assume that your dad is a super ninja that a little bastard? Tazuna asked drunkenly as he took another gulp from his bottle of sake. The team nodded, yes sir, like I told your daughter you don't have to worry about the man anymore. The village will expect further pay for this good deed we did. Kitsune nodded his head at Nico as she unsealed the money and it all dropped to the floor. This is the money that was taken from Wave, rebuild your village, make your bridge, and come to the village anytime in the future if you have any other problems that threaten your country that you yourself can't handle. Kitsune said as they left the house and began their journey home with their prisoners. An hour and a half later, Demo Mega appeared back on the main road of the village. They stopped in front of the gatekeepers, New Chuanin's Hagen Kitetsu and Kamizuki Izumo. Kitsune and the others showed their Anbu passes and entered the village. Izumo, this may be the easiest job we could have ever gotten. Kitetsu said, slapping the back of his partner. Izumo just agreed with his friend and they shared a big laugh. Izumo then spoke after looking at the Anbu passes. Yeah it sure is, but don't you ever wonder about the Chuanins that had this post a couple of years ago. I heard that they suddenly disappeared one day, it was the talk of the village for a couple of months, and what's even scarier is that their bodies were never found. Izumo said. Demo Mega shook their head at the rumor, and Kitsune knew he should go, but he just had to say something. What are you talking about, Sara and I retired from their ninja careers due to the madness of being at a village gate for countless years. I wonder how you two will turn out. He asked as he began to chuckle and vanished from his spot, with the rest of his team following. What's that, they quit, maybe they didn't have what it took to watch a gate, huh, Izumo. Kitetsu said, leaning back in his chair, as Izumo hesitantly agreed with his partner, thinking about village gate madness. Okage Tower, they appeared in the tower, bowing, as Kuma put the bodies down and joined in the bowing. Kitsune took his mask off, making a tilt on his head and spoke. Mission accomplished Hokage-sama, it was easier than I originally thought it would be. He said standing up and giving the sand aim the scroll containing the head of Gato as proof of the kill. Also Kuma, here, was so kind as to capture some important people. We have here Mamachi's Zabuza and his student, as you can see they are knocked out and have been for quite some time now. He said moving the Hokage's attention to the bodies on the floor by drifting his arm in the direction of the bodies. Good job Naruto-kun, I knew it was a good idea to support you on being captain of this squad. So what did Itachi-kun do on his first mission? He asked a short squad leader. He did an excellent job on taking orders and if it was up to me, he'll do an even better job on giving them. In time of course, he is very advanced in his Sharingan, like any other prodigy would be, and he's a seriously quick learner, he takes initiative when he needs to. Naruto said giving the Hokage a quick report of his adoptive big brother. Tsuritobi nodded his head and looked at Itachi as he too took off his mask. So Itachi, how was it taking orders from somebody much younger than yourself? He asked, smiling behind his pipe. Itachi showed a faint smile in that regard. At first, I thought it was going to be annoying, taking orders from my little bro. He said, rubbing Naruto's head again. But it was very different than I had thought it would be, he gave orders like he was born to, he was serious all throughout the whole mission, and when it was over we went to the house of the man that gave us the mission and returned the money. 
and Naruto then recommended that the man do what he was going to do and even come to us if their country was in trouble again. The only word that I could properly describe would be inspiring. He said, smiling down at the younger Acha. The old man smiled at the team again and looked at the other new member, how about you Kuma? He asked the large buff man. The man kept his mask on, since Itachi and Naruto were the only ones known as being in the Anbu Corps, not by other villagers, but by the council. It was the same as Itachi's, except I knew his reputation in the Corps, he's at the power of Hadakakashi, and he's only going to get stronger. He's not at the level of his father, but in time he'll get there. He might even become the Hokage, after the proper teachings, and he gains skill in the political world. The unnamed man explained to his leader. The Hokage nodded and looked at Niko who shook her head. I have nothing to say about taking orders from Naruto-kun. She said. The Hokage nodded and dismissed the team after telling Kuma to take their captures to Ibiki. The whole team then went their separate ways, Naruto and Itachi appeared in front of the Ichiha compound and entered. Soon they walked into the main house and smelled some delicious food being cooked. Mitoko appeared from the kitchen hearing the door slide and gasped seeing Itachi in Anbu armor. It was a good thing that Naruto knew how to change quickly or else he would have been seen in his armor also. Itachi-kun, I thought you were going to join Anbu next week, and where have you been mister? I don't care if you leave a shadow clone here to keep Sasuke-kun company, but I'm expecting the real you here for dinner from now on, you hear me? She said, moving a wooden spoon in front of his face, in an angry way. Yes ma'am. Naruto said, but he was then hit by the spoon. What was that? She asked, as Naruto rubbed his head. Yes, Kasan. He said. Matoko perked up and hugged the young blonde, like she didn't even hit him with a spoon. That's how I like it, so how was it at the Hokage's house today, were you nice to his grandson? She asked letting him go and go back into the kitchen to finish the rice she was cooking. Itachi used this cue to leave, while Naruto went into the kitchen. Yes I was nice to him, but what else could you do with a child that's only three years old? He said sitting at the table, and then Makoto began to talk about her day. Naruto was just glad that she didn't know about his other life, but in a corner of his mind he knew that she knew, but didn't want to say anything. Maybe after some time being a captain he could retire and become a kid and have a childhood, just to make her happy. He was still rubbing his head, feeling phantom pains of the dreaded wooden spoon. Chapter 6. Talks and Future Problems The next day, Naruto woke up from his long nap. He yawned, rubbing his belly, sighing at the large meal he had the night before. He got up and took a shower and got dressed in a pair of black shorts and put on a regular high-collared dark blue shirt. The Toko was putting him in the academy, he complained that he didn't want to go and almost told her that he was Anbu and didn't need to go to the academy with a bunch of brats. So he had to get up really early, looking at the clock he noticed it was 6.34 am damn, I took too long in the shower. He thought, jumping out the window, being careful not to wake anyone and being an Anbu with training and stealth made it easy for him. He appeared on the windowsill of the Hokage's office and opened the window and searched the desk for the academy enrollment application Mitoko sent here. He found it and burned it with a small fire, and just as the last of the embers disappeared, the Hokage entered the office. Naruto-kun, I thought I felt your chakra signature up here, so do you mind telling me what you're doing up here? He said sniffing the air a little smelling burned cinders, what did you burn? He said crossing his arms. Naruto lowered his head, Mitoko Kas and was thinking of enrolling me into the academy, and what I burned was the application for it. He said, telling the truth. The Hokage thought about this, well good, but you could have just come to me and told me of this, now she's going to be suspicious of how come you didn't get into the academy. He said thinking more, hey Naruto-kun, do you want your position in Anbu to go completely public, like Itachi-kun's and Kakashi-kun's were, the village would become more feared knowing of your identity and the power you withhold. The Hokage asked his young charge. Naruto looked puzzled at the Hokage. You want to use me to make the village feared, I don't know. I would like to stay in the shadows, where I do my best. He declined the offer of publicity. The Hokage shook his head chuckling to himself, oops. He said digging into his robe. Naruto froze, oops, what do you mean by that old man? He said as his Sharingan came to life, as Kai flooded the room. That's when Naruto heard a voice. Isn't it obvious, the man already went against your wishes, before you even knew. The demonic voice said, shocking Naruto as he had never heard the voice before. I'm sorry Naruto-kun, but you're already in the next issue of the bingo book, it's already shipping out to all the foreign countries and some of your information is in there. He said taking out a bingo book and throwing it to the young boy. You're on page 53 and 54, right between Itachi and Kakashi. Naruto turned to the page and looked at what was on it. Name? Namak is Uzumaki Ichiha Naruto aka Shy no Cage, Shadow of Death. Age? 9. Eye color? Blue-gray. Hair color? Blonde, rank. Anbu captain, kitsune mask. Affinities. Wind, water, earth, are primary with fire and lightning, being secondary, trained by. 
the Sand Dame of Konoha, Green Beast of Konoha, and the Jinjutsu Mistress of Konoha. Mother. Yuzumaki Kashina aka Aka no Shai, Red Death. Father. Namakiz Minato aka Kairoi no Senku, Yellow Flash. Class. SS Class. Skills. In all categories, very high ninjutsu, jinjutsu, and tojutsu. Bloodline. Sharingan. High chakra reserves and container of the Kaiubi no Kitsune, this condition has issued the village to add another S to the class. Naruto looked at the Hokage like he was crazy, his Sharingan spinning like crazy, why the hell did you put all of this in here? He yelled, wanting an answer immediately. The Hokage looked sternly at the young boy. Don't forget just who you're talking about Naruto. I did what I did for the village, now we are much stronger and more feared with you public. He said calming down at the end, not to mention, you were only put into Anbu for protection until you got strong enough to protect yourself, which you can do fine, now leave my office I got work to do. He said dismissing Naruto with a wave of his hand, which Naruto had nothing to do except apologize to his leader, while bowing and leaving the office in a body flicker. Not even a second after appearing from his body flickering to the roof of a nearby building, did he hear the voice again. You're just going to take that from that old fossil. The voice asked in mild discontent. Deep down Naruto knew this was the Kaiubi and decided to be respectful to the giant Kitsune in his mind, after all it is the king of all demons speaking to him, I have to, he's the leader of the village. Naruto thought simply. And yet, you're stronger than him, he did too good of a job training you. And plus I have the feeling that something is going to happen in the future, and when the time comes, you need to make a decision. To either stay here, where you're hated in public and respected in the shadows, or leave and you'll be feared by all. Think about the choice, kid. Iwubi said cryptically as it returned to the depths of Naruto's mind. Naruto stood on the roof for another five minutes just thinking about what Kaiubi said. Before he shook his head and jumped towards Anko's apartment to see how she was doing, as he hadn't seen her in quite some time. He appeared in front of the door and knew not to knock as it was a little too early in the morning and she would get cranky if he woke her up. So he picked the lock, as melting it would be bad, and silently entered the apartment and looked around. The apartment was a little boring. If you ask him, it only contained a couch and a little table, a television, no pictures on the wall and no decorations anywhere. He heard light snoring coming from the single bedroom and quietly entered and saw one of the purple-haired goddesses in the village, sprawled out in her bed, the blankets barely covering her body. Her hair was out of its usual ponytail and it was longer than he had imagined, it looked like it could reach her shoulder blades. He looked around her room and saw a couple of picture frames with pics of her, Yu Gao, Kurinai, and another girl he hadn't seen before, she looked about 16 years old. She had brown hair and had red fang-like marks on her cheeks, showing that she was an Inuzuka. She had a moderate-sized bust, maybe a small C cup, and nice cute light brown eyes. This picture was taken recently, he noticed Anko and the others looked the same as they do now, so maybe a couple of weeks ago. The main thought in his mind was, why wasn't he invited to take the picture with them, or was this girl's night out? Whatever it was he didn't care, all he cared about was meeting this new chick. The real thought was why didn't he know this girl, he was an Anbu Dam, and he should know about everyone in the village, until it came to him. He snapped his fingers and silently watched Anko turn over and make a cute sound as she did. But back to the topic at hand, the girl was Inuzuka Hana, daughter of the clan head, Tsum. Ah I love being an Anbu. He thought as he turned around. He walked to the door and exited the room, closing the door silently as he did, for what he was about to do would most likely wake her up. A little after 8am Anko finally woke up and opened her door, when the scent of some delicious breakfast invaded her senses, she got into shinobi mode, knowing that, not only did she not have a roommate, but someone was still in her apartment. She grabbed a kunai from only Kami knows where and stalked through her house and entered the kitchen throwing her kunai as she did. She didn't expect for it to bounce off of a swirling ball of wind that was surrounding the intruder, and the only people she knew that knew how to use wind were Naruto and Asuma, and the latter was still at the capital. She barely just noticed that the intruder was Naruto, she rubbed the sleepiness out of her eyes and looked closer at the invader and saw his spiky blonde hair. Now, now Enko-chan, there is no way to treat someone who just cooked us breakfast. Naruto said, hopping down from. Nothing. She scoffed, yeah well nobody told you to cook this delicious food. Smelling meal. She spoke slower as she smelled the food on her kitchen table. Her stomach growled and she blushed slightly as she rubbed the back of her head. Sorry I haven't had anything to eat since you brought in that missing nin, Zabuza, he hasn't even talked since we got him, not even a Bicky can make him utter a single sound. I even told him I was going to cut his balls off if he didn't say anything. She said not seeing Naruto shiver in slight fear. He sat at the table with the rest of the food and did he talk. Naruto said dividing the food up equally and sitting down. He just cooked an omelette that had some ham and herbs in it, with a side of hash browns and bacon. She nodded, after saying, I did akamasu with Naruto. 
Yeah, he said, don't cut my balls off, and that he needed them. She said as they both laughed. Now that I think about how exactly did you capture someone like Zabuza in the first place. She said, taking a bite of her omelette. Naruto stopped mid-bite, Hamai never even asked Kuma how he did it. He thought as he looked at Anko and shrugged his shoulders. Maybe we should ask him later. Naruto suggested after finishing his meal, Anko agreed as she too finished her meal. That was a great breakfast, thank you Naruto-kun. Anko said, giving him a peck on the cheek, watching Naruto blush and rub the back of his head in embarrassment. So how about we go to HQ now and get the questioning over with? She asked to walk to her room to change into her regular clothes since all she was wearing was a pair of bra and panties over a robe. That's good. Naruto said, and as soon as the door to her room closed blood started to finally come out of his nose and his head collapsed on the table as he had seen more than he should have and used the Sharingan to memorize it, good thing she hadn't noticed. She came out minutes later after he picked his head up from the table and cleaned up the blood from his nose and they left for the Anbu HQ. On the way Naruto turned to Anko. Hey Anko, did you get the new bingo book? He asked out of the blue. She shook her head negatively, no, why did it update? She asked as Naruto nodded, reaching into his pocket and throwing the one he got from the Hokage. She caught it mid-jump and skimmed through it, she stopped completely forcing Naruto to stop too. Uh Naruto-kun, what are you doing in the bingo book and why is there so much information? You know now that I think about it, all of the people that enter the Anbu and have the Sharingan find their way onto the bingo book, it's weird. She said, shrugging her shoulders, not caring anymore, for what was done, was done. Meaning it couldn't be reversed, so you might as well adapt to it. Naruto caught the book and they continued their journey, the Hokage put me in here, saying that, now that I'm stronger, I should get out of the shadows and stop hiding. Which I understand, but I've been in the shadow for the past four or five years now. I like not being glared at by the populace every time I'm on break and journey into the village. Naruto said just rambling the more he went on. Anko turned to him and said, huh, what did you say I wasn't listening to? She said laughing, knowing that he knew where she got it from. Naruto joined in the laughter as they did a quick body flicker to appear on the other side of the wall and went straight to Anbu HQ. They entered after being checked and saying hello to some of the members they knew and headed for the part of the building that held the prisoners, where they went through the maze-like corridor and opened a door and stepped into a hallway that held the holding cells. They passed by many dangerous criminals that were either there for life or waiting for a private execution. They opened the door at the end of the hallway and entered a less dangerous criminal area, these were just people that were only here for a predetermined amount of time and those either getting ready for being interrogated or were sent back here because they didn't crack. They walked to the guard guarding the cell and asked him if they could talk to the prisoner. The Anbu nodded and walked away after unlocking the door for them to enter. And when they did, it was safe as Abusa's hands were tied to the wall and the handcuffs had a chakra draining sea latched onto them and not to mention the strength of the cuffs themselves so they wouldn't be in any kind of trouble. Currently Zabuza was meditating with his hands behind his back and sitting in the most comfortable position he could be in. Zabuza, we need to talk to you. Naruto said sitting down in front of the demon of the mist. Naruto began to study the man since he didn't respond to his statement. He noticed the man was in a very deep concentration, I noticed you seem to be reinforcing your mind to prepare yourself for when Inoichi-san comes to take a look at your mind, to gather information about your country and anything else he feels like looking at. Naruto said seeing a slight twitch in the left eye of the man. He had been removed of his weapons, obviously, and his original clothing, he was now wearing a simple grey full body jumpsuit and simple cloth wrapped around his feet. And now that Naruto thought about it, he had come in with somebody. Say where is that one kid we brought in with him? Naruto asked Anko, not turning away from the man, and he was guaranteed a more noticeable twitch from the man, who then opened his eyes. Where is Haku? He asked simply with fire burning in his brown eyes, looking straight into Naruto's own blue-gray ones. Naruto wagged his finger in front of the man's face, knew uh, uh I'm the one that's going to answer the questions, but if it'll help you cooperate, then I'll tell you. Are you going to cooperate with me? Naruto asked, stopping his finger wagging and looking straight into the older man's eyes, just as he was doing to him. He could have used the Sharingan to make him cooperate, but where was the fun in that? They continued to stare into each other's eyes before Zabuza lowered his eye level and nodded to the boy, hating that he had to do it, but he just had to know where the boy was. Naruto gave a small smile and spoke to Anko. Anko told the man where the boy was. I imagine that he'll be pleased. He said standing up from his crouch and shaking his legs to get rid of the aches and pains. Anko also smiled, the kid is in a way better, more furnished jail cell. We felt that since he was only a kid, he should be put into a more livable area. You're lucky that Naruto-kun here discourages using pain to get information, or I might just have chopped your balls off. She said laughing at the end, making the two males in the room shiver at the statement. Naruto pushed the thought out of his mind and crouched back in front of Zabuza. Now let's get this started with, first question. 
How exactly did Kuma capture you yesterday? Naruto said with curiosity in his voice. Tabuza got a little annoyed at hearing the question. Well, at first, I walked away from Gato and felt the slight use of a body flicker and immediately knew someone was shadowing me in my charge. I was then trying to lead the follower into an open area where I could properly deal with it, but I felt another pulse of chakra and the man appeared in front of me with Haku under his arms and threatened that I come with him or else he'll kill Haku. When Naruto heard that he grew angry with the muscled man at the tactic he used, it sounded a little like how root ninjas would perform, and if the man was on his team, he must have been ordered to watch either him, Itachi, or both of them, by their leader Danzo. He didn't have time to tell the man to continue as he did a second later. After hearing that I struggled for a solution on what to do until I gave myself up, as the Anbu did have a kunai on Haku's neck. After giving up, I watched him put his kunai away and lunged for Haku, but an earth clone appeared from under me grabbing my foot before I could fully get off the ground. I tripped and fell on the floor and was then knocked out with a chop to my neck and next thing I know I'm waking up here. Zabuza finished his story reluctant to tell them that he fell on the floor. Naruto heard laughter in his head and knew the Kaiubi was rolling on the floor, laughing loudly because his head was starting to hurt. Shut up, please, I can't concentrate. Naruto thought adding the please when it suddenly got quiet, a chuckle was then heard after. It was wise of you to say please Naruto shook his head and turned to Anko. Go get a Biki and get him to handle the rest of the interrogation. I'm going to gather my team for some team sparring. You want to watch? He asked as they walked out of the cell, the Anbu near them saluted and locked the door and stood in front of it again. Anko nodded and they went separate ways to gather the team, with Naruto telling Anko to meet them at training ground 43. Since Naruto was already in HQ he searched for Kuma and found him in the Anbu's personal training ground. Kuma, gather your equipment and meet me at training ground 43. He said simply not seeing Kuma not as he turned around and body flickered out of HQ. Knowing that Anko was getting Yuigao, he went back into the Achiha compound and checked the sun for a quick time estimate. It looked around noon, he looked around and noticed people looking at him and wishing him a good afternoon. He noticed something though, not many people were in the streets, only kids and some old people. He shrugged his shoulders thinking it wasn't his problem and body flickered to the main house where he lived. He entered just as Hugaku was leaving and they ran into each other with him falling on his butt, ow. The blonde said, rubbing his butt. The older man slightly glared down at him and fixed his formal kimono, the glare became more cold at noticing Naruto's blonde hair. Get up boy, you're in my way. He said as Naruto picked himself up and stepped out of the man's way, his Sharingan activated as he glared at the man's back. He entered the house to see Itachi's back as he walked down the hallway to his room. He could feel the anger rolling off of his body, so he followed. He peeked his head in Itachi's room, Itachi, what happened with your father, back there? Naruto asked not wanting to be in the dark. Itachi looked at his captain. Well after breakfast, he talked to me in private, telling me that the clan was going to have a meeting, and I told him that I didn't want to go. I thought that it ended right there, but after mother and Sasuke left to get some more groceries, he talked to me again, telling me the plan he was thinking of. He's planning to take the village over and assume his place as the Hokage, I strongly disagreed with him and told him that he'll only get himself killed. He then explained to me that it wouldn't happen if I was to become a spy and give up the weaknesses of the Hokage Tower and the Sandame's living quarters to assassinate the Hokage. Itachi said in anger as he began dressing in his Anbu armor as he wanted to get a mission to calm down. Naruto shook his head and stared at the roof and I expect that you declined that offer as well. Naruto said looking briefly at Itachi seeing him nod his head. So what are you going to do? Naruto asked his subordinate. I'm going to report it to the Hokage and follow whatever order he gives me. He strapped on his boots and stood up and after opening his window jumped out, with Naruto following. Naruto turned to the older Ichiha, Itachi, do that later, now we're going to training ground 43 for an exercise I have brewing up in my noggin. Naruto said as he jumped off course to where he knew training ground 43 was. Itachi stopped on the next roof and stared at the Hokage Tower in the distance and glanced behind him and looked at the retreating form of Naruto. He sighed as he turned around and followed his captain. Chapter 7. Exercises and Meetings. Clearing in Training Ground 43. Naruto was leaning against a giant boulder with his hands behind his head by the time Itachi jumped into the clearing. It was minutes after him that Yuigao and Anko appeared and then it was Kuma who appeared. Kuma wasn't wearing his mask and it showed a man's face, he had a mustache and beard combo, making a goatee. He had dull, emotionless brown eyes that were common in root and short brown hair. They gathered around him and waited for what he had to say. Naruto continued looking at the sky as he spoke. As you all likely know, my identity in Anbu has been recently exposed by the Hokage and after some time thinking about it, I came to understand why he did it. Naruto began his speech as his team and Anko listened on quietly. Naruto shoved himself off the rock and looked around. 
I now believe that he is making the village more feared than what it used to be before the unveiling. Anko has already seen my page in the bingo book, now I am to believe that you have seen it by now. He asked looking at his team watching them nod their heads. I saw it when Anko came to my apartment. Yugao said, crossing her arms. Naruto nodded his head, good now today I have a little exercise planned for the evening. It's going to be a two on two fight, with the team switching up every now and again. That part will be played by Anko, who will call out two numbers of whoever she wants on a team. Naruto said, handing out some numbered papers. The rules are simple, no weapons, and only to jutsu. Naruto had one, Yugao had two, Itachi three, and Kuma four. After everyone had their numbers and stepped away from each other, Anko called out two numbers, one and two. She said loudly as Naruto and Yugao dashed towards Itachi and Kuma. They split apart and rushed after their separate targets. Naruto reached Kuma and sent a punch to his chest. Kuma quickly sidestepped it and grabbed the arm and threw Naruto into the air. While in the air Naruto threw down a smoke pellet that exploded outwards and a heavy smoke covered the area. He landed just in time to see Kuma jump out of the heavy fog and try to kick him in the side. Without using the Sharingan he predicted that this would happen and was already in the motion for a jump. As the leg passed under him, he used it as leverage as he sent a kick of his own at Kuma. The kick connected as Kuma was sent flying backwards. But Yuugao, she sent a punch at Itachi who dropped to the ground to dodge it and went for a leg sweep. The purple-haired woman slightly jumped over it and sent a kick at Itachi as she did it. Itachi barely tilted his head back enough for the kick to safely pass his head. While in the motion of going backward, he rolled and sprung in the air and landed on his feet, just in time to grab the punch thrown by Yuugao. He then threw her over his shoulders, and she was sent flying in the air. Enko then called out, two and three. So Yuugao, while in the air, turned around, and when she landed on the floor sent a punch at Naruto, who had just kicked Kuma away. Naruto's danger senses went off and jumped away from the punch, nice dodge Naruto-kun. She said as she ran to Naruto. Naruto nodded and dodged another punch and a kick before he sent his own. It missed the middle of her midsection, but connected with the side of it. Yugao used the spin the punch caused and roundhouse kicked Naruto in the side of his shoulders. Naruto was sent skidding on his feet for a couple of feet before he stopped and rushed toward the Anbu female. But the Tachi, after throwing Yugao, he heard the numbers being called and rushed to the flying Kuma. While Kuma was rolling on the ground he jumped in the air and sent an axe kick at the brown-haired man. Kuma stopped himself from rolling, just in time to put up his arms to block Itachi's axe kick. He didn't push him off like some people would, instead he quickly grabbed the ankle of the eldest Ichiha and slammed him to the floor beside him. He then got up and threw him across the field. Itachi groaned after being slammed into the ground and while in the air, he activated his Sharingan. So when Kuma came after him it was a piece of cake to counter and dodge his attacks. He sent a couple of his own, and soon Kuma was gasping for air after getting hit in the throat, but he didn't have time to even do that as Itachi spun and sent a roundhouse kick to the man's head, sending him across the field. After the kick connected Anko called out, one and two. Again, making Itachi curse under his breath after kicking the man. And with Naruto and Yuugao, he skidded to a stop right in front of her after faintly hearing the numbers. He had almost crashed into the purple-haired Anbu, but she moved out of the way and grabbed his arm, stopping him from going any further. They then dashed toward the others. This time Naruto went after Itachi and activated his Sharingan, seeing Itachi's own red eyes. This was something you would want to see as none of the hits these two warriors were throwing hit their designated target. Then something intriguing happened, Naruto connected a hit on the elder Ichiha. Itachi flew back and groaned a little as he rubbed his sore cheek. How'd you do that? He asked, getting up and noticing Naruto didn't have his Sharingan activated. And even though he was moving Itachi couldn't predict where he was going to be next. Naruto smirked as he could obviously hear the curiosity in Itachi's calm voice. It's a technique I created to counter the predicting abilities of the Sharingan. I'm not going in detail, but basically I halted my chakra from going where I was going to go next. I know it's a little difficult to understand, but don't you think I wouldn't know the weakness of my own bloodline? He said seeing the small indentation of a raised eyebrow from the dark hair to Che. He smirked again as he spoke again, alright let's bring out the ninjutsu. He said it loud enough for everyone to hear. Now it's going to be everyone for themselves. He said as his hands blurred through hand seals, shocking Itachi at its speed. Da no Kuchi, serpent mouth, he said as he spit out a snake from his mouth and it sped towards Itachi, weaving through the air as it did. Itachi wasn't being idle as he was also doing hand seals, he said, Doten. Doriuhiki, earth wall, he crouched to the ground and slammed his hands on the ground and a wall of earth rose in the air, stopping the serpent from doing any damage to him. And then the battle of elements started with the two Ichiha experts. But Yuugao she dashed forward, but her punch was blocked by the recovering Kuma. She was then raised in the air, but before the man could slam her back on the floor, she kicked him under his chin. 
As he let go of her she dropped onto the floor and spun on her hand, using her feet to kick his feet from under him. The man became a little agitated at always being put on the floor and quickly rolled back onto his feet and kicked Yuigao in the stomach while she was getting up. Yuigao was a little surprised at the speed Kuma was going, and she was, again, surprised when he appeared by her and punched her to the ground. The short two feet fall did more damage than she would have thought. And then he threw another punch at her, she rolled out of the way, just in time to dodge the heavy punch, they both then heard Naruto tell them they could now use ninjutsu in the fight. So while she was getting up she was doing hand seals. In Yuzuma Ken, lightning fist, she said as she dashed towards the brown haired man with lightning around her fist. Guma was doing some hand seals also, but the speed Yuigao was going surprised him a little, and he didn't have time to finish them, unless he didn't want to have a head anymore. He ducked backwards and only received a slight shock from the passing lightning. He quickly jumped away from the female and did a hand seal, Doton. Doryu Taiga, Earth Flow River, he said as the dashing Yuigao slipped on the mud and was being carried by the strong current of the mud. In the trees, away from the fighting was Anko, she was a little excited with the fighting, but got bored when her job no longer existed. But getting an idea she dropped to the ground from her branch and did some hand seals. Doton. Iwahibi, rocky snakes, she said as dozens of snakes crashed out of the ground and slithered toward the others. She grinned as she joined in the fight. Naruto just dodged a fireball from his fellow Uchiha and was about to send one of his own when half a dozen snakes appeared in front of him and tried to bite him. So instead of the fireball going to Itachi, it hit the face of the nearest snake, so the resulting explosion sent him flying away, with a couple burns marrying his shorts. He looked around and dodged a bite from another snake. He growled as lightning covered his body before it covered his hands and feet. So the nearest snake was kicked and the exploding shrapnel damaged another snake as his enhanced speed allowed him to dodge it. Soon the remaining four snakes were destroyed, but a new challenger emerged as Anko appeared in front of him. I see you destroyed my pets, now I want an apology. She said, crossing her arms with a smirk on her face. Naruto slightly gaped at her. You're serious. He said in disbelief and after seeing her nod her head he shook his, I'm sorry I can't do that, you ruined my training exercise. He said dashing forward as he fraught his new opponent. But Itachi, after firing his fireball at Naruto and seeing him dodge it, a half a dozen snakes appeared around him. And one of them coiled itself around his body, but the body then exploded and destroyed that snake and two of the other snakes around it. He appeared again, and with only three more snakes to fight, he did some hand seals, Katen. Ryu Atama N, flaming dragon head, he said as a large dragon head flew out of his mouth and quickly destroyed a snake. And as the remaining two slithered to him some more hand seals, Katen. Zukaku, head mincing pain, he said as he blew out a huge column of fire that destroyed the other two snakes when it exploded after contact with them. He looked around and spotted Naruto fighting Anko, so he decided to fight with Yugao and Kuma. After Yuigao dodged a huge dango of earth, she launched a beam of lightning at the unsuspecting snake that appeared in front of her. Though the beam kept going and hit Kuma in the leg after he destroyed his own snake. He was lucky that it only brushed against the side of it and not through it or he wouldn't be able to use the leg for a long time. He winced as the beam passed by, he then started doing some hand seals when his five remaining snakes surrounded him. Doton. Ishi no Yorwe, stone armor, he said as his body was then covered in hardened rocks that were surrounding him. He punched the nearest rock and destroyed it easily with his enhanced strength, Yugao appeared behind him and kicked the snake that was about to make him its next meal. Watch yourself Chiro, these snakes mean business. She said, firing another beam at another snake. The newly named Chiro nodded his head and did a hand seal, Doton. Ishi Kasui, stone spikes, he said and destroyed three of the remaining four snakes. He then dashed forward and punched the last snake in its rocky head, destroying it. He turned around to see Yuigao destroy her last snake with another one of her lightning beams. It was then that Itachi appeared near them. Anko is fighting Naruto Tiacho, let's go watch. He said as they all disappeared and went to watch the fight between Naruto and Anko. Naruto dodged another high-speed strike from the purple-haired goddess, snakes burst from her sleeve and gathered around him trying to constrict around his body, but his body went poof in a cloud of smoke. Naruto didn't want to use any danger, so he did a hand seal, Suiten. Miserappa, violent water wave, he said as he blew out a stream of water. He cursed himself when he saw Anko jump over it and send more snakes at him. He charged a Rasengan in his hand and destroyed the attacking snakes. He did more hand seals when Anko landed and slammed his hands on the ground, Doton. Atashi Buta, covering lid, he said as an oversized lid fell on Anko and covered her. This gave Naruto time to take a deep breath before Anko tried to pull him into the ground with her headhunter technique, thankfully he jumped away in time. He ended his and watched the giant lid disappear in a puff of smoke. He decided to end the little spar they were having as he vanished from his spot, making Anko frown. Naruto appeared behind her, don't frown. 
he whispered in her ear as he pressed a pressure point in her neck, making her body fall into his arms. He didn't have time to take a breath before the body in his arms disappeared, showing a piece of wood in its place. He groaned when he saw this and looked at the smirking Anko from across the clearing. All right, she wants to play like that, then let's play. He muttered as he quickly did some hand signs, Katen. Yo no Akami, wolves of burning embers, he muttered as he blew out a dozen of little fireballs at the ground in front of him. And like the name suggests wolves made a fire emerged from the embers, there were ten wolves in total. Anko smirked and brought back her rocky snakes, and when the two hordes of creatures met in the middle, a massive explosion rocked the clearing, and a crater of a couple of meters wide and a half a meter deep was left in the middle. The other's eyes widened as, not only hadn't they seen this, but they were surprised at the magnitude of the explosion. The fight had ended as soon as Anko witnessed the crater, as she whistled to show her surprise. Geez Naruto-kun, what if that would have hurt me, now I really want my apology. She said walking over to him, as the others joined in. Naruto's response was cut off when he seen a hawk diving down towards him, it flapped its wings and landed on his outstretched arm. Naruto took the scroll from around its leg, and the hawk squawked loudly, making Naruto's ears hurt because of the proximity of the sound. Itachi unsealed a small piece of jerky from his scroll and gave it to the bird, and they all watched it fly away, its mission now complete. What does the scroll say about Naruto-kun? Anko asked, looking at the Hokage's seal on the scroll. Naruto opened the scroll, looked it over and burned it when he was finished. So are you going to tell us or not? Anko said with her hands on her hips. The council just wants to see me about the bingo book and my position in Anbu. He said as he began to walk away, he soon vanished in a tornado body flicker. It was only a matter of time before the council called Taicho in. Chiro said as he rubbed his head. Itachi showed a slight frown when he heard the comment because now his little brother was going to be in a room with a bunch of power-hungry old people who will most likely try to control him in some way. He shook his head and looked at the sun in the sky to check the time, well according to the sun it was around 3 in the afternoon. He sighed because around this time his other brother, Sasuke, would come home from school and ask for training. The kid just turned eight a couple of weeks ago, and since then he has been asking for training non-stop. It was getting on his nerves. You alright Itachi? Yu Gao said as they all glanced at him, he just shook his head and started to walk home. Yu Gao shrugged her shoulders and went home to take another shower. Guma went to train by himself until his team got a mission, and the only person left was Anko, who started walking to the mission hall to see if she could get a mission, but on her way she cursed herself as she realized that Naruto didn't apologize to her. But Naruto, Naruto walked into the room and stood on the right side of the Hokage. Now that Naruto-kun is here, this meeting can begin. Sandame said. Naruto looked around the room as everyone looked at him and muttered words to their neighbors. He yawned to show how he felt about the meeting so far. One of the elders stood, it was the woman. Hokage-sama, can you tell us, why weren't we informed about Uzumaki's position in the Anbu, nor of his skills, until this morning? Kaharu asked, starting off the questioning. Before the Hokage could answer Naruto, I don't think that's any of your business, as the Anbu Corps members are supposed to be kept secret and only exposed when the village needs a morale boost. If my identity was revealed at an earlier time, then it wouldn't have worked as well as it did at the present time. And plus the council, not even the shinobi side, needs to know the roster for the Anbu Corps, trust me I'm very updated in the rules of the village. He explained picking at his ears when the noise started escalating. You insolent whelp, it would be wise not to anger the council, as we have more power than you can imagine. Danzo said, another elder of the village, as he too stood to his feet. The louder voice made itself known, yeah you brat, you're lucky we don't have you hanged for your disrespect. Sakumi said in disgust at the demon Ichia. Still not believing that he was the son of Yandane. Naruto slightly glared at the women, before relaxing, if I am correct to believe, but isn't this a matter dealing with a shinobi of the village, you have no business in here civilian, I would like to have you leave, with the rest of the civilian council. He said looking at the Hokage, who nodded and Anbu escorted the civilians out of the room, albeit they were yelling their heads off at the demon kicking them out of the room. The shinobi council smirked at the backs of the civilians, as the elders frowned at seeing their support leave the room, because with them gone they couldn't accomplish anything. Damn that little brat and his knowledge of the village's rules and regulations. Hugaku spoke up, Yuzumaki, how long have you been in the Anbu? He said, looking into Naruto's eyes with his Sharingan activated to see if the child was lying. Everyone's eyes were on the child who glanced at the Hokage for a second seeing him nod his head. I've been in the Anbu since I was six years old, so almost four years. He answered truthfully, not seeing any reason to lie to them. Yugaku nodded his head, having a feeling he would say that, Inoichi spoke up, how are you doing mentally, are you suffering from any mental traumas or anything? He asked, knowing how dangerous the Anbu core was to a person's mind. Naruto shook his head in the negative, no, nothing is wrong with my mind. He said with his head leaning on his hand in boredom. 
The meeting progressed for another hour with useless questions being asked to the blonde, ironically the elders kept quiet and let the others ask the questions. After it ended Naruto walked out of the room, with Fugaku by his side as they both walked to the Ichiha compound. Fugaku looked at the board Anbu captain and got a plan, hey Naruto, you like power right? He said looking at the young Ichiha. Naruto mentally shook his head, already knowing what he wanted to ask him, but decided to play along anyway. Yeah, I do, why do you have any? He asked looking at the clan head. Fugaku ignored the jab at his strength. Yes I do, and you could have some if you help me, but I'll only tell you if you help me, do we have a deal? The clan head said keeping things as vague as he could. As long as I get stronger I don't care what I have to do. Naruto said with faked enthusiasm. Fugaku gave a dark smirk as he put his hand on Naruto's shoulder, with Naruto on my side, I'll become Hokage in no time. He thought sinisterly as they entered the compound. Chapter 8. Massacre. A year and a couple of months later, Naruto is now 11 years old and he's walking to Itachi's room. It's around 2 o'clock in the morning and the rest of the household was sleeping. He's not going to Itachi's room because of an Anbu mission, no their team has a week off, it's about what he talked about with Fugaku a couple of hours back with the ninja of the Ichiha clan. He silently opens the door and peeks his head into the room, he silently walked to Itachi's bed and stood over him, Itachi. He whispered and the eldest Ichiha's eyes shot open at hearing his name, his dark eyes bled to his Sharingan and then to his Manjiku Sharingan, he gained after Shisui was sent to spy on him and he was forced to kill him. The first time he awakened it, he went straight to Naruto, who he thought already had it, but it was news to Naruto as he had never heard about it until that point in time. This forced Naruto to meditate and confront the Kaiubi about the subject, and all the giant fox did was laugh in his face, he still remembers that day. Flashback four months ago, why are you laughing? All I asked was what the Manjiku Sharingan was. Naruto asked in annoyance at the Kitsune's response toward his question. The noise the fox was making was making his ears hurt, and it just continued until Naruto used his power over his own mind to make the cage much smaller than it was supposed to be, stopping the fox's laughter and making it a little uncomfortable. All right Ninjin, I'll tell you, just make the cage bigger or I'll eat you alive. The fox half pleaded and half threatened. Naruto thought for a moment and then made the cage larger since the fox still hasn't told him what he wants to know. All right fox, now can you answer my question, please? The blonde said, sitting on the damp floor. Kaiubi shook a little, feeling back into his body and let his tails move across the floor behind him, finding a comfortable spot for them and then he laid down and glared at the sitting human. Don't ever do that again. Now the Manjiku Sharingan is an upgrade of the regular Sharingan. The user gains special abilities after activating these special eyes, a way to get the Manjiku is to train your eyes beyond normal limits and even more beyond that. Another way is to kill your best friend in which the depression felt for committing such an act will somehow transform your eyes. I still don't understand that part and I still don't. Are you following me? Kaiubi said getting out of his lecture mode when he looked at the blonde Anbu, seeing him staring at the ceiling above him. Naruto looked at Kaiubi for a brief second before looking back at the ceiling. Yeah I was listening, I was just thinking about something. Naruto asked for Kaiubi to continue with his lecture. The giant Kitsune growled at the lack of attention but let it slide since he knew that the boy was truly paying attention. Alright, the abilities of the eyes are unique to only the eyes, and the left eye of the Manjiku is the most unique Jinjutsu known to you humans. It's the Tsukiyomi or Goddess of the Moon, when using this technique, the caster can put the victim in a Jinjutsu that is both mentally and physically harmful, and they will be in the illusion for a minimum of 24 hours or a maximum of 72 hours. In the world of Tsukiyomi you are Kami and can torture your victim in any way you can imagine, so it kind of helps to have a vivid imagination. The Kitsune said, chuckling at the things he would be doing on mostly everyone he does the technique on. Now the right eye of the Manjiku are the most dangerous flames in the All Realms, a Madarasu or Goddess of the Sun, when using this ninjutsu, you can burn anything and everything you literally set your eyes on. These flames can never be extinguished by water techniques and will keep burning for 7 days and 7 nights. The only weakness of the Amaterasu is that the flames can be sealed if the sealer knows how. But without the sealing the flames will continue to burn unless either you stop them or after 7 days and nights passes, so you can literally burn a village down and they won't be able to stop it. I will be lectured, his tails waving behind him as if in a trance, and his eyes were glazed over thinking about burning the village down and sleeping in its ashes. Now when using both of the eyes of the Manjiku, you summon the most powerful defense of all time, the Susanoo or the god of sea and storms. This defense can even become your offense, but the sort of offense is different with every user, and only Ichiha Madara, Ichiha Izuna, and now Ichiha Itachi have ever activated the Manjiku, and I haven't seen their Susanoo. The fox continued to lecture, bearing now mind to Naruto who continued to think on his newfound knowledge. Naruto looked at the Kaiubi, so is that it about the Manjiku? He said scratching his head and began to stand up. 
No it isn't all, matter of fact I've only just begun. Kaiubi said, smirking as Naruto sat back on the floor. Kaiubi then told him about another technique called Kamui that can send somebody to another dimension and can even send you to another dimension. The technique can allow even people to pass through them, but it has a weakness, and if you study the workings of the technique for a long time, then you will find the weakness. Another technique was one that was banned by the Achiha, and that was Izanagi, it's a Jinjutsu that grants the user the abilities to make wounds and disadvantages into nothing but a dream. This has a very, very, very dangerous after effect though, and that was the cost of your side of the eye you used to cast it, and that was why it was banded, you don't exactly need the Manjiku to use it. Now that is all about the Manjiku, now remember when one activates the Manjiku, their sight will begin to fade, and a disease will spread through the body every time the person uses it. When you learn to activate yours, that will not be a problem, since I completely terminated that part of the eye's DNA strand. He said looking at the slightly shocked Naruto. So every time Itachi uses one of those techniques his eyesight will get worse, and he'll eventually die or lose his sight when he uses his Manjikyu. He asked just to make sure. Kaiubi nodded and asked another question, how will he be able to keep his eyesight and not get sick? He asked, seeing the fox show a menacing smirk on his face. In order for the boy to keep his sight, is to take the eyes of another Ichiha that has the Manjikyu, and he will gain the eternal Manjikyu Sharingan, which will purge the body of the disease, fix your sight, and you'll gain a longer lifespan, not eternal, but maybe another hundred years or so, or maybe fifty years. He said that last part to himself, but Naruto still heard it, and slightly sweat dropped. Naruto thanked the giant fox for the knowledge, and when he was leaving he felt his eyes burning, causing him to rub his eyes furiously, and when he looked at Itachi, it made the Ichiha's face register a shocked look. Naruto had gained the Manjiku Sharingan from the Kaiubi, who had unlocked it, seeing as Naruto now knew about it. Then flashback, Naruto's own Manjiku sprang to life and they stared at each other until Naruto started talking, Itachi, didn't I tell you to stop using those eyes, I haven't found a way to negate the effects of the disease he said crossing his arms at his brother. Itachi shook his head and cancelled his Manjikyu, as did Naruto, but kept his Sharingan activated. I keep asking you to see if the Kaiubi negates the effects, but you keep denying the request, now what is it that you needed to talk to me about? He said sitting up and pushing the covers off of him. Naruto's once playful face went blank in an instant, making Itachi do the same. The coup is going to happen in a week's time. I just came here to tell you the news. He said his face was returning to normal as he twisted the ends of his muscle shirt. Itachi's face stayed blank as he processed the information, until his face slightly turned to an annoyed one. Wait a minute you woke me up at 2 in the morning to tell me the clan's ninjas were going to attack. Get out I'm going back to sleep. He said, grabbing his covers and turning over trying to go back to the dreamland. Naruto looked embarrassed as he rubbed the back of his head. Well I guess I could have told you some other time, but I had to tell you now, I could feel myself being followed whenever the sun is up and sometimes when the sun is down. I think Fugaku is having me watch constantly to make sure I don't tell the plans of the assault to the Hokage, I only decided to lose the tails now to come here. He said as his face went to a serious one, sensing movement outside. The eldest Ichiha groaned silently as he was also being watched sometimes, but it was only whenever Naruto was near. He thought it was because Naruto knew the plans, and he never went to any of the meetings, since he didn't like the idea of fighting the village and trying to take over. You still didn't tell me why you couldn't tell me any other time. He looked at Naruto from over his shoulder, but he didn't see him. He shrugged and tried to go back to sleep. He then slightly said, about time the clone left. But Naruto, Naruto appeared outside of the Ichiha compound, he swept his hand through his hair, feeling the ninja tailing him go the other way, thanks to his shadow clone dispelling. He looked around a little and started jumping towards the Hokage's office. Moving quickly and silently through the air was like second nature to him, he appeared outside the window and slipped himself in silently not to disturb the still working Hokage, who was grumbling about extra work. Thank Kami, a distraction. The old man whispered to himself as he looked at Naruto. So what can I do for you, Naruto-kun? I don't recall giving your team a mission or anything, so how come you're not asleep like everyone else in the village? He asked as Naruto sat in the chair across the old cage. I'm sorry for the intrusion Hokage I, but earlier today I was in another meeting with the Ichiha about the attack on your person, and they discussed that they were going to attack at the end of the week. He said bowing his head slightly in respect and stared at the serious face worn by his leader. So they are acting, are all the Ichiha going to attack? The Hokage asked, wondering if all of them were going to attack at once or in waves. They're going to come at once, Hokage-sama, I mean there are only 60 Ichihas total, 40 are civilians, and the others are Chuanins and Jounins, they literally don't have the numbers to go in waves, to wear down defenders. He said as the Hokage nodded at the logic. Then you're going to have to kill them all before they could even begin the coup. 
a voice said as the door opened showing a man on a cane and walking into the room, making the two inside to wear a frown. Do you understand, nip the problem in the bud before people's lives get in danger. The man said as he walked into the light showing his bandages around his head and one of his eyes. Anzo what are you doing here so late in the night and disturbing this private meeting? The Hokage asked glaring at the man, who continued looking at the shocked Naruto. What you want me to kill the entire clan, that's inhuman, the civilians have nothing to do with the coup. To even think of me killing those civilians for no apparent reason is sickening for me, but as Anbu I have no problem doing what is needed for the village. He said, putting his head down. No Naruto you don't have to kill the civilians of the Achiha clan, only the active ninjas need to die, preferably the strongest of the clan, and the rest will quit seeing as the strongest Sharingan holders are not going to be here to help them. Saratobi said. But if he doesn't kill the civilians, they're going to eventually grow up into ninjas, and their parents will tell them how some of their relatives tried to take over the village but were killed by somebody in the night. You don't want that to happen to you? He said glaring at the young Anbu. Naruto started getting a little annoyed by the attention, fine I'll kill those that need to be killed, I'll observe them more to see if any of the civilians are aware of the plans, and if they are then they're added to the list, the ones not aware will be spared. He said disappearing from the office, in a burst of electricity. Some of the static shocked Danzo and Saratobi, making some of their hairs stand up. You're a fool Saratobi, if some of them are spared then a coup will be in the future of this village. The one-eyed man said, turning around and heading back to his HQ to prepare some plans of his own. The old man just glared at the retreating man's back and got back to his paperwork, no Danzo you're the fool, killing uselessly is not something that you used to do, what happened to you? He thought to himself as he got back to work. Four days later, it was around four o'clock, and Naruto was staring at the traveling Ichiha walking through their own dirt road or their compound. He sat atop a building with no one paying any attention to him, and if someone did look up, they would wave and say good afternoon or just nod at him, in which he would say hi back or nod back. According to his calculations, 10 of the civilians knew about the coup, and they were either retired shinobi or are in the family of an active ninja, most of them were old, so they wouldn't be a challenge when the time came to kill them. He looked at the sky and thought, he was thinking about how he would kill them before they decided to attack. He was brought out of his thought when an Achihachuanin appeared behind him, bowing because of his status as an Anbu, he rose a second later and started talking, Naruto-san, Higaku-sama would like to see you. He said simply as he and Naruto disappeared and reappeared in front of the central meeting building in the center of the compound. Naruto entered and looked at all the ninja the Achiha had waiting for the meeting to start. Yugaku looked at the young Anbu enter and smirked, now that Naruto-kun is here the meeting can begin. For the first order of business I believe that we should push up the deadline for the coup. He said looking at the Achiha in front of him. Naruto's face didn't betray his surprise as he had a feeling something like this was going to happen, don't ask him how, all he could tell you is that his gut predicted something like this happening. The coup will happen tomorrow morning when everyone is just waking up, they'll too surprised about the sudden attack to do anything in time, and by then it'll be too late, since my adoptive son Naruto-kun would have already killed the old man Suratobi, and the Achiha will be the leaders of this villager. He said as cheering rung through the room, as some even slapped the back of Naruto in encouragement. But before the sun falls from the sky a problem will have to be dealt with, my son Itachi is not going to be part of the coup, and Naruto will be the one to either have him join us or kill him to prevent him from stopping the coup. He said looking at Naruto whose face was set in shock at the idea of him fighting Itachi. He couldn't possibly fight his brother for real, to the death like Fugaku was insinuating he would do. Not after all they've been through, he wouldn't do it, no matter what the man said. Naruto was broken out of his musing when he felt a hand on his shoulder, he looked up and stared Figaku in the eyes, his eyes were hard and cold as steel, he knew that he'll will have to kill his son, and he had no remorse about it, but beneath that steely look, he could tell that Figaku was hoping that he would be able to sway Itachi to their side. Naruto continued to stare the man in the eye, who had activated his Sharingan for some reason, so he activated his own, don't worry Fugaku-sama the mission will be done, by tomorrow morning, you will either be fighting side by side with your side, or later be going to his funeral. He said as his Sharingan spun quickly, and the rest of the Achiha cheered at his very short speech. Five hours later, Naruto stood atop the entrance arch of the Achiha compound, beside him stood Itachi, they were both dressed in their Anbu uniforms. Naruto had put on a bandana to hide his blonde hair. Naruto looked to his partner in crime, let's not worry about the consequences now, let's just get this over with and do it quickly and quietly. He said quietly as Itachi nodded and they sped through the compound. They soon split up and killed the ones they needed to in their sleep. But sooner or later a scream was heard, and many woke up and walked outside their homes to find the problem, only to scream again as bodies were on the ground, covered in their blood. Ten minutes ago, in an unknown location, a man stood bathed in shadow. 
it looked like he was on top of something, because there were five people below him, they were bowed but dressed as Anbu, the only difference were their blank white masks. Remember the warning soldiers, I want each and every one of them killed, and if they interfere and kill Naruto and Itachi, something about them intrigues me. Bring back all the heads you can carry. He said as the five men disappeared to complete their mission. Back to real time, Naruto sped through the compound slicing the backs and fronts of all those that stood in his way, he killed a couple of civilians that wasn't aware of the coup that was going to happen in the morning, but he paid it no mind, as in Anbu he was used to killing those that weren't supposed to witness something that was not supposed to be witnessed and massacring the Achiha clan was not supposed to be witnessed. He jumped and threw some kunai and shuriken at other ninjas and civilians in the street. With Itachi he was practically doing the same thing, staying on top of the buildings and just throwing kunai and shurikens at the people below, keeping up his speed as he went by. They soon met and were surrounded by eight of the remaining active ninja of the Achiha clan, they disappeared shocking the Achiha, and before they could signal the position or attackers of the compound, they were killed by kunai, shurikens, and their standard issue blades. Naruto and Itachi then felt various chakra signatures all around the compound, and they each heard more screams and looked at each other, before Naruto cursed, oh shit, no that bastard didn't. He said confusing Itachi as he sped off. Naruto appeared in front of a root Anbu, and quickly sliced into the man, but only got the man's arm. The root didn't show that he was hurt and tried to punch Naruto with his other arm, but he was silenced by Naruto who swung his sword and killed the man by cutting his head off, after dodging the punch. Itachi appeared in Naruto. Is that a root ninja what is he doing here? He said looking at the head of the ninja rolled off the roof and to the ground below. I don't know but I have a pretty good reason, good thing too because now I have the perfect excuse. He said confusing Itachi again, as he sped off to take care of the rest of this little group of executioners. Naruto sped through the streets looking at all the dead bodies in the streets, he sighed, thinking that all this could have been avoided if somebody didn't interfere with his mission. The sounds of screaming were getting shorter and shorter, meaning that most of the people had already been killed, and now the assailants were just looking for the rest. Itachi appeared beside Naruto, Naruto, we have to get to my father and take care of him. He said as Naruto nodded and they began to run towards the main house. They appeared and witnessed Fugaku fighting with three members of Root, Mikoto was fighting with him, and they saw Naruto and Itachi, Naruto-kun, Itachi-kun, where have you been helping us fight these murderers? Mikoto said kicking a Root member a couple of feet away to get some breathing room. Naruto shrugged and dashed towards an unsuspecting member and stabbed his sword in the man's back, he quickly pulled back and swung his sword and sliced the man's head off. Another root member was about to throw a kunai at the panting Makoto, but Itachi blocked the kunai and quickly blew out a stream of fire and the close range caused a small explosion and Itachi flew backwards and quickly righted himself in the air and landed on his feet, his face had some ash on it. Yugaku killed the other root member and walked to his wife holding his bleeding side. Honey, the bastard got my liver cough cough, take care of the kids. He said falling to the floor just in front of his wife. Causing her to cry out and quickly go to his side in despair. Sasuke then ran out of the house and saw all the dead bodies of the root members and his father, who here and to. Tusan, wake up Tusan. He said, shaking his father's body, he looked at Itachi and Naruto, Nai Sans you have to help Tusan. He said shedding tears as he continued to shake his father's body, hoping the man will wake up. Itachi walked up to his brother, Atoto, it's useless he's dead, the man he was fighting stabbed him in one of his, I'll let say death spots. He said wondering how to explain to his brother while keeping the graphic words out of the explanation. Naruto looked as the family hugged together and stared at the three root members that were littering the floor around the house. Hey, weren't there five of these guys? He said, putting up a hand and counting off the dead ones on his fingers. Let's see there was the first guy to die, and then these three, so what happened to the other chakra signature I felt in the beginning? He asked himself before he felt a short chakra spike behind Makoto and Sasuke. Itachi felt it too and quickly grabbed both his mother and brother and jumped to the side, avoiding the spikes of earth that were quickly rising out of the earth. Damn I almost got you too, you slick bastard. The man said, walking out of the shadows. Naruto glared at the man until he recognized the build and sound of the man's voice. Hey Chiro, what the hell are you doing in the Ichiha compound? He said before he could stop himself since he already knew. Never mind, don't answer that I already know, which means you have to die. He gripped his sword handle and pulled it from the ground where he had it stabbed into and dashed towards the man who pulled his own sword out and they began to fight it out. Itachi, seeing his captain in trouble, got up to help but was stopped when Naruto spoke up. No Itachi, this is my fight, just protect your family for the time being. The blonde said, taking off his bandana and throwing it in front of Chiro, and watched it fly in the man's face. He acted quickly and stabbed his sword into the man, who disappeared in a puddle of mud. Well I didn't know Taicho could fight so dirty. 
The man said, and for the last time, Chiro isn't my real name, it's a name given to me by my master, I have no real name. He said going through some hand signs, Doton. Jishin, earthquake, he said slamming his hands on the ground, causing the ground to shake. Naruto knew he was going to do this and went through his own hand seals, Raiden. Hakai no Boruto, bolts of destruction, Naruto said as he pointed his hands at the nameless man, and multiple bolts of lightning fired from his hands. The man ended his short seeing as bolts were being sent his way, and they were coming quickly, the first three missed because of them being too far away and him moving out of the way. The last seven hit a different part of his body. One in the left leg, another in the right leg, one in the stomach, another one in his left rib, one in his left shoulder, another one shocked his left arm, and the last one went into his groin. That bolt was on accident and it made Naruto shudder in terror when he heard the man, who was still alive scream in pain, it didn't matter how much training you went through to not show emotions, if you get hit in the nuts by anything you're going to scream and yell until the pain goes away. Naruto walked up to the electrified man and swept his hand through his hair. And pointed his finger at the man's head, it's a shame you know, after all those missions together, who would have thought I would be the one to kill you. And just so you know this is for Zabuza and Haku, who told me to punish you for using your cheap trick to capture them a long time ago. He said as electricity surged through his fingers and he thought, Raiden. Mitsuzo Shu, white lightning, he said as the lightning shot into the man's head and going through it into the ground. He turned around and looked at the others, Sasuke was amazed at the ninjutsu that was being used, but was shocked and a little disgusted by the kill. The Kodo wore a smile of pride at the display of one of her children, and Itachi smiled at the way his brother handled things, the fight would have been over way earlier if he would have helped, but he had the feeling that Naruto was just showing off to Sasuke, showing him that with enough training, he would be able to do the same thing. Naruto looked at the nine-year-old Sasuke and gave him a thumbs up. It's okay now Sasuke Itoto, the bad man won't hurt anybody anymore. He said making Itachi sweat dropped when he saw one of Naruto's teeth shine. Naruto created a dozen shadow clones, okay, I want each of you to search the compound and bring the survivors here. If there are any. He thought, looking at the root member in front of him. Fifteen minutes later, there were five survivors out of sixty members of the Ichiha clan, Sasuke, Mikoto, and three other clan members, one was a boy the age of seven, the others were twin girls the age of four, the new three were brother and sisters, and the boy was protecting his sisters. The boy was named Daisuke, one of the girls was named Mai, while the other was called Kai. Mai had a ponytail while well, Kai didn't, another difference was that Mai was dressed in the color dark blue, while well, Kai was dressed in the color dark grey. Daisuk was wearing grey shorts and a dark blue high-collared shirt. It was obvious that Mikoto was the only surviving adult of the Ichiha clan and now had to take care of three more kids. You don't know how ecstatic she was about raising more children, she loved raising kids is what I'm trying to say. Mikoto hugged the children one more time and led them into the clan house, she looked at Naruto and Itachi, who were watching Sasuke show the little kids around. Hey now that I think of it, why are you two dressed in your Anbu armor so late into the night? She asked, looking at both of them curiously. Naruto spoke up first, I was going to the Hokage Tower to see if I could get a quick mission. He said, and I got Itachi to see if he wanted to come with me, you know for extra protection. He said not telling a full lie, since he did get Itachi and killing the ninja of the Ichiha clan were their mission, they just didn't go to the Hokage tower. The woman shrugged her shoulders. Oh okay, come in the house, take a shower, go to sleep, and I'll have breakfast ready for you in the morning. She said walking inside the house. After she went inside the house, three squads of Anbu and the Hokage appeared in front of them, Naruto reported. Sirotobi said. The mission was going along smoothly until Root appeared and started recklessly killing everybody, making noise, and drawing attention to themselves to draw in their prey. They were effective until me and Itachi encountered them fighting Makoto and Fugaku. I had killed one before and killed another when I got here. Itachi killed another that was about to kill his mother, Fugaku killed the fourth but was killed in the process, the last one, Kumar Chiro, or I don't even know what to call him anymore was the last one to be killed and I did it. After that I created some shadow clones to look for survivors and found three children, all brothers and sisters, one boy the age of seven and two twin girls the age of four, they just went in the house with Makoto and Sasuke, who also survived along with me and Itachi. Naruto said scratching the back of his neck while he yawned which was rare because he only did that when he was super sleepy. The Hokage nodded his head and looked around. Okay I want all of you to clean this place up. He said, commanding his Anbu, excluding Naruto and Itachi. So with the job done, if anyone asks if it was five rogue root members that committed the act, you two understand. He asked both of them to which they each nodded their heads. I don't know about you Naruto, but I'm taking a shower, I'll see you tomorrow at breakfast. Itachi said walking to his house. 
Now it was only Naruto and Saratobi. You know what Hokage Jiji. I've been in Anbu for the last five years. I'm tired of the endless missions and the timely hours. I think I'm going to retire and become a Jounin like Kakashi Nai San and Gai Sensei. I think Itachi would be perfect to take my place as captain of the team. He deserves it and is ready for it. The blonde said, sweeping his hand through his hair and yawning again. I understand Naruto-kun, I was going to have you retire from the Anbu after this mission anyway, the paperwork is already filled out, as of tomorrow morning you will be Namaka's Uzumaki Ichiha Naruto, elite Jounin of Konoha. You can go enjoy your last night as an Anbu captain. Chapter 9. Time has passed. Three years later, we see our main character Naruto, now at the age of 14 he was walking along a dirt road. He has been relaxing the past three years, not relaxing as in not training, but relaxing as his missions weren't as hard as they used to be in Anbu. He now stood at 5 feet and 3 inches. He was wearing a black muscle shirt under a grey padded Anbu-like vest. Over that he wore his standard Jounin vest, which he changed the color to a very dark grey, nearly black. He wore some fingerless gloves that went past his elbows, and over his right arm, he wore an Anbu-style forearm bracer, and on the back of the gloves was a metal plate that had the Konoha insignia on it. He wore some regular black cargo pants and a grey belt that hung loosely around it. He wore black boots that had little spikes on the bottom, he kept his Anbu katana in the new house he inherited from his father after turning 11 and obtained a new one that he wore on his waist. The scabbard was red, near the bottom was white tape that wrapped around it, the handle was wrapped in design less red tape and the guard was a plain black circle. He wore his headband around his neck and tied the back of his hair in a ponytail, on his right arm was his Anbu tattoo and on his left arm was a seal that resembled a swirl that held his. Around his neck was a necklace that also had the Anbu style tattoo hanging off the end of it. An. Look at my profile picture to get a better look at him. Ever since he became an elite Jounin, the new clan head to the Namaka's clan, and being in the streets, many of the civilians would wave to him and wish him a good morning or a good afternoon. They were never mean to him, maybe because of him losing his family, the Achiha, or because he was now on the council, and that only happened when he agreed to take on a Genin team. And speaking of the Achiha, Makoto continued to raise her kids, and with Naruto not in Anbu and being home whenever he didn't have a mission, he helped most of the time. When she wasn't helping the children with whatever she was training herself to get back into shape, since she wanted to better protect her new family, she didn't go back to being an active ninja, but just trained, as she was the new clan head of the Achiha clan. Sasuke continued to go to the academy, he was now 12, and he was doing surprisingly well considering the fact that his family was nearly wiped off the face of the earth. He always says that at least he has his brothers and his mother that are here and there for him. His graduation from the academy was going to be in a couple of weeks, so he eventually became one of the newest genius of Konoha. He was around the skill of a mid chunin since both Itachi and Naruto trained him whenever they weren't training Daisuke, Mai, or Kai. Remember Daisuke the little boy, he was now 10 years old and was always trying to ask either Naruto or Itachi for training so he could get stronger to better protect himself and his sisters. He was going to the academy and is the top of his class and has been since the term started. He is at a high genin level and will only continue to grow stronger. Mai and Kai recently turned 7 and each made Naruto and Itachi their other brothers. Mai liked Naruto the most while Kai liked Itachi the most. And each of the guys trained their individual sisters when they had the time. They are at mid genin level and can already do one of the three academy graduation ninjutsus, the Kamarimi. Itachi stayed in Anbu until about three weeks ago, he had been on missions, left and right after Naruto gave him the title of captain of the team. He also had to work with strangers, other than Yuigao, Nico, who wanted to stay longer, for some reason. And speaking of Yuigao, they recently went on a date. It was a nice moonlit walk through the park after having dinner at one of the most expensive restaurants in the village. The ironic thing was they could both afford it easily with their Anbu salary. Anko continues to work with Ibiki and the interrogation and torture section of Anbu and Kurinai is looking forward to trying out for the Jounin exams. Remember the picture of that one chick in the bedroom of Anko in Yuzuka Hana well she was introduced to Naruto about half a year ago. She had thought he was cute for his age, which was about 12, and was dumbfounded with the fact that he was a Jounin while she was 17 and wasn't even a Jounin yet. She was now 18 and decided to stay a Chunin since she loved working with animals and being a veterinarian for them. He looked to the sky and thought, and now that he thought about it, she was the only one that was a Chunin, without trying to go up a rank like Kurinai was. I'm going to have a girl of every rank, excluding Jenin. He thought, chuckling to himself. Is anything wrong with Naruto-sensei? Said a voice behind him. He turned to see his Jenin team, they were 14 showing that they were from the last batch of Jenins from last year. They were so surprised to see that their sensei was their exact age. There were two girls and one boy on his team. One of the girls had dark bluish hair and dark blue eyes to match. She was 4 feet 8 inches and she had a slim build. 
She wore a simple dark blue shirt and black pants, with dark blue sandals. She had a ninja pouch on the back of her left hip and her shuriken holder on her left leg, showing that she was left-handed. Her hair was short and barely reached her neck, her breasts were a large B-cup, and she wasn't a fangirl, which was the most important thing to Naruto. Her name was Akana, fish, I, love, and you guessed it right she loved sushi, and after every mission was complete, she would ask to go to the sushi place to celebrate. She was the team's ninjutsu specialist and helped with the strategies. The other girl had silver hair and pupil-less wide eyes, showing she was a high uga, and Naruto still can't understand why her hair is silver. She was 4 feet and 7 inches and also had a slim build. She wore some dark gray pants and a dark gray shirt, she wore black sandals. Her ninja pouch was on the back of her right hip and her shuriken holder was on her right and left legs, showing she was ambidextrous. Unlike her teammate I, her hair was long and reached the middle of her back. Her breasts were a small C cup. Her headband was around her forehead, over her cursed seal, meaning that she was in the branch family, and when Naruto learned that she was going to be on his team, he told the Hyugas that they should not activate her cursed seal under any circumstances or they'll face his wrath, and they listened since he was very powerful and didn't underestimate his strength not one bit. Her name was Hyuga Hinode, Sunrise. And she was grateful for what Naruto did for her. She was the team's Tejutsu and Jinjutsu specialist. The last member of Naruto's team was a boy, he had emerald green eyes and short black hair. He was 5 feet and had a slim and athletic physique, he was getting muscles, but he still had to work on them. He wore a black shirt under his dark green jacket and dark green cargo shorts with black boots. On the front of his boots were slots for his hidden knives and when he added chakra to them the knives would come out and he would kick people and it would hurt. A lot. He had gloves that also had metal plates on the back like Naruto, but it didn't have the Konoha insignia on it. He wore his headband around his right arm, and his name was Chikyu, Earth, Hijeshi, Fierce. Believe it or not, but he was the team's ninjutsu and jinjutsu specialist. They all could do Tai, Gen, Nin, Fuin, Ken, and strategies excellent, but their favorites are what they have listed. Ai's elemental affinity is water and wind, Hinode's elemental affinity is lightning and fire, and Hijeshi's affinity is fire and earth, so they all have all five of the elemental affinities, how convenient for Naruto, because now he could pass down most, if not, all of his knowledge to his students. All of their skill level is around high Chuanin, and they continue to grow in strength. Naruto looked at his silver-haired student, no no Chan, nothing is wrong just thinking about it. What I've gained after gaining you as my students last year. He said, resisting the urge to rub her head. He turned his head when he heard the sound of people talking and looked ahead of him and saw the town where they had to meet their client. Finally about the time we got here, if I had to walk another mile I would have committed. Hijeshi said, throwing his hands in the air as they passed the village gates. The two girls resisted their need to giggle at Hijeshi's antics and Naruto chuckled at his friend's antics but stopped after a second and glared at him. What was that Hijeshi, did I hear you say you want to run a mile? Naruto said, stopping his glare to open his ears and lean towards the boy. The Jeshi started sweating and gulped, no Naruto sensei, I was just saying what a nice day it was, a perfect day to walk in the forest. He said waving his hands in front of his face and shaking his head at the same time. This time the girls giggled and Naruto patted the black haired boy's shoulder. It's okay, I feel the same way, now let's see what our client wants us to do. He said, jumping on the roof of the nearest building. He looked west and led his team to the house of the team's client. Naruto dropped in front of a medium sized house and knocked on the door. After a couple of seconds they all heard the voice of a woman from behind the door, wait a minute I need to. Uh. Put. My. Face on. The lady said, making Naruto and his team sweat drop at the way she said it. The blonde sensei turned to Hinode, check what she's doing, don't worry I won't get angry at you for peeking on somebody. He reassured her, and she nodded and activated her by Akugan. Uh, sensei, she put a couch in front of the door, and now she's dragging her table in front of the door. Hinode said, making her teammate sweat more. Anybody else in the house? I asked, looking at the second floor of the house, wondering if she actually saw somebody in the window just now. Hinode nodded her head, yeah two kids are upstairs, they look round the ages of six and seven. She said as she continued to watch the women stack things in front of the door. The Jeshi grew tired of the woman's actions and knocked on the door again. Don't worry ma'am we're ninjas from Kanoha and we just want to finish our mission quickly. We are not going to hurt you. He said, making Naruto nod his head in acceptance. They waited there for another minute before they heard the sound of moving furniture and a couple more minutes before the long series of unlocking of the locks, making Naruto and his team sweat drop at the amount of clicking they heard. I leaned toward Hinode, you would think she lives in a vault or something. She whispered, making Hinode giggle a little. Oh you have no idea. Hinode thought as the lady cracked the door open a little. B did you say Kanoha ninjas? She asked slowly and stuttered in the beginning. 
The ninjas nodded their heads, and the lady swung the door open fully, well why didn't you say so, come on in. I have much to tell you about. She said her bashfulness gone and her bold and prideful behavior coming to the surface. A team of shinobi faces faulted but got back up a second later, dusting themselves off and entering the house. They each gasped in shock and surprise, even Hinode who had already seen it was still surprised how the house looked from the inside. The house was filled with paintings and even sculptures made of fine basalt, obsidian, and other various materials, and even some metals. It was absolutely beautiful. Naruto stopped looking at the priceless paintings and sculptures and turned to the women. These are beautiful and expertly created. Did you do them yourself? He asked as his students continued looking at the art. She smiled and nodded her head, why, yes I did. She said until she realized something. Oh how rude of me, my name is Hamazaki Ayumi, it's very nice to meet you. She said, extending her hand toward Naruto. She was 5 feet and 7 inches, her hair was a light and faded blonde, much like Sanadi of the Sanin. She was wearing a white kimono with pink flower petals falling down the left of it. She wasn't wearing any sandals, and her hair was done in a short ponytail. Her breasts were a large D-cup, and her waist was small and slim, her figure was that of an Herglis. She was quite an attractive woman, at the age of 32. Namak is Naruto, and I feel the same way. This is my team, the one with the silver hair is Hino-chan, the one with the dark blue hair is Ai-chan, and the boy is Hijeshi-kun. He said as each of his students bowed to the women. She gasped, but you're all so young, are you sure you can handle the mission? Ayumi asked, worried about their safety. Hijeshi grew irritated at the jab at his skills because of his age, but before he could tell Ayumi what he thought of the comment, Naruto covered his mouth, sensing that he was going to say something. Don't worry ma'am we can complete the mission. So, what is it? He said, letting go of Hijeshi's mouth and stopping the girls from giggling as they all got a little serious. It's my husband, he's been taken by a group of ninjas. They want my paintings and sculptures in exchange for my husband. They said that just stealing the art would take the fun out of their whole operation, those bastards. She said the last part softly while looking down at her feet. She lifted her head quickly and looked Naruto right in the eye, you have to get him back. She said frantically missing her husband. Don't worry we'll bring him back, where is it that the shinobi have him and how many are there? He asked, crossing his arms. They come here every Saturday, telling me to hurry up with the decision or my husband will be killed. It's been like this for the past two weeks, luckily tomorrow is Saturday, and if I was to remember correctly there are five of them, from the village of Sand. She said, giving them a small sad smile. Naruto nodded his head in agreement when Hinode stepped up, did they give you a location to take your art to? And do they give you the proof of life for your husband? She asked as the blonde woman nodded. Yes they do give a proof of life, they bring him every time bound and gagged, showing that he is indeed alive. They then hit him a couple of times so I know it's not an illusion, and they said they will be in the forest on the east side of the village. She said sitting on her couch in the living room. Naruto and his team nodded, okay, we'll go handle it immediately. The blonde male said as he turned around and exited the house. His students bowed one more time and followed suit. Naruto went into mission mode, Hino-chan used your Byakugan to scan the forest, I-chan when Hino found their location, I want you to help me plan the attack. Hijeshi kun will cast a Jinjutsu around their area and will quickly dispose of them and take the husband of Ayumi back to her. You three understand? He asked, not even looking at his team as they waited for Hino to spot the enemy, so he didn't see his team nodding their heads. The blue net found their targets and they set out to the northeast. Remember the team, suppress your chakra in case they have a sensor in the group. He said as he felt their chakra levels drop. He smiled in pride at his team's growth. Minutes later they entered the clearing where the Suna shinobi were camping. It seems they were getting irritated by the wife and wanted to just steal what they wanted, instead of doing it the boring way. Quiet yourself Jinta, the fun will begin as soon as the wife gives us what we want and then we can kill both of them. Said the leader of the group. But Siki, I still don't understand why we can't just kill the bastards now and take what we want, we're just giving her enough time to call some Kanoha shinobi to help her. Jinta said to the now revealed leader. When the man didn't respond he looked and saw blood all around him, his comrades had been killed. He yelled and was shaken until real blood came out of the head of the person shaking him. The assault had begun, with three down, Naruto jumped into the clearing and launched a quick series of lightning bolts at the remaining two, shocking and killing them. He then quickly ran to the only tent in the clearing, which he knew belonged to the leader of the group of Chunin Suna Shinobi. He entered and untied the unconscious husband and threw him over his shoulders. Exiting his tent he nodded to his concealed students and they ran back to the village with their package in possession. Three hours later, they made it back to the village after giving Ayumi back her husband and was rewarded with a painting, which was sealed in a scroll and kept by Naruto, who promised to give the painting to the one that would win their next team spar. The team walked into the office of the Hokage and Naruto gave the mission report to the man. 
Excellent, that's another completed mission for your team, Naruto-kun. You trained them well. He said puffing on his pipe. Naruto bowed a little to show his respect, thanks Jiji, just wait these three will soon become the next legendary three. The blonde said with pride as his team blushed at the praise given to them. The room was filled with the laughter of the Hokage, I believe your declaration, because at this rate, in just a half a decade they will be close, not there but close. After all the Densetsu no Sanin, were trained by yours truly. He said, puffing out a ring of smoke. Naruto laughed, as was I, I mean if your AOG trained my father to be Hokage, then I could too. He said, chuckling along with his grandfather. So where's Itachi Nai, is he on a mission or is he on break? He asked the leader of the village after his team left to go home and shower. He is on a mission, you're going to have to find someone else to train with my boy. The old man said, as Naruto nodded and left the room in a swirl of wind and water. In the streets. Now Naruto was walking in the streets with no thought in mind, he wanted to train at the exact moment, but he was hungry, how could I solve this problem? He thought to himself, as he scratched his head. I think you just got your answer kid. The fox said in his head. And just at that second, a kunai flew through the air, slicing in his right cheek. He didn't stop walking as he knew it was Anko looking to have some fun. Ah, Narukun, you do love me. One of his purple-haired goddesses said as she wrapped her arms around his head and leaned into his back, pressing her breast into it as she licked his cheek, which was getting difficult with the walking and the wound healing. Anko pouted at the source of her fetish closing up, so what kind of mission did you have, Narukun? She said getting from behind him and walking on the side of him. It was just some ninjas wanting something, but didn't want to take it by force. The idiots wanted to do some kind of ransom drop-off thing, so me and my team just killed them and gave the woman her husband back. Naruto said as they neared the dango stand they would meet on occasions. Naruto looked around the shop and found Kurinai sitting by herself with a cup of tea in her hand. She looked up and smiled seeing Anko and Naruto. It took you too long enough, I've been waiting here ever since I felt your chakra signature enter the village. The red-eyed goddess said looking at Naruto. Naruto rubbed the back of his head as he sat down. I'm sorry, I had to report my mission to the Hokage with my team, you know how it is. He said, chuckling nervously as Kurinai leveled him with a small cute glare. It won't happen again. Naruto said as Kurinai smiled and put her cup of tea down. So Nai-chan, you're going to get a team of wet behind the ears Genin in two weeks. Anko asked before ordering a large plate of dango and a cup of sake, with Naruto ordering the same, minus the cup of sake, and just ordered some tea. Yeah, I feel like I can do it again, and I hope this team passes, unlike last year's team. Kurinai said, shaking her head as she remembered what happened with her team last year. She looked at Naruto, nearly envious of his team. So Narukun, how is your team? She said. Naruto nearly shivered at her tone. Alright, they are getting stronger and I'm thankful for that. Hinode is absolutely excellent with her Byakugan. Her Jayukin is top-notch, and she's in the process to learn more Tajutsu styles to incorporate her Jayukin into. Her skill in viewing jutsu is rapidly rising, now that her speed and accuracy in drawing the seals has increased, in less than a decade's time, at this pace, she'll be an expert. I, I wouldn't be surprised if her ancestors were Naras, because she is smart and knows just what strategy is for what situation, but unlike the Naras she has the reserves to do way more, because her ninjutsu library far exceeds what a genin is supposed to know, thanks to me. Not to mention that her reserves are higher than most of the boys in her class. And lastly Hijeshi, he's trying to be like you, making up his own Jinjutsus, and it's not just Jinjutsu that he specializes in, he is becoming quite a skilled fighter when it comes to Kinjutsu. Naruto gloated about his students without even knowing he was gloating about his students, but they did hear a sense of pride in Naruto's voice as he spoke, so he must have known what he was doing. Alright alright we get it, your students are skilled, you can stop your bragging now. Anko said with her hands in her face and Kurinai shooting him a big glare, causing Naruto to gulp and apologize by taking her hand and kissing the back of it and apologizing as he did. So Nai-chan, you want to have a quick spar with us after lunch? Anko asked with Naruto nodding his head and giving her the baby fox eyes. And he already knew that she couldn't resist his eyes and smile when she nodded her head. Great job kid, I have trained you well. Kaiubi nodded his head with a sense of pride. The blonde haired thanked his furry demon, and after lunch they each got up and walked to the nearest training ground to begin their training. Chapter 10. Gen and Teams and Dangerous Criminals. Two weeks later, it was now the aftermath of the graduation exam for the senior academy students. Some passed, some failed, some quit before they even tried the first test. It's safe to say the parents weren't happy to hear that from their son or daughter. Iruka was standing in front of his students, feeling proud of himself for preparing them for their future as shinobi of Kanahagakur. But beneath his proud feelings was annoyance at the behavior of his students, they were being so noisy it was grating on his nerves. He looked around the classroom and spotted only four students that would survive in the ninja world. 
Let's see only, Nara Shikamaru, Aburam Shino, Hai Uga Hinata and Ichiha Sasuke have a shot of surviving in this world. And maybe Inuzuka Kiba if he listens to the right head and also maybe Akamichi Choji if he focuses on his training instead of hanging around with Shikamaru and watching clouds with him. Hiruka was thinking and couldn't think further because the noise just went off, setting him off. Would you all shut up and stay still? He yelled using his classic big-headed technique and it effectively shut his students up. He let out a long sigh, sorry, I promised myself I wouldn't do that since it's your last day here. He said, apologizing to his students, now I'm going to announce the teams, team 1. He started listing off the names of the teams, you could hear the shouts of disappointment from all of the fangirls since, as they weren't paired with their Sasuke-kun he only blushed at his fangirls and apologized to them all, causing them to sign in fangirly love with hearts all over the place. Team 7, Haruno Sakura, Ichiha Sasuke and Hinyaku Shiro, your sensei will be Hada Kakashi. Teammate Hai Uga Hinata, Inuzuka Kiba, and Aburam Shino, your sensei will be Uhi Kuranai. Team 9 are already ninjas, and Team 10 Nara Shikamaru, Yamanaka Ino, Akamichi Choji, your sensei will be Siratobi Asuma. Well there you go class, it's been great knowing each and every one of you, and I hope you all become great ninjas. Hiruka said smiling at his class before walking to his desk, getting his papers and leaving the class with a body flicker. Sakura looked at Shiro, hey Shiro-kun, do you want to go on a celebratory date with me? She asked the hot dead last of the class, who shook his head, blowing her offer in the wind. Tears nearly fell from her eyes at the rejection of her offer, well I didn't want to go anyway. She screamed at him and threw a book at the boy, who barely dodged it from his seat. The pink-haired girl huffed and glanced at Sasuke and was about to ask him when he asked her to go by herself. Which she sadly nodded to and began to stand up. And Yakushiro was an orphan from the Kaiubi attack 12 years ago. He learned that the container of the beast was Naruto and vowed to kill him and the Kaiubi in the process. Ever since the day he learned of this, he has been training himself to the bone to complete his own personal vendetta. Shiro has white hair and light blue eyes, he's wearing only a white and like vest and white cargo pants with white boots. He wore a plain white ninja too on his back and white gloves to match his new white headband on his forehead. He was 4 feet and 3 inches and had a lean and muscled body, showing that he trains a lot in jutsu. You know you're not supposed to leave the room without our sensei, right? Shiro said after seeing Sakura stand up, stopping her before she fully stood up. She blushed lightly and sat back in her seat in embarrassment. It wasn't long before she got angry again. But her temper had to wait as the door opened showing Siratobi Asuma walk in, Team 10, follow me. He simply said and walked back out the door with his team following behind him. Minutes ticked by and other senseis came and picked up their students, including Kurenai. Now it was only Team 7 that was left in the classroom and they were going to have to wait an hour or two for their sensei. But Naruto, Naruto was in the opposite building of the academy watching the students getting picked up by their senses. He had just finished talking with Kurenai, she was a little nervous about taking another team, and Naruto just took away her fear by telling her that it'll be alright. And just like that her fear was gone. When she left, Kakashi appeared behind him, yo, Naruto-kun, how's life been treating you? He asked, sitting down next to his brother in arms. Naruto glanced at the silver-haired man, it's been alright, Kaka-senpai, I've been taking it easy ever since I got my team, not as much as you. He said, chuckling at the small frown on Kakashi's face. Well I'll have you know that I've been training ever since I retired from Anbu, you just never saw me. He said, crossing his arms and looking at his new team of genin. So why are you watching these genin and not with your own? He asked, still looking at his genin. Naruto shrugged his shoulders until he remembered just why he was here. Oh, Sasuke has given me some information about one of his classmates. It seems this boy wants to kill Kaiubi for killing his parents. He said looking at Kakashi. But in order to kill the fox he'll have to kill you in the process. The silver-haired Jounin said, glancing at his team. Am I to agree that he has nothing against you personally, it's just the fox he wants? Kakashi said, still looking at Shiro, knowing just by how large his chakra reserves were that he was the one that wanted the Kaiubi dead. The blue Aidichiha nodded his head and stood from his seat. It matters not to me, just as long as he doesn't go AWOL I won't have to kill him. Hopefully you could get the idea out of his head altogether. Naruto said walking to the edge of the roof and looked back at Kakashi. Senpai, shouldn't you be picking up your team right now? He asked. The scarecrow shook his head and pulled out his book. I'll get to that eventually. He said and turned a page and giggled a little. The blonde chuckled and shook his head muttering, same all senpai. After that he stepped off the edge and fell, but halfway through the fall a tornado swirled around him and disappeared. Kakashi looked to the side where Naruto jumped off, show off. He muttered, turned to another page and giggled. But Naruto, now the blonde was walking through the village thinking to himself, let's see, what to do, what to do. I never should have given the team off to train on their own. He berated himself. 
well you could train yourself. The fox said, making Naruto agree and change his direction towards a training ground. Naruto was now walking through the forest with his hands in his pockets, he was in no hurry and was just enjoying the walk before he had to work. During the work he noticed somebody leaning against a tree, the shadows blocking the face, he looked closer and noticed that it was Yuigao. Hey Yu-chan. Naruto said waving to the silhouetted figure, who waved back. Finally you got here, I've been waiting for the last five minutes for you to show up. She said pushing off the tree and walking into the sunlight showing her face and her ruby red lipstick. She was out of uniform and only carried her sword, which was hanging off of her back. She was wearing a plain black v-neck shirt, which showed some of her cleavage, and black cargo pants that were taped at the ankles, with regular black shinobi sandals. The blonde Jounin looked at her puzzled, huh, did we schedule a training session that I don't remember or something? He asked, scratching his head in confusion. Well it doesn't matter if I planned this or not, well I'm ready when you are. He said shifting his weight on his back leg just in case she decided to attack right away. And it was a good thing he did, because as soon as he finished his sentence, he had to jump back as the purple-haired woman's blade occupied his space a second later. She rushed him before he could take out his own blade and started swinging the sword at him. It wasn't wild like some inexperienced swordsmen or swordswomen would do, it was expertly, and all of it was done for a reason, and that reason was to kill, except Naruto wouldn't stay in one place long enough to get hit. Naruto continued to jump from one place to the next, swiftly dodging his partner's strikes, I knew I should have taken my sword out of its sheath before I started this little spar. He thought. He knew that it was a kinjutsu-only spar, so he quickly ducked under a swing and swiftly and easily took out a kunai from his pouch and blocked the next strike with it. They entered a quick deadlock, giving Naruto enough time to reach to his left with his left hand and grab his sword. Yuigao ended the deadlock by attempting to kick Naruto in the stomach, but he anticipated the move and moved his waist to the side and spun around the woman and positioned his blade at her neck. Yield, this match is over. He said in a monotonous tone. This made Yuigao chuckle. Sure I would yield, as soon as you do. She said making a movement with her eyes making him look down, he now could see her own blade at his crotch. When Yuigao saw his eyes widen in surprise she smirked an evil smirk and started moving it closer and closer, making him sweat more and more. He admitted defeat and took his sword from her neck, but she kept her sword near his crotch until he backed away from it. Oh okay that was a good spar, let's do this again some other time. The blonde said, rubbing the back of his head after seeing her giggle at winning the spar. He grew a little annoyed at the constant giggling, fine, we'll have another go right here, and this time I'll win. He said getting into a kinjutsu stance, with Yugao doing the same. After seeing a leaf fall off a tree and hit the floor they ran at each other and began a new spar. Of Team 7, Sasuke was running through the trees because Sakura stepped on a twig trying to follow him, he stopped and looked into the clearing. Shiro was fighting Kakashi by himself, he sneered for some reason when he saw Sakura throw some shuriken at the silver-haired Jounin. He took a quick glance at his pouch and threw some smoke pellets into the clearing when Shiro and Sakura jumped back. But these weren't ordinary smoke pellets, when the smoke is exposed to oxygen it explodes. So the resulting explosion caught Kakashi and his teammates by surprise. The one-eyed Jounin flew back and his body hit a tree, while the three students jumped back into the clearing. What the hell was that, you trying to kill sensei? Sakura scolded Sasuke, who looked at the body of their sensei in mild thought. I don't think that was enough to kill the legendary Kakashi. Don't worry Sakura. I don't think that was enough to kill the man. He said after a while. Not to mention, he did tell us to come at him with deadly force, and Sasuke was only following orders. Shiro said, also looking at Kakashi's smoking body in thought. The two boys stayed back as Sakura went to check on the body, when she came within five feet of the body, she could smell the scent of burnt flesh and another burnt scent. She picked up a nearby stick and poked the body, Sensei, are you alive? She asked as she continued to poke the body. The boys were behind her when she asked that question, and they slapped their hands to their foreheads, I can't believe she just asked that. They both thought in unison. And before either of them could tell her how stupid she was, the bell on the middle post rang loudly, and the burnt body disappeared in a cloud of smoke and showed a burnt piece of wood. They heard clapping behind them, and their eyes widened as they saw their sensei walk out of the woods clapping his hands together, the right side of his body was smoking, and they could see some burned spots on his vest and his pants. Very good you three, the teamwork was a little unguided, but with some hardcore training, I believe I can fix that. He said, eyes smiling at their faces. Before anyone could get mad at Kakashi, Shiro spoke up, so does that mean we're genin now? He asked as Kakashi nodded. The new Team 7 cheered, even Sasuke, but that was stopped as Kakashi started talking again. But like I said, I'm going to put you through the training of a lifetime, so meet here tomorrow at 7 o'clock in the morning to begin the first team training session. He said, eyes smiling, before body flickering out of the clearing to go get his burns checked out. 
after that team 7 split up to get ready for the next day after getting something to eat because they were starving. But the Hokage. Saratobi was sitting in his seat, smoking his pipe while looking at some important documents lying on his desk. He puffed on his pipe again and spoke up, Ajurea kun, I haven't heard from you in a long time. To what do I owe this visit? He asked, looking to his left and seeing Jureya entering the room through the window. Damn it, even after all this time, I still can't sneak up on you sensei. I guess I still have a lot of training to go through. He said after a sigh as he jumped from the perch and fully entered the room. The old man dumped the ashes from his pipe and put in some new tobacco. You're right Jureya kun you need to train more, there is no such thing as too much training, I learned that from Naruto kun. He said lighting the pipe with a small E-rank fire, used specifically for this use. Jureya grew serious at the mention of the blonde, that is why I've visited Sensei, my spies all over the elemental nations, have given me some dark news. Remember the group that Arachimaru joined all those years ago, well it seems that more S-class nuke nins have joined it. The size of the group is still unknown, but I believe with all the strong missing nins out there, it could equal to about 8 or 10. He spoke with a serious tone and a hint of dread and anticipation, because he can't wait to fight one of these ninjas. Dust which nuke nins are in the group and what is their reason in forming such a large group of dangerous criminals? The Hokage asked, sensing an upcoming headache. They only told me three members and that's all the information they could get, obviously Orochimaru is in the group and that alone is terrifying for us. Another is soon as Akasuna no Sasori, Sasori of the Red Sand, and we all know how dangerous his poison and puppets are, and the last known member is Kiri's own Kiri no Kabutsu, Monster in the Mist, Hashigaki Kisum, legend says that he has the chakra reserves and strength to match a legendary Biju. And they're targeting the Jinchurikas around the elemental nations, their reasons are unknown, and I don't think they ever will be. He said dropping the bomb on the old man, whose face showed a small hint of fear at the smallest of dangerous shinobi in the group. The old man looked down at his desk, his hat shadowing his face, and do you know the worst part? The old man asked in a monotonous voice, creeping the toad Sanin out a little. The white-haired Sanin resisted the urge to answer the man's rhetorical question. The worst part is we don't know who else is in the group and why they chose that specific group of people to target. Saratobi yelled with killer intent pouring out of every pore in his body, so much of it was there that most of the village felt it. It wasn't enough to bring the Jounins to their knees, it's only because it was so sudden and full of anger that some of the weaker ninjas and civilians missed their next steps and nearly fell. The old man calmed down and stood from his seat and looked out the window, watching as the villagers looked towards his office in slight fear and confusion before they started going on with their daily lives. My spies have also said that numbers 6 and 7 have gone missing from their villages, we can only believe that they have been taken by this group. Jureya said. The Hokage sat back in his seat and emptied his pipe and put more new tobacco, but didn't light it. He looked at his student, do you know what this group is called? He asked, seeing Jureya nod his head, then tell me the name. He said with a hint of exhaustion in his voice. The name is Akatsuki, and they have been seen wearing black cloaks covered with red clouds. Jureya said, just as the door opened and Naruto entered the office. Giji, what's the problem, I never felt your kai cover the village before. He asked hoping his grandfather figure was alright. Saratobi let a small smile show on his face, well you know my student Jureya here, he said nodding towards Jureya, who was in shock at how much Naruto looks like his father, he had only seen his picture in the bingo book, and he was only a kid then. Well he just basically told me, a bunch of S-class nuke nins are after you and your Jinchuriki brothers and sisters. He said frowning after giving the information. Naruto thought for a little bit before smirking at the adults in the room, I say bring them on, I've been looking for someone strong to fully test my skills on he said shocking the older ninjas. What are you talking about brat, these shinobi are dangerous criminals that might have ways of disabling your demon inside of you. Jureya said, well, it's a good thing that I don't use it a lot, of course I know how to use my demon, I just never met anybody that needs to be overkilled. He said casually scratching the back of his ear. Jureya's mouth was gaped open in shock until he closed it, chuckled and looked back at the Hokage, you know what, sensei, I'm starting to like this brat. He said rubbing Naruto's head, who squirmed under the man's hand. Saratobi only chuckled, that's Naruto kun for you, he never backs down from a fight with someone that wants to fight him. Now that I think about it, weren't you sparring with somebody a few minutes ago? He asked Naruto who thought for a while until his face went pale with fear. Oh shit, I'm so dead. He said, panicking. What happened? Jureya said in confusion, only Saratobi was showing a small smirk. I left Yuigao handcuffed to a tree. He said about his body flickering out of the office when Jureya started giggling. Handcuffed you say. He said and took out a little booklet and started scribbling in it. This made Naruto groan, I forgot, my father did mention being trained by a pervert. He said body was flickering out of the office. Chapter 11. 
mission time. Two hours later, Naruto sat in a dango shop with Kurinai, Anko, Hana, and Yuigao. The other three women sat together giggling. Come on Yuu-chan, I said I was sorry, come on forgive me. Naruto pleaded to the purple-haired Anbu lieutenant. The lieutenant sat there unaffected by the Jounin's pleading until he got up and started rubbing her shoulders, feeling her knots, and causing the woman to moan a little under the massage. You know I read something in one of my medical books, while well, giving someone a massage, by using chakra, the knots unloosen faster, and the pleasure skyrockets off the charts. Naruto explained, but the explanation wasn't heard by Yuigao, only the other three women. After a couple of minutes of massaging Naruto started talking, so am I off the hook. He asked, watching her nod her head, causing Naruto to smirk. See, I told you massaging her would get you off the hook. Kaiubi said from Naruto's head. The blonde scoffed silently and stopped the massaging when he felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned to see the waitress, who was blushing a little. Sorry to disturb you Namika's sama, but I came to give you your bill. She said handing him the bill and causing him to stop massaging. He took the bill and looked it over, after a while he shrugged not caring that he had to pay for their lunch. He was just glad that he didn't have to take them all shopping anymore which the other girls weren't happy about. He was about to speak when he heard a voice, Naruto sensei. Naruto turned around to see his blue-haired student, I. Hey I, what are you doing here, I thought you loved fish more than dango. He asked, seeing her nod her head. Yay, I do like fish more, but I wanted to try dango and decided to come here and I saw you here, so I might as well join you. So are you going to introduce me or what? She said, walking up to his table looking at each of the women. Naruto's eyes frantically over the ladies, okay, worst thing that could happen, Anko corrupts her, the others aren't as bad as she is. He thought calming down, okay, the one with the brown hair, is Hana-chan, she's a Chuanin veterinarian, the raven-haired beauty is Kurinai-chan, she's a Jounin sensei and teaches team. He said trailing off as he began to think to the other day. Teammate, I teach teammate Naruto-kun. Kurinai said, giving Naruto a mini glare, knowing that he already knew which team she taught. Naruto smiled at the glare, yeah, teammate, you know the rookies. He said not paying attention to her increase in Kai. Now the purple-haired beauty, whose shoulders I'm massaging, is Yuga-chan. A special Kinoichi. He said hoping she didn't figure out that she was an Anbu, and knowing I, she will. Moving on, the other purple-haired beauty is Anko-chan, she's a special Jounin, and works in the interrogation and torture division. There you met my friends now I'm telling you as soon as you try Dango you'll never want to leave it. He said, causing Anko to smile knowing it was true. Naruto looked around for a chair and grabbed one before someone could sit in it, causing the guy to fall. Hey, that was my chair. The man said quickly getting up. The blonde watched I sit down before looking at the man. What you weren't sitting in, and plus don't you think you should cut back on the dango, you're a little fat. Naruto said to the overly fat man in front of him, causing the girls to snicker, except for Yuigao, who was a little upset that Naruto stopped massaging her shoulders. The man went red in anger and embarrassment and stormed out of the shop. The blonde turned back to the table. Now I, try this dango. He said getting back to massaging Yu chans shoulders and nodding to one of the dango that Anko didn't even eat since she was full of dango and sake. The blue-haired Jenin picked up a dango stick and ate one of the three dumplings and nearly squealed at the taste. She stopped herself and looked at the anticipated faces of the women in Naruto. It's a little sweet, but I think I'll stick with fish since it's in my name. She said calmly, taking another bite of the sweet dumpling, inwardly giggling at the face faults that went off around her. Naruto stood up, his face a little pale, I can't believe I'm teaching someone that doesn't speak out rightly like Dango, it's unheard of. He said mumbling to himself. For that I'm raising your training, in one hour I want you in our training field. I can't believe I gave you that painting. He mumbled again, causing I to turn pale thinking about her training regime going up. Wait, sensei you can't be serious, I was just playing, this Dango tastes delicious. I just wanted to see your reaction, if I said I didn't like it. She said frantically. Naruto shook his head, I know I chan, now that I think about it, I need to up all of your training, you can never be too prepared. He said as an Anbu appeared behind the group. Namaka Senpai, Hokage Sama needs you and your team for a moment. Shark, the Anbu, said before his body flickered out of the shop, his mission was complete. The blonde stopped messaging Yuga's shoulders, promising to put more time into the next session, and nodded to his student, who nodded back and got up to go get her teammates. Naruto kissed the forehead of each of the girls and vanished in a small tornado. After he left, Hana gave Yu Gao a small glare. What was that Yu Chan? I thought you said you were going to make him take us shopping for the rest of the day. She said pouting at her missed shopping opportunity. Yeah I was really hoping to get some new equipment and some new mesh bodysuits. The pupil-less brown-eyed Takibetsu Jounin said, pouting at not having the chance to get any free stuff. I too was hoping to get some more equipment, not to mention I need some more food in my apartment. 
The red-eyed beauty said giving Yu Gao a small glare, not really caring about not shopping for equipment, but really wanted some groceries. The violet-haired Anbu member backed up a little in shock at what just happened, she had been so engrossed in the massage that she wasn't paying attention to anything. She looked at each of them, seeing their many glares. Well would you look at the time, it's time for me to go. She said quickly vanishing from her seat. Banko's face was frozen in shock. Wait, who's going to buy me stuff now? She asked herself to get up from the now empty table, their food already paid for, and left the shop, not knowing what to do for the rest of the day. But Naruto, Naruto appeared in the office of the Hokage. Hey Gigi, what do you need now? I was just here a couple of hours ago. He said noticing the Fire Lord's wife was in the room, his face went pale at the sight of her. The students entered the room and when they saw the lady their faces went pale also. Calm down, Naruto-kun, I just want you to escort her back to the capital, her work here is done. He said, chuckling a little. The blonde and his team calmed down, thankful that they don't have to search for that stupid cat anymore. Good, because if I had to look for that cat again, I was going to go AWOL. He said running his hand through his hair. The lady chuckled, well you don't have to worry about catching little Tora here, she's safe in her box. She said looking in the box, but when she didn't see her cat she started to panic. Oh no, Tora, here girl, where are you going? She said, looking around the room for her cat, not seeing it anywhere. Well, new mission Naruto-kun goes on and finds that cat. Saratobi said. Oh hell no. They could find it. Naruto said pointing to the entering Team 7 before he body flickered out of the office taking his students with him. Team 7 just stood there not understanding what just happened, well, since Naruto-kun left it's up to Team 7 to find your cat Madam Shijimi. He said smirking when the genins of Team 7 showed enthusiasm at getting their first mission, Kakashi just shrugged his shoulders, but on the inside he promised to get Naruto back for this, he did not want to have them do this mission yet. But Naruto, Naruto and his team appeared in the building where you get missions without the Hokage there. He walked up to the B-ranked mission scrolls and picked a random one and read through it. After a while he nodded to the Chuan in there and walked back to his team, pocketing his scroll on the way. So what mission do we have? The silver-haired Hayuga said walking behind her sensei. It's just another escort mission, it said the person we were going to be escorting is a merchant on his way to Iowa, so we're going to go to Earth Country's border and give the guy to another genin team, this time from Iowa. So the easy mission all we need to do is pack for a three-day trip and meet the merchant at the given time and date, which happens to be in two hours, so go home and meet me at the north gate in two hours. Naruto explained, knowing they already knew how escort missions go when escorting somebody to a hostile country since they did a couple in the past year. Naruto sighed after seeing his team leave. He looked at the sky and shrugged his shoulders, I might as well find this guy. He thought about taking out the scroll to look at his picture. It showed a man in his early 30s, he had short and spiky gray hair, not old guy gray hair, just regular gray hair, and a little cutting scar under his left eye. The blonde pocketed the scroll and started walking to the north gate. He nodded to the people who nodded at him and waved at the people who waved. He saw Asuma and his students in front of him and decided to say hi. Hey, Asuma Nyasen. Naruto said. The smoker's eye twitched as he looked over to Naruto. What did I say about calling me Nyasen? Asuma said, puffing some smoke above Naruto's head. Naruto gave him a big grin, you said to never call you Nyasen. Which is why I'm going to keep doing it. He said, smirking a little. So this is your team? Naruto said, glancing at the genins. The chain smoker nodded, yep the girl is Yamanaka Ino, the lazy boy here is Nara Shikamaru and... This. Is Akamichi Choji. He said not wanting to say what was in his head. The genins waved to him, with Ino winking, noticing how handsome he looked in his current attire, into everything sunk in. Wait a minute you're a Jounin, but you're around our age, did you even go to the academy? The blonde-haired girl nearly screamed, noticing his Jounin flak jacket. Wait a minute, what's that? She said looking at the tattoo on his shoulder. Naruto didn't have time to say what it was before the girl grabbed his arm and started inspecting his tattoo. She traced the tattoo's design and scratched her head in confusion with her free hand. Naruto substituted himself with Shikamaru and started scratching his neck. That's my Anbu tattoo, you remember Asuma I was in the corporation a couple years before you went to be the daimyo's bodyguard. Naruto said, pointing to the man's sash. The genin were surprised, even Shikamaru who thought everything was a drag. I have no idea how someone your age could become an Anbu, what a drag. The pineapple-headed boy said, sighing, with the others nodding their heads. The male blonde scratched the back of his head, I'm just awesome like that. Naruto said doing a big foxy grin that showed his large canines. Sometimes Asuma would oversee my training and he just loved going overboard whenever I called him. He said, patting the man on his back. And now all that training paid off, now I can whoop his ass if he even thinks about doing that stuff again. The blonde said, grinning, activating his fully matured Sharingan for a brief second. 
Asuma chuckled, I'm thinking about it right now. He said inhaling some smoke, but before he could blow it out in Naruto's face, Tora our lovable feline, came out of nowhere and jumped on his head and jumped off, causing him to accidentally swallow the smoke and start coughing. Team 7 ran after the cat, each one shooting Naruto a glare, knowing that it was his fault they had to chase the stupid cat. Naruto only grinned at them. Kakashi casually walked by looking at the coughing Asuma, he swallowed some smoke. The white-haired Jounin said. Yep, I told him to stop inhaling so much of it, but you know Asuma Niasen. So having fun with that cat. Naruto said, smirking. Oh yeah, watching these kids run after this cat has been the most fun I have ever had. Kakashi said sarcastically. They've been at this since they found it just outside of the building licking itself. The scarecrow said, turning a page in his porn. Naruto chuckled and looked at the sky. Well, I believe it's time for me to join my team. I'll see you later, Kakaniasen. See you later, Asuma Niasen, it was nice to meet you three. The blonde Jounin said, vanishing in a burst of electricity. Some static remained in his spot for a couple of seconds before vanishing. Asuma stopped coughing. That kid is such a show-off. The smoker said taking out another cigarette, while his students smacked themselves in the forehead at seeing him take out another cigarette. What, you act like it was the cigarette's fault I started coughing, you saw that damn cat jump on my head. He said lighting the cigarette. Well I'll be going. Kakashi said poofing away. But Naruto, Nado appeared on top of the gate with the wind blowing through his hair. He looked at a nearby tree and smiled, then an Anbu appeared beside him. Naruto come, long time no see. The Anbu said, sliding his mask to the top of his head. It has been a long time, Itachi Niasen, I thought you were off duty. Why are you in uniform? The blonde said, looking at Itachi's attire. I am off duty, but I don't feel like being off duty, so I assigned myself gate duty. He said looking down at the sleeping Chunin. Naruto looked down as well. Well it's a good thing you decided to do this, or we might have been invaded, with these clowns watching the gate. Nado said laughing, noticing a merchant fitting his described picture walking towards the gate with a wagon full of various items. Well there goes my client, my team should be here in a couple minutes, I did teach them to be earlier than the given time. He said remembering how Kakashi is with everything that doesn't need his immediate attention. After a couple of minutes of talking with Itachi about his mother and the kids at home, I, Hinode, and Hijeshi showed up and met with the client. Hey do you know where Sensei is at, he should be here by now. The emerald-eyed boy asked, scratching his earlobe. Hinode pointed up at the top of the gate where Naruto was still conversing with Itachi. Even though he's naturally suppressing his chakra, he isn't doing anything else to hide his presence. She said waving at her sensei, who waved back. Well, can you bring him down, I would like to meet the man that's leading this mission. The grey-haired man said, fixing the shoulder straps of his backpack. I nodded, hey sensei the man wants to meet you. She yelled, noticing Naruto nodding his head, and Itachi left with a normal body flicker. Naruto dropped off the gate and landed softly on the ground. Hello I'm Namikaze Uzumaki Ichiha Naruto, I'm going to be leading this mission. I know I'm young, but trust me I'm stronger than I look. He said looking at I when she said much stronger. The blonde's words stopped the man from complaining about his age, and for some reason he could feel the power the blonde had, he didn't know how he could. Good, my name is Raisin Jin, the best merchant in the world. He said going into a pose while laughing, making the shinobi around him sweat drop. Okay, well let's get this thing going. Naruto said as the man nodded and they began walking out of the village with Jin pulling his wagon. Two days later, the group were now just a couple of miles away from the border, where they will deliver the merchant to a team from Isla. There were only two attacks in the past two days, retarded bandits trying to steal things that didn't belong to them, well they won't be trying to steal anything anymore. You know because they're dead. We only have a couple of miles left, Hinode our perimeter. He said as she activated her by Akigen, seeing everything was clear she nodded to him. You alright with that Jinjutsu around us? The blonde said, glancing at the concentrating teen. Well he's busy, I how about your patrolling tigers? He said looking at the blunette. She looked at him. Let me check. She says before giving a short and loud whistle, nearly breaking Hijeshi out of his concentration. Two tigers jumped out of his surrounding foliage, yes, I sama. One of the tigers said. These tigers were similar to every other tiger, except they were different colors, the speaking tiger was red, and the other was orange. How's the perimeter doing, Akatora? She said petting the tiger. Everything's in order. I believe our work here is done. The tiger nodded to the other tiger, and they disappeared when I herself dismissed them. Ever since she gained those tigers she had been more grateful, of course her mother was proud that she acquired a summon contract. Her mother was a little jealous that she found one when she couldn't, maybe because she never tried to look for one. Naruto nodded as they approached the border gates, where they could see a team from Iwa there waiting for them. Naruto looked closer, he noticed the genin were showing fear at seeing him, including the jounin, but the jounin looked ready to fight. 
As he got closer he could see that it was Michio Jayakiseki, Boulder, his name alone signifying his origin. He was a tall muscled man with brown hair wearing his village's personal red flak jacket proudly. As they walked up to the group a light bulb flashed in Naruto's mind, oh no wonder you look so familiar, you look just like your brother. Naruto tried so hard to hide his smirk, but it was hard with Kyuubi's laughter in his mind. One of the many veins in the man's forehead grew as his anger grew to epic levels. Kai was filling the air, and the man's chakra was visible as he grew more angrier and angrier while looking at the team that killed his big brother. You bastard. How dare you even mention my brother. He said through gritted teeth. Now now, y'all shouldn't fight, after all you still have missions to complete. Jin said he would become the peacemaker in the area. Dio's genin were becoming more and more terrified of their sensei's Kai, while Naruto's genin were relaxing behind the protective Kai of Naruto. Jin is right. I wouldn't want to have to walk all the way to Iwa to complete the mission because you went and got yourself killed. Naruto said activating his Sharingan for an added measure. And looking at their pale faces made him smirk even more. Jin walked across the border and began walking toward Iwa, hoping that Jai Akiseki would follow him, since his genin were already by his side, not wasting any time and leaving. After a while Jio stopped releasing Kai, and body flickered away in a spiral of rocks. Naruto smirked at the exit, well time to go home. He turned around and started walking back to Konoha. Sensei is it true you killed the man's brother? I asked while her stomach started gurgling, making her blush in embarrassment. Naruto nodded, yeah the man tried to cash in on my bounty while I was on a mission and before I took he was my student. He was pretty cocky in his skill and dust manipulation, he was nowhere near the level of his father, the Tsuchikage. Oh and the Tsuchikage was pissed that I killed my eldest son and the man's niece was even more pissed. I just loved pissing people off. He sensed Chakra not too far away, and from the looks of it, so did his team. The Chakra wasn't hostile yet, but it felt dead for some reason, not to mention one of them had very large reserves. Okay, I could tell that they don't know our exact location, or they do and they're just messing with us. So I want each of you to run to Kanoha as fast as you can, take soldiers and food pills on the way, I don't want you to stop until you get there, understand. Naruto commanded, showing his serious eyed for a second, as they nodded and did as they were told. Naruto continued walking until he entered a clearing, he stood in the middle looking around glad at the large size of it. You ready kid, I can already tell you this isn't Sasori or Kissam, so don't you dare die by these fools. Kaiubi roared in his mind. Naruto nodded before he heard voices, I told you the asshole would stay and fight us, Kakuzu, you owe me 20,000 yen. A rather rude man said as two figures entered the clearing, wearing matching black cloaks with red clouds. Naruto looked over the figures, knowing that they were dangerous, he noticed the pendant the shorter figure was wearing around his neck and became shocked. He remembers reading his mother's journal, long ago she fought somebody that wore the exact same pendant and it took forever even for her to kill him, not even chopping the guy's head off didn't kill him. She had to set the man on fire before she walked away victorious. Naruto racked his brain for what those kinds of people are. You, the loud one, you're a jashinist aren't you? He said, backing up a little and getting into a ready stance with his hand on his sword. Laughter came out of the man's mouth. I love this kid. He knows what I am. It's too bad I'm going to have to sacrifice you to Jashin-sama. He said, grabbing the giant scythe off his back. It's only right for you to know the name of the one that kills you, my name is Haiden, I already know you, Namak is Uzumaki Ichiha Naruto, container of the Kaiubi no Yoko, and Shai no Cage of Konoha. It was pretty stupid of your Hokage to put you in the bingo book with so much information about yourself. Haydn said laughing. Naruto smacked his forehead. I knew that was a stupid decision, if I ever get out of this alive, I'm going to slap Jiji upside his head. He mumbled before growling at the two Akatsuki members. Well you should know that, that information is old, and I'm much stronger than I was five years ago, so prepare to be surprised, members of Akatsuki. He said taking out his sword and vanished from his spot and tried to stab the jashinist in his head, but his strike was blocked by one of the blades in the man's triple-bladed side. Akuzu backed out of the fighting area, take this fight seriously Haydn, I wouldn't want you to be killed by this kid. He said. Haydn swung his scythe wildly keeping Naruto at a distance, me, die, ha. I laugh at the idea of my death. It's so funny I think I laugh again, ha ha. He said laughing his ass off. Naruto grew a little angry that they weren't taking him seriously, he jumped back, making Haydn stop his swinging. You must calm down, Naruto. From what I know about people that worship Jashin, they are considered immortal, thanks to the gifts their crazed god gives them. And they mercilessly kill people in the name of their god, who continues to grant them immortality, as long as they keep killing. They truly are dangerous people, especially if they get a taste of your blood, so don't get hit at all. The Kaiubi roared loudly. Naruto looked at Haydn. That must be why the Akatsuki recruited him in the first place, because he's immortal. Well they certainly know how to pick him. He said thinking out loud. 
But what about that one, he's still a mystery and that's the problem, how do I fight him? He said looking at Kakuzu, wondering just who he was. This is getting boring, entertain me or I'll kill you faster. Haydn said, spinning his side using the attached cord. Naruto smirked, oh, I'll entertain you alright, right into the grave. He said activating his Sharingan. Did that even make sense? Kaiubi said in his mind, shut up, it doesn't have to. Naruto thought. Takra exploded from Naruto's body as he concentrated on it, making sure he didn't waste any, after a short period of time fog began to surround the clearing. Blocking the vision of the members of Akatsuki. During this time Naruto quickly did some hand seals and stomped his foot, Doton. Hijeshi Kuretsu, fierce fisher, he said quietly as a very large crack broke away in front of him, going towards Haydn, who couldn't see anything. Naruto heard a yell and stopped the technique and willed the fog to disappear to see what happened. He was shocked at what he saw, Haydn was being carried by what looked like black ramen noodles. But he knew they weren't they were tendrils of course. Pretty impressive technique and combination you use there, if you hadn't felt the extra pulse of chakra while being surrounded by all of this chakra condensed fog, Haydn here would be buried in a grave, like you said earlier. Kakuzu said letting Haydn down, who had yelled upon being grabbed by the man's tendrils and hadn't stopped since. Naruto grew a little worried, the Sandane did tell me a story about the Shadai fighting somebody that resembles your appearance, it's weird seeing you alive and well. Naruto said resting his blade on his shoulder. You should be dead, man you're old. Naruto said hoping to get some emotion out of the man, checking what he could use against him, but the man just nodded his head. You are correct that it was me that fraud against your Shadai, and I would have killed him too, if it hadn't been for his meddling Anbu and his Mokuten ability. And plus don't you just love Kinjutsus, especially the one I took for my village, the Jongu, that's what it's called in case you're wondering. Bakuzu said keeping his pupil-less green eyes on Naruto, while blocking out Haydn's continuous cursing. After a while Kakuzu started talking again, you're probably wondering why I'm telling you all of this. Well the simple answer is, you're coming with us dead or alive, no matter what, so it really doesn't matter what you know. The man said, punching at Naruto, extending his arm, which was connected to tendrils that were connected to his body. Naruto jumped to the left and threw some kunai at the man and watched as they bounced off, useless against the man's hardened skin. H.N. Naruto murmured as static started dancing around his hands and feet. If regular means you can't pierce your skin, let's see my Shinjiki Takina Kabushi, shocking fist. Naruto said rocketing forward, zigzagging before appeared behind the Akatsuki member and punched him in the back. He heard something break before Kakuzu's body flew across the clearing. The blonde didn't have any time to celebrate his attack because a scythe flew towards his head. He jerked his head back, watching the scythe pass by in front of him, his reflection in the blade of the scythe. He jumped back and disappeared when Kakuzu's fist impacted the floor, where he was not even a second ago. Naruto appeared on the other side of the clearing and noticed some fragments of something falling out of Kakuzu's cloak. Also he could clearly see the man's pissed face from this distance. I can't believe you just killed me. The green-eyed man said before scoffing, you may have killed me once, but that's all you're getting. The man said as he started doing hand seals, I'll just have to take your heart to replace this one, and with all your affinities, I should be good for a while, Futen. Oryoku Takina Kuki no Nami, Violent Air Wave. He explained blowing out a wave stronger than any Tatapa. Naruto's Sharingan copied the technique before he sunk into the ground, going deep as the incoming wind tore up the ground. Oh no you don't, Suiten. Kenketsusen no Josho, Rising Geyser, the Akatsuki member said before a large geyser of water shot up with Naruto at the top. Naruto was not having a good time, the water was all over him, and he just couldn't seem to do anything. He concentrated and a small explosion of demonic chakra went off around him, disrupting the geyser and sending him to the floor, where he had to quickly dodge another swing, this time from Haydn, who had been watching the fight between them. He growled at that annoying scythe, but smirked when he had the perfect idea. I believe it's time I end this, this is one of the most destructive kinjutsus known to Konoha. Prepare yourself. Naruto said. Kakuzu and Haydn both saw Naruto coming straight at them, Kakuzu tried to punch the Kaiubi Jinchuriki, only for his fist to go through him. It was then he noticed he was in a Jinjutsu, he broke out of it only for it to happen again. This time he broke out of all the layers of the Jinjutsu. He looked around and didn't see Naruto anywhere, he looked at Haydn, whose head was on the floor and the body trying to pick it up. Naruto must have cut his head off before he ran away. He walked up to Haydn's body but stopped and looked up. There Naruto was in the air, charging up a lot of lightning and thunder. The clouds above him gathered and the lightning went straight to Naruto's outstretched hand. This technique is really dangerous to use, but what the village doesn't know won't hurt me. Naruto said to himself before he pointed his hand at the ground, now vanish from this existence Raiden. Raime Tadora Kuho, roaring thunder cannon, Naruto said as lightning shot from the center of his hand and struck the ground a millisecond later, showing just how fast lightning can strike the ground. 
Bakuzu didn't even have time to blink, let alone dodge the lighting strike. An explosion erupted below Naruto, and even though he wasn't on the ground he could feel the earthquake as the explosion traveled outward for at least a mile. Time finally returned to normal, and Naruto started falling to the floor, Kyuubi's chakra going back to being dormant as he landed in the nearly mile-wide and hundred feet deep crater. He scratched his head, maybe using Kyuubi's chakra was overkill. In the ninja world, there is no such thing as overkill, you must do all you can to kill the other, come on I shouldn't be explaining this to you. You're starting to get soft, you used to be ruthless in Anbu, maybe you should go back. I'm sure your team would understand. The demon said, getting ready to take a nap. Oh please you know there was no room to be caring while in the core, and I'll never leave my team or go back to being an Anbu, those days are behind me. Now my goal is to someday become the Hokage, I'll then command all shinobi in the village, not to mention more respect, and I get to wear that cool hat. Naruto said walking back to Konoha, since using that last technique damaged his chakra coils, and using his chakra would hurt like a bitch. Well at least I killed two members of Akatsuki, and now I'm going home and I'm taking a nice and long sleep. Naruto thought out loud continuing his trek to Konoha. Unknown location, two figures were seen getting out of the meditation position. They cracked their necks and stood up. Leader Sam is going to love the information we bring him. I'm just glad we didn't try to get it personally. The taller figure said. The other figure grabbed his side and put it on his back, making it magically stay in position. For once, I agree with you, using that technique cuts our skill in half, but it is worthy when the time comes. Did you know I could have died back there, me, how the fuck is that even possible? The shorter figure asked himself. The two figures walked to a nearby rock formation and grabbed their straw hats. Come on Haydn, from what I know there's a bounty near here somewhere. The tall figure said to the now revealed Haydn. Haydn groaned, you know I fucking hate you Kakuzu, you and your bounties are so annoying. He said walking to the right of his partner. Kakuzu glanced at the man, not showing any emotion, and your rituals aren't. He asked. Boy, don't say anything about my rituals, they didn't do anything to you. Haydn said as they walked into the forest. You could still hear their voices as they got further and further away. Chapter 12. Return of the Kitsune. Three days later, I was getting worried about her sensei, it's been days since she saw him. She knew that he was powerful, but from the feel of it, so were the two that he had to fight. The blue-haired Jenin wanted to go back, but Hinode stopped them, and they continued to run to Konoha. It took them a day and a half to get there at their pace. Sensei should be here by now, it's only been two days. Way more than enough time to kill those two and get back here. I said, glancing at the teenager Chiraku. She didn't have a taste for Raymond, but on some occasions the team would come here. I'm sure Naruto-kun would be here any second. It wouldn't be like him to desert his own team, he's probably just taking his time. The brunette waitress said, serving one of her customers. Maybe you should ask one of the women he hangs out with. AM said looking at the clock, seeing that it was only 12.42 AM. I should, but I'm just worried that he might be labeled a missing nin for not being in the village. He's still alive, that I know. What if the council of the village decides to force Hokage-sama to make him a missing nin? She asked herself to get up from her seat. You don't have to worry about the council doing that, Ai-chan. A voice said behind the blue-haired ninjutsu specialist, making her turn around. What she saw wasn't Naruto or even one of the women she was introduced to a couple of days ago. It was the one and only Sandame Hokage, Siratobi Hirazan. Hokage-sama, forgive my earlier comment. I'm just frustrated about Sensei's absence. She said, doing a quick bow to show her loyalty. The old man just waved it off, trust me I feel the same, but wherever he is, I know it's going to make him stronger. The old man said, looking at the sky. Undisclosed location, Naruto was laying in a cave, somewhere in grass country. He didn't know why, but he keeps forgetting about the small country, nothing ever happened in it. He brought himself out of his thoughts when he heard something. He picked his head up just in time to see the rock hit the ground, he glared at the ceiling and stood up. He was still recovering from the battle with the Akatsuki members, of course he didn't receive any physical damage, the damage was all done to his chakra coils, the roaring thunder cannon was forbidden for a reason. Without the Kaiubi's chakra his coils would not have healed as fast as they did. So indeed using the Kaiubi's chakra with the forbidden technique was indeed overkill. Overkill, him at that minute he didn't feel like he killed anything. Something was just eating at the back of his head about the whole situation, why would the organization send those two to capture him at that moment? Of course because I was out of the village. He answered his own question. But something else bugged him, why were they so unique, both were immortal in their own way, and now he knew the way to kill them, and judging from their skills, defeating them would be easy. Well defeating the one named Haydn would be easy, Kakuzu was not going to be, with his Yongu, and his experience kept him alive so far. The real question you should be asking is, why did they reveal so much about themselves to you? 
They were confident in their abilities, no doubt, but I'm still confused about their true intentions. They already knew about the mighty power of the Kyubi no Kitsune, king of all demons, but they still did what they did. The fox said, giving Naruto something to think about. Naruto thought about what the fox said as he started walking deeper in the cave, not knowing that he was walking at all. It could be that they wanted to gain information about me, not knowing that I had information about them. So we just sort of switched information, so that means how they survived my thunder cannon. Or were they there at all? Naruto whispered to himself, before it came to him. Of course. That's why they were so confident in their survival, those weren't their real bodies. But what kind of allows somebody to do that? Naruto said, shouting a little, causing a large amount of bats to awaken and flap around the cave, releasing some heat that Naruto couldn't understand. The blonde tried and succeeded in focusing some chakra into his eyes and looked around the cave, not seeing the mouth of it or even any other light. Wait, what's that? The retired Anbu ninja said seeing a glint of light under what appeared to be smoldering rock, that's where the heat was coming from. The closer Naruto got to the cave, the more heated it became in the cave, Kaiubi, what's with this unusual heat? He asked only to receive silence in return. Kaiubi, hello are you there? He asked after he stopped walking towards the rock. He growled in annoyance and resumed his walking, now the heat was becoming unbearable, he tried shielding his body from the heat, but he felt his chakra being sucked out of his body, making him weaker. He dropped to a single knee, just as he reached the well of smoldering rock. He was breathing hard and his chakra wasn't coming back at all, he tried activating his Sharingan, but that didn't work either, the chakra in his eyes had long since left his body. Um on Naruto, didn't I tell you it was a bad idea to enter this cave? I knew there was something unordinary about it the first time I laid eyes on it. He thought to himself before he picked his head up and stared at the wall, his hand unconsciously raising in the air. The Jounin didn't realize his hand was in the air until his hand touched the wall. But of course it was too late to do anything about it, as the rock grew hotter and hotter as it started sucking out his chakra at a ridiculous rate. He tried to pry his hand off the wall, but in his state he was helpless. Is this really how I'm going to leave this world, I always wanted to go out in the blaze of glory. The blonde thought before an explosion blasted him back, temporarily knocking him out. Moments later he awoke to see the sky, confusing him. He looked around and located multiple fragments of the cave, the blast destroyed the entire cave, and yet he's still alive. Nor is he. He thought pinching his cheek, feeling pain. I'm still alive, but how did I survive with no chakra in my body to help protect me from the blast, and how did such a blast destroy the entire cave this thing is huge. He thought out loud, rubbing his ears to get rid of the annoying ringing, just in time to hear the flapping of wings. He slowly looked up and spotted what appeared to be a huge dark silver dragon flying in wide circles. It must have noticed that Naruto looked up because it started flying down. Naruto reached for his weapon pouch to find it missing, as was his sword and his new hidden wrist blade. The force of the wind crushing down on him brought him out of his thoughts. The shaking of the earth told him that the dragon landed. Naruto's eyes widened, seeing the dragon up close, it was easily larger than Kaiubi, and its crimson eyes were more menacing to see. It had a wingspan of 40 feet, and its teeth were sharper than the sharpest blade, as were its talons, and they all were larger than he was. Silver scales covered its body, they were probably more durable than any man-made defense. Horns was on both sides of its head, a mane of silver hair between them. It was 20 feet long, and the tip of its tail had very sharp spikes sprouting out of it. It was a huge creature indeed, roughly 950 pounds. You must be the human that released me from my prison. It spoke with its deep and powerful voice. You may call me Raijin, king of the skies. It spoke with shocking news. Naruto steeled his nerves and pushed himself onto his knees before he slowly tried to stand on his feet. My name is Namikaze Uzumaki Naruto, shy no cage, and... Naruto said getting cut off by the king. In Chiriki of the Kaiubi no Kitsune, yes I remember the Kitsune. Does he still shout about him being the strongest demon of all time? Raijin said, chuckling. Naruto was surprised to hear this, so if that was true, then he must be standing in front of the strongest demon in existence. So does that make you the strongest demon? Naruto asked after nodding to his question, to which it nodded to him. Then I have one question, how in the world did you end up sealed and in a cave no less? Naruto shouted out to the dragon, whose eyes sparked with fury. Listen to Hatchling, there are some things that don't need to be known. He said his giant slitted crimson eye glaring into Naruto's own blue-gray ones. So we leave that conversation for another time, for now as repayment for setting me free, I let you summon me and my clan, I'm sure they'll be glad to help the one that set me free. The crimson-eyed dragon said, spreading his wings and bringing them back just behind Naruto. The blonde turned around to see a scroll sitting there, it was a fairly small scroll, he picked it up and opened it all the way, and only saw one name, Namika's Shishio. Hey the creator of the Namikas was your first and only summoner, I never knew that. 
Father only said that Shishio created the Namikas hundreds of years ago, he said nothing about how or why. Naruto thought out loud. Yes Shishio was very gifted in everything he did, he was a complex person, an enigma if you will. But he sure made up for it in his cunning and ability with his sword. You hold some of his characteristics, his blonde hair, your sharp mind, and lastly your skills in combat. The dragon said, watching as Naruto properly signed the contract, gladly putting Namika's Uzumaki Ichiha Naruto. For some time the god has been thinking about the Ichiha name, wondering why it was such a big deal, until he remembered just where it came from. His crimson eyes glared into the sky, before looking back down at Naruto, who just finished rolling up the scroll. Now I think I have something I need to return to you. Raijin said as light shined from his eyes, blinding Naruto. Suddenly Naruto felt the rush of chakra enter his coils and weighed in all the right places. His hand moved to his hip and found his sword and weapon pouch. His wrist had his hidden blade and it worked just fine. He looked up just in time to see Raijin's talon just inches away from his right forearm. Instincts told him not to move and he was glad he listened to them. But seconds later a burning sensation filled his body, he grit his teeth together and groaned to the pain of a summoning tattoo being burned onto his skin. He stared at the burn and noticed it looked like a dragon's body. He activated his Sharingan, loving the feeling of having it activated. He looked at Raijin, his crimson eyes boring through the dragon's own, Kaiubi wants to talk to you. He said, his crimson eyes lost there, and the lone pupil enlarged and became slitted. Raijin, long time no see. The fox said through Naruto's mouth, the voice sounded deep and strong, just like the kind of the sky's own. Yes it has, so sealed again are you, this makes it your third, no. The dragon said, making the fox growl. Now, I wouldn't want to hurt my new summoner because of your bruised ego. The dragon said, chuckling at Kaiubi. So what is it that you wanted to talk to me about? He said getting straight to business. Naruto's face went serious, it's just that I know how you were sealed, and a kid here will kill the descendant of the one responsible, you have my word. Kaiubi said honestly and even gave the god a small bow. What is this, are you finally showing me the proper respect as a demon lord should? Wow, solitude sure has taught you a lesson he said, chuckling at the glare shot at him. Just remember that I'm not that far from your strength, and the kid, once he absorbs me completely, would become stronger than even you. Kitsune said, giving the reins back to Naruto, who stumbled at the sudden change. So what do you two talk about? Naruto asked, seeing the dragon's menacing smirk, never mind, I don't want to know. Naruto deactivated his Sharingan. So where are you going to go? The blonde randomly said. Oh, my clan will be happy to know I'm back, be sure to summon us anytime. Raijin said, raising his arm and slashing at the sky, opening a portal half a mile wide and a hundred feet above the ground. He then flapped his wings and took flight and flew through the portal, making it close seconds later. The blonde glanced at his summoning tattoo and sighed, I'm getting way too many tattoos. He said looking at the sun and seeing that it was maybe around four in the afternoon. He shrugged his shoulders and ran in the way he knew Kanoha was. Unknown location, Haiden and Kakuzu could be seen walking into a dark area, Leader Sama we have some important information you would want to know. Kakuzu said, tossing a scroll into the darkness. After a while of nothing happening Haiden spoke, getting that wasn't as easy as it should have been. That bastard had a technique that caused mass destruction and shit. Now he believes we're dead, we'll wait until we make our return Kakuzu, I can't wait to make that bastard bleed. Haiden said. The two immortals felt eyes on them and looked into the darkness, only to see a pair of grey ripple-like eyes staring back at them. Your information was acceptable, dismissed. He said as the two walked away. So the Kaiubi Jinchuriki has a weakness, I guess it only makes sense he is human after all. He doesn't stack up to a god. Leader Sama said, closing his eyes and vanishing from his spot. Back in Kanoha, a day passed and Naruto had yet to return to Kanoha, so the team tried to take their minds off of it by getting a D-rank mission. Soon one turned to two and then five, and after twenty the Hokage made an appearance, shocking the team as they met outside of the tower. You three need to take a break. You've been working non-stop for the past twenty-four hours. I'm not sure Naruto would approve of your constant missions, he would want you to be training and getting stronger. The old man said. You know he is right. A voice said above them, before someone landed just between them. It was our favorite blonde and he was back in the village. The students cheered that their teacher was back, and Hiruzen patted him on the back. Naruto smiled at them, thankful that he was back, before he turned serious. Jiji, we need to talk. He said before looking at his students, how about you three go train for a while in our training field, and I'll be there shortly to guide you. He said. They frowned knowing the Hokage was right, but started smiling again when they realized that it wasn't a dream, and their sensei was going to be there. After the genins left Naruto faced the Hokage, and they both body flickered to his office. Inside the office the Hokage sat in his chair, but Naruto remained standing. After a while of silence Naruto walked up to the Hokage and slapped him in the back of the head. 
I told you releasing all that information about me was the wrong choice. He said activating his Sharingan just in case his Hokage decided to retaliate. Here is in just sat there shocked that his student just did that. Seconds later he sighed, okay I had that coming, but even if I could turn back time I would still put you in the bingo book. You see that information is old, and they'll rely on that information when they fight you. The Hokage said, rubbing the back of his head and signaling his Anbu not to attack, just in time to stop them from attacking the one that attacked their Hokage. By this time Naruto had calmed down a little and sat down. Now that I got that out of my system I have something to tell you. He said, running a hand through his hair. I fought two members from Akatsuki, that's why I've been absent from the village for so long. Naruto said, shocking the old man and the Anbu in the shadows. In a split second, Hiruzen's face went from shock to full-blown seriousness. Who were they and how strong were they? He asked, tilting his hat a little. Naruto's face went serious when his sensei's face went serious, their names are Hayden, and from what I believe, he came from the country of Hot Springs. His skills revolved around his three-bladed scythe and his religion, he praises a demented god called Jashin, who grants his followers immortality, as long as they continue killing. Naruto explained as the Hokage wrote in a small notepad. After seeing the Hokage signaling him to continue he continued, the other was much stronger, his name was Kakuzu, from Takigakur no Sado. He went into detail about his bloodline, and I took the initiative to put this entire report into this scroll. He dug through his pockets and took out a scroll that he tossed to Saratobi. After the old man caught it he continued, because of his bloodline he can live for a long period of time, as long as he has the things he needs to stay alive, which are the hearts of others. Because of his long life he gained experience and a lot of it, even though I was dominating the fight I could tell that he wasn't going all out, I wasn't either, but we were not talking about that. Naruto said scratching his arm, the medical tape around it was itchy. The hockey had been reading the scroll and was shocked that this was the same one that fraud against the Shadai, he finished reading just as Naruto stopped. He glanced at the tape and put it in the back of his mind to remember to ask Naruto what he was hiding. So you kill these two and I can tally off their names. He asked, getting ready to put a giant X through his notebook. Naruto shook his head, shocking the Hokage. At first I thought they were dead, but as time went on I started to believe that they weren't even in the same country as me. I know it's weird, but usually whenever I kill somebody I get a feeling of them glaring at me from hell, but a couple of days ago I didn't get that feeling, so they must have a technique that allows them to get to their targets without being there themselves. The blonde explained again. The eyes of the blonde audience widened after hearing this, a technique of this level was dangerous in the ninja world. Impossible. The Hokage muttered. To be able to be somewhere without being there yourself, the most dangerous S-rank Anbu missions would need this mission to preserve the lives of the Anbu that take the missions. So let me get this straight if they're immortal, how did you get away? The Hokage said. After hearing this Naruto's face went from serious to sheepish, as he rubbed the back of his head and gave a nervous chuckle. Yeah. He said stretching the word, about that you see, after gaining that knowledge of them being immortal, I kind of went overboard in making sure they died. Even though they didn't even die. He thought in his head. What did you do? The old man asked, glaring at the boy. Naruto let out another nervous chuckle. Let's just say near the border of Tsuchi no Kuni and Kusa no Kuni, there's a half a mile wide crater. Naruto said, rubbing the back of his head. The old man sighed knowing a couple of techniques that can cause that kind of destruction, and Naruto knew most of them, so he already knew the technique was forbidden, he just didn't know which one. Just forget it, is that all you have to say? The old man watched as Namikaze shook his head, while scratching his arm. Really, well it's a good thing I have another question, so what's wrong with your arm? He said nodding to said arm. Naruto tried to play it off. Nothing was wrong with my arm, I just decided to wear tape around my arms. He said, but after a while of hard staring at the Hokage he gave in, fine. He mumbled unwrapping his right arm. He held his arm up showing the occupants in the room his new summoning seal, it's a contract from the dragons. I received it during my time away from the village. Let me tell you this, the dragon that I got it from was bigger and stronger than the Kaiubi. Naruto said standing up and began to rewrap his dark grey bandages. He finished and started leaving, I have to get a new pair of gloves. He said remembering he sacrifices his other ones to do his and a new forearm bracer. He said missing the extra protection it gave his arm. He was about to walk out the door when somebody opened it, almost hitting him in the nose. The blonde backed up enough to dodge, and he saw his little brother Sasuke walk through, whose face brightened Naruto Nai, when did you get here? The kids have been asking for you. He said. The blonde's face went to a realized face, oh yeah, the kids. He said slowly creating a shadow clone to train his students as he started walking out of the office. He stopped when Kakashi put his hand on the blonde's shoulder. It's almost time. The scarecrow whispered, the blonde nodded, and made another clone that went to tell the message to Itachi. 
Naruto waved ignoring the glaring of Shiro and did a quick leaf shunshun and left the office on his way to the Ichiha compound to see the kids. But Naruto's team, what do you mean sensei isn't going to help train us? I nearly yelled at the clone. Like I said, the boss is on his way to the Ichiha compound to see the children and his mother. Now he left me a lot of chakra so I'll be your training partner for the moment and I want all of you to attack me. Use anything you have in your arsenal to dispel me. The clone jumped in the air when I threw some kunai at him and the fight started. But the Tachi, the clone just dispelled relaying the message given to it. Said team smirked after the clone left. Currently he had his shirt off and he was sweating all over his body. Thankfully he was in the middle of a break so the clone didn't see his private training. He was a little peed that Naruto found him in the first place. The area was supposed to be sealed off only for him to use, but somehow the clone found him. After a while he started smirking again as he activated the seals around the area and activated his Sharingan. Nearly immediately the sealed area's gravity increased by three times the original gravity. His knees buckled at the added gravity, but he didn't fall, he just created a dozen shadow clones and they began sparring and Itachi only had one thought in mind and that was staying alive at the moment. But Naruto, Naruto entered the compound and shortly after that appeared in front of Ichiha Manor. Before he could open the sliding door someone else opened it, making Naruto think, how come I could never open any doors in this village? He thought of seeing Mai in front of him. Nai san. She screamed before latching onto his leg. It's about time you got here, did you bring me anything? She asked, still latching to his leg. Naruto chuckled, but before he could say anything Makoto walked entered the area, drying a plate. Kai leaves Itachi Kanelo. She said seeing Mai latched on Naruto's leg. She nearly dropped the plate after seeing Naruto in the house after being absent for nearly half a year. And Naruto-kun. She stuttered a little, her face in shock mode, before it darkened. She calmly walked back into the kitchen, Naruto could hear the plate being set on the table, before the dark-haired woman appeared behind him and grabbed his ear. Where have you been, mister, everyone's been worrying about you. She said, dragging him outside and to the backyard where Daisuke was helping Kai train. The whole way there Naruto was arguing with his mother, saying that he had missions to get to and a team to train. Aesuke and his sister stopped training after hearing the commotion, they turned around to see Naruto being dragged by their mother and Mai giggling behind them. Soon Kai started giggling and Daisuke started laughing at the sight of the great shy, no cage being dragged by his ear. Naruto heard laughter and substituted himself with Daisuke and started rubbing his sore ear. Fine, I'll train the brats. He said, making the children glare at him. After I do this, I have to train myself. You know me, Kakashi and Itachi have a monthly fight to see who Sharingan is stronger. He said, activate Sharingan. After Makoto left to finish the dishes he went into sensei mode, alright maggots listen up, I hope you didn't forget about the pecking order. In case you forgot it goes like this. It goes you, the dirt, the worms inside of the dirt, Naruto stool, Makoto Kasen, and Naruto. He said his Sharingan was spinning widely. Any questions? He asked. Yeah what are we Daisuke started to say before he was chopped in the neck, knocking him unconscious. Enjoy nap time bitch. He said before he heard Makoto yelling from the kitchen. What was that Naruto-kun? The dark-haired mother yelled. Nothing. Now that she's not bothering me. Any more questions? Good then we can begin. Naruto said making a shadow clone, who walked up to the kids and their bodies flickered to a place where they could train in peace. It was a good thing the clone took Daisuke with him, because Makoto came out of the house a second later. Naruto-kun where are the kids? She asked her Sharingan to be active. Naruto smirked. I'll tell you where there is not. Safe. He jumped back just as Makoto started chasing him. Chapter 13. Preparations and a quick mission. Namaka's compound two days later. Naruto stood alone in his dojo, his eyes closed as he concentrated. He was dressed in his training gear, gray cargo pants and a gray padded shirt that had an eye of the Sharingan on his right sleeve and the Namaka's symbol on the back. On his chest was the symbol for the Uzumaki, which was a whirlpool. Go to my profile to see the Namaka's symbol. He created 20 shadow clones that stood on the edges of the room. Four of the clones turned around and activated the room's ninjutsu absorbing seals. The room glowed a light blue for a couple of seconds as the seals turned on. Remember you have to focus and send yourself to a different dimension very quickly and bring yourself back to this dimension just as fast. The blonde's fox explained. The blonde mentally nodded and opened his eyes showing his manjiku sharingan, it was simple the tamo's tail elongated and connected to the middle pupil with the background being red like always. Go to my profile to see his manjiku, it just doesn't have the red background, you would think it would be the four-pointed star like his mother had, but he learned that no two manjiku shuringans are the same. Itachi's was a three-pointed shuriken, Ichihamadara's was an open and connected circle, things that's a little hard to explain, and from what he understood, his brother Izuna's manjiku was three thick bars that connected and circled in the middle. 
the Kashi, well he didn't even know if he could obtain the Manjikyu, since he wasn't an Acheha, with a natural born Sharingan. He shook his head from his Manjikyu-related thoughts and regained his concentration. After a while he nodded to his clones, and they each started doing different sets of hand seals. Five of the twenty clones did, Raiden. John and launched a quick stream of lightning out of their mouth at the centered Naruto. Five of the twenty clones did, Kaiten. Kiryu ended and blew out a large stream of fire from their mouths and aimed at Naruto in the center. Five of the twenty clones did, Suiten. John Okuchi collected water in their mouths and blew out a stream of water that turned into a snake's head and converged on the center of Naruto. Five of the twenty clones did, Futen. Kami Arashi blew out a swirling vortex that traveled at Naruto in the center of the room. Naruto stood as these techniques were traveling towards him, he did a quick prayer to Kami and got ready as everything was moving in slow motion. Hokage Tower, Saratobi was doing paperwork, a stack of paper on the edge of the desk. It was his finished work. He had decided to do it the old-fashioned way, instead of using shadow clones. It was still kind of early in the morning, and the sun was just beginning to rise in the air. When he set his cup of coffee back on his desk, he looked up and out of his window as he got a sudden feeling to check up on his youngest student and bring medic nins with him. He brushed the feeling off and picked his cup of coffee back up and took a sip. Maybe it's just my imagination. He muttered to himself as he continued his paperwork. With Kakashi, Kakashi stepped out from his shower after training for the entire night. He was a little exhausted but still felt like training for a He shook his head and checked his calendar and realized that he only had another day before the fight. He chuckled as he lifted his head and saw his Sharingan. It was a little unfair that Naruto and Itachi had two, but he was given the chance of receiving another pair of Sharingan eyes. And they will train him in order for him to learn how to activate and deactivate the eyes, but he didn't want to discard his friend's life-giving gift. And putting another Sharingan eye in his right eye would only throw him off balance, not to mention that two different Sharingan eyes wouldn't cooperate correctly. So basically he was just stuck with his single Sharingan eye until something happened to it. After getting dressed he walked to his bookshelf and picked out a book. He kept his head band up and walked through the village, nodding to the civilians he passed as they started setting up shop. He would cast quick jinjutsus on everyone he passed by, deactivating them after he fully passed by. He looked at the sky for a while before he glanced in the direction of the noble district, wanting to curse his brother for some odd reason. He pulled his headband down and headed for the Hokage Mountain to continue some training. With Itachi, Itachi had been absent from the village for the last two days, he was sweaty all over his body. He was suffering from chakra exhaustion as his shingen disappeared from his eyes. He started panting heavily, his sweat falling to the floor as he rested on his hands and knees. I didn't think I would be able to do that but I did. He thought. Of course he took breaks between training, like sleep and food breaks. He focused his energy on the seals around him and cancelled the gravity effect. He then crawled to his tent nearby and laid on his bedroll, still breathing heavily. He stared at the small roof and smirked as he started laughing at his completed training. This round is going to be a piece of cake. He thought knowing that this time he was going to win instead of Naruto. His laughter stopped when he felt someone nearby, he looked to his left and grabbed a bag of soldier pills as an Anbu opened his tent. He swallowed a pill when the Anbu turned his head, I found him he's in here. He said looking back at Itachi. The Ichiha felt some of his chakra restored, what are you doing here Toad? He asked the Toad masked Anbu. We thought you ran from the village and this squad was issued to find you and eliminate you if necessary. It's a good thing you didn't escape. He said moving aside as Itachi rose and walked out of the tent with some difficulty. Itachi scoffed, yeah it is a good thing I didn't escape, I wouldn't want to have to kill some of Konoha's finest Anbu. He said walking to the seal surrounding the area as more Anbu stood beside Toad. This squad only had three Anbu and one Nin dog. Judging from the one wearing the wolf mask he was an Inuzuka. The other was a woman and she wore a snake mask. After pocketing the seal papers, Itachi walked back to the tent. As you can see I've been training and I haven't defected from the village. Now you're dismissed, I'm going home and sleeping in my comfortable bed. He said sealing the tent and started walking home. Are you sure we can help you get there faster, you're suffering from chakra exhaustion and physical exhaustion. Whatever training you did sure did a number on both your body and chakra coils. The woman said, she must have been a high uga to know about his chakra coils. Itachi waved her offer off, knowing that all he needed was a nice and long rest, and he'll be good as new. The three Anbu shrugged before they vanished before they got to the village. Itachi had been looking at the big brown dog when they left. He sighed, still feeling their presence for a while before they vanished completely. He rubbed his eye a little seeing his compound at the edge of his vision, he looked in the direction of the Namaka's compound and knew Naruto was doing his own vigorous training. Another thing he knew was that he couldn't wait till the fight. With Naruto, smoke filled the room, with Naruto lying near a wall. He did accomplish something by not being flat out dead right now. 
He groaned as he picked himself up and took deep breaths from where the wind techniques hit him dead on. His shadow clones dispelled when their chakra ran out after they fired their techniques. He was a little pissed, those techniques were not fired at him at the same time. His clones thought it would be funny to fire the techniques in quick second intervals, at the first 10 he was good, as his techniques wasn't allowing them to hit him, and him being a beginner, wasn't skilled enough to lengthen the time, so he got hit by the last few techniques, which he was glad was only water and wind. Of course with the little blades and the wind techniques he was glad the damage was as extensive as it should have been. He looked down at his tattered shirt and ripped it off, since it was useless. Now shirtless he walked out of the room, not caring about the activated walls, since he was going to go back and continue. Now out of the dojo, he looked at the sky and to the right where the Namika's house was. He sighed and walked inside the house and headed straight to the kitchen. He boiled a kettle of water and waited until the water boiled. While he was waiting he looked in his cupboard and grabbed a small box of some loose jasmine tea leaves. He grabbed a teapot and walked to the whistling kettle and rinsed the teapot out with some of the boiled water. He quickly poured the steaming water down the sink. He looked through his drawers for a spoon and soon found one, he used a spoon to scoop some of the crushed tea leaves into the steaming pot. Next he grabbed the kettle and slowly poured it into the pot, after that, he placed a large and ready heated pad on top of the pot, and now he had to wait for a couple of minutes. He made a clone to finish the job while he went to take a shower. Then minutes later he walked down the stairs, wearing new training clothes. He nodded to the clone seeing it making some eggs and bacon. He stood at the counter and picked up his hot cup of tea. He drank some and shivered in delight, he liked strong tea, and man was this tea strong. He sat on his couch just as a knock sounded at his door. He sighed and created a shadow clone to answer the door. I know he's lazy as hell, but you can't blame him, he is drinking tea. Hana walked in the house and saw Naruto sitting on the couch drinking tea. Naruto-kun you couldn't answer the door yourself. She asked, sitting next to him, putting her arm around his head and leaned on his shoulder. Naruto took another sip and glanced at Hana, so, what are you doing here so early? he asked, taking another sip. She smiled at him, Hokage-sama has given us a mission, we will probably be gone for a couple of hours, at the most. She said getting up, knowing that the Himeru triplets will get bored and cause trouble. Naruto finished his tea as his clone brought the eggs and bacon for them both. Seeing the food Hana sat back next to Naruto and started eating too. The clone left the house and took some spare bacon to the Himeru triplets. The two ate in silence, they just sat there enjoying each other's company. Naruto finished a minute later and stood up, he took his plate and cup and took them to the sink. He made a clone to clean up and went upstairs to gather his things. Minutes later he returned with his weapon pouch and his sword. His headband was tied around his neck like always, the only thing different was the medical tape around his arms weren't there. His gloves were shortened and only went to his wrist instead of the middle of his forearm, like it had been before his fight with Akatsuki. He followed Hana out of the house and smiled when he noticed his clone was playing with the dogs. He dismissed his clone, and the dogs yipped when they saw Hana. They all vanished and appeared in front of the Hokage. Said old man looked up seeing Hana returning with Naruto. Ah good you've returned, here's your assignment. He said, handing a scroll to Naruto. Naruto read through the scroll and glanced at the old man. Seriously, shouldn't this be a job for the Hunter Nin? He asked, spinning the scroll on his finger. Yes it would be a job for the Hunter Nin, but they lack in diplomacy, I want to see if we can turn this man to our side. It might be a little difficult considering the circumstances, but I have faith you will succeed. If he doesn't want to comply with the offer, then you can kill him. Hana and her partners are here to help track him down. He finalized looking back at his paperwork with a frown on his face. Naruto sighed and opened the scroll and read through it again. He shook his head and looked in Hana, well I best get ready for a fight. He asked for her to meet him at the north gate. He vanished leaving her to walk to the north gate. She sighed walking between her dogs, who do you think was in that scroll? She asked Ishmeru, who was on her right. Said dog barked, she shook her head, I know it was an Iwa ninja, but who exactly? She asked herself. She shook her head when she arrived at the north gate. She slid against the wall, while her pooches laid their heads on her lap. She pet Cindermaru's head with her left, while her right pet Embermaru's head. She stopped her left and started petting Ishmeru's head. She looked at the sky, waiting for Naruto to meet up with her. But Naruto, we see Naruto in his room, putting on his jounin vest, over his anbu style vest. Now decked out in his original clothes he jumped out the window and vanished while in the air. A minute later he was on top of the north gate. He stared into Hana's eyes as she was still looking up and waved at her. He jumped down as she started getting up, took you long enough. She said walking up to the Chunin gate guards. The blonde looked at her as she talked to the guards. He then looked at the dogs. I was only gone for five minutes. What's wrong with her? He asked them as they all barked at him. Not understanding what they were telling him, he nodded his head. I know, if she has a problem, how come she doesn't just ask me? 
he said crouching next to the dogs and started petting them all. Hana turned around, hearing what Naruto said, but dismissed it when she saw him playing with the triplets. She smiled and stopped talking to her colleague. Naruto let's go. She said. The blonde's head shot up, hey I'm in charge. He said running over to her. Well do you have three elite nine dogs that could track anybody from miles away? She asked, putting her hand on her hip. Naruto tried to say, but nothing came out. Okay you lead. He said putting his head down as she smirked in triumph, and she and her dogs jumped through the trees. Naruto stayed behind, slowly walking through, he heard snickering and glared at Izumo and Katetsu, his Sharingan eyes shutting them up. He smirked as he vanished from his spot. An hour later, Naruto hung back as he watched a dog sniff everything that had the scent of their target. Hana looked at Naruto, so who's the target again? She asked, smiling at him. Ichiha groaned at her question. Again, I told you dozens of times in the past hour, his name is Jishin Kaosu, Chaos, he's from Iowa and loves the thrill of the fight. He's incredibly strong and I can't wait to fight him. Naruto said, smirking. She walked beside him with her hands folded behind her. Why did you leave the village, I mean a man of his skill would be put to work, 24-7. She said looking at his eyes. The blonde thought for a while, we'll get that answer when we find him, he's last been seen around this area, so we shouldn't have to wait long. He said, glancing around. The group came upon a clearing where they saw a man laying in the grass, he was relaxed until he woke up to barks. He looked around and saw Naruto and Hana, looking at him from the edge of the clearing, with the three dogs only a meter away from him. Naruto had been looking at him carefully, he knew that if he woke up to noise, he would silence it and go back to sleep. So when the man pulled out a kunai, he vanished. He deflected the thrown kunai and stood in front of the triplets. I don't think that will be a good idea. He said wagging his finger as the man looked at him. Kaosu knew this kid, Namaka's Naruto. Son of the Yandane, of course he didn't care about the loss of most of the village's military to the kid's father, he just knew that the kid was strong and he was looking for a strong opponent. Kaosu was a tall man, his brown hair was short but reached the back of his neck. He had a scar on his right cheek, it was an X mark. Where he got it, even he doesn't remember. His muscles were hidden by a black shirt and over that was a crimson Iwa Jown and flak jacket. He wore dark red cargo pants and black boots. After leaving his village he discarded his headband, having no reason to keep it. He was now 30 years old and he was tired of the countless missions, especially the last one. Naruto looked at the man, I know you know who I am and I know who you are, so let's just get to business. My Hokage wants to offer you something, the offer is for you to become a ninja of Konoha. I however couldn't care less, I just want to fight. He thought. In time kid, can't you see the fire burning in his eyes, he wants to fight as much as you do. Just make sure you drag his broken body back to Konoha. I'm sure he would want a rematch. The fox said, causing Naruto to nod in agreement. Well as much as I would want to live in a village full of tree huggers, I have to decline your offer. He shrugged as he stood up. I don't feel like doing any more missions, but I will fight you. I could see it in your eyes, you wish to fight as much as I do, so let's do this. The brown haired man said, causing Naruto to smirk. The blonde glanced at the triplets and Hana as they stared at them. I suggest you stay out of the fight Hana, this is going to be a big fight. He said, she nodded and backed up more into the forest, making sure she could still see all of the clearing. Be careful Naruto-kun, I know you're strong, but still be careful. She thought. Back to the two fighters, they began to stare into each other's eyes, anxious for the fight to begin, but still waiting for the right time to strike. The afternoon wind was blowing through the trees, blowing leaves throughout the clearing. Both of their eyes stayed connected as dozens of leaves impaired their vision, seconds later when the wind calmed and the last leaf fell to the ground they charged at each other. Chapter 14. Showdown between Srank Shinobi, clearing in high no kuni. Kaosu was immediately sent into a tree, the blonde Ichiha was sent on the other side of the clearing, due to the two fighters hitting each other at the same time. The blonde Jounin stopped himself from skidding on the ground and promptly vanished. He reappeared in front of the casual looking Iwanin and sent a punch. The man caught the punch and pulled the blonde towards him. The shock of the pull surprised Naruto, and he lost his footing, he extended his leg and vaulted the leaf nin over him. Instead of letting the blonde go, he continued to hold his hand and slammed him to the floor while still remaining on his back. He rolled backwards and sat on the blonde's stomach. He raised his fist and punched. The puff of smoke erupted around his fist and splinters of a broken log replaced Naruto. Naruto stood five yards away from the foreign ninja and took out a couple of shurikens and tossed them at the man. The brown-haired Jounin turned and prepared to deflect the projectiles, he noticed that they were thrown all around him. Is that the best you can do? He said goading his opponent. Naruto's fingers twitched and the shurikens began to circle around the Jounin, surprising said Jounin, as he had not seen a glint in the sunlight. Surprised aren't you? This is a little project I've been working on in my spare time. 
To use my chakra and have it act as ninja wire, I'm sure you can sense the chakra around you by now. Through to the Yuzumaki's words, Kaosu looked around, and not only could he sense the usage of chakra, but he could also see the distortion around him. He held in his sneer to smile at the blonde. That's it, you're going to take me to Kono, but wait, there's more. The blonde said, interrupting the man. I'm not finished yet. He continued doing a series of hand seals. This is it, Katen. Karyu Enden, fire dragon flame projectile, he said blowing a large jet of fire from his mouth that traveled along the chakra, the fire becoming more intense in heat and connected to the man causing an explosion of flame. A bead of sweat traveled down Naruto's brow, not only because of the extensive heat in front of him, but also because using his chakra like he did was still difficult to do. You did a wonderful kid, you didn't even need the Sharingan for that fight. The fox said from his cage. I wish I had been. Naruto thought as Kaosu continued to stand in the same spot as the cloud around him traveled with the wind. The man had survived and his skin was unnaturally gray in color. But he wasn't burned, you're an amazingly strong child to make me reveal my Akuma no Yonahifu, demon skin, so early in the fight. But sadly your time has come. He said a maniacal grin came to his face and he rushed at Naruto as a dust trail traveled behind him as he moved at an incredible speed. Naruto was barely able to activate his bloodline before he was punched in the stomach, Fu he said as his breath left his lungs. Heosu used his other arm and cross punched Naruto in the jaw, sending him flying across the clearing. Hana gasped at the shift of the fight. She couldn't believe that Naruto was just handled the way he was. Get back in the fight with Naruto-kun. As if reading her thoughts Naruto righted himself in the air and skidded along the dirt on his feet. His eyes were spinning in anger as he began to see everything slower than usual. Finally you reveal your bloodline, the Sharingan, I shall finally see how I fare against such eyes. The man said crazily as he vanished once more. Seeing the man run at him far slower than he would if he wasn't using his Sharingan caused him to smirk. That's just it, compared to my eyes you don't see a damn thing. He said running at the man as well, and they engaged in a Tejutsu fight. With the Sharingan, Naruto was easily able to dodge the punches of the man, but with the demon skin, Naruto's punches did little to no damage at all. Thus they were forced to jump back and begin the ninjutsu part of the fight. Oten. Doro Georgia Satsue, mud shots, Kaosu said firing multiple bullets of mud at Naruto. Already seeing what technique that was going to be used, Naruto began a string of hand seals that would overpower the technique. Raiden. John, false darkness, he said firing a massive bolt of lightning at his opponent's mud. Like always, lightning triumphed over earth, and John continued to fly towards the man. Said man vanished and appeared behind a wall of earth that just ascended from the ground. Naruto knew that was going to happen and was already on his way over to the wall, with a Rasengan in hand. Surprised enveloped the blonde in the form of a dorm of earth. His Rasengan did no apparent damage to the dome at all. What the hell just happened? The blonde asked himself looking around the dome. He could see the chakra surrounding the dome and noticed that it was sucking out his chakra. Oten. Kijiju no Jutsu, Cage Beast Technique, Successful. The man smirked as the hard demon skin faded, calming his behavior as well. I'm actually surprised it worked on an Ichiha. He said feeling a massive amount of chakra being used inside of his dome. Some of the chakra traveled to him but the rest. The rest of the chakra was going around Naruto. Said chakra ignited into flames and converged at the blonde's left fist. The blonde Sharingan I told him what he needed to do to get out of the dome. He crouched down and jumped, punching the dome as he rose into the air, fire surrounding his being in the shape of a fiery dragon's body, with a left fist holding the head. Hayton. Ryu no Joshua, rising dragon, he said in the air. The brown-haired man looked up in irritation as the fire rose up farther than the blonde and grew more intense in heat. I'm not finished yet you bastard. Katen. Ryu no Tachi, falling dragon. The fiery dragon fell towards the man and crashed into the ground, causing an explosion. Naruto landed on the floor and glared at the cloud, he did a small wind technique and the cloud was blown away. And on the ground was Kaosu, his clothes were burned and his skin was a light red. Seeing this caused Naruto to deactivate his Sharingan, having no need for it as Hana ran up to him. He turned to them just in time to catch her in a hug. Thank Kami you're alright. She said, kissing him on the cheek. That fight was unbelievable, I can't believe he forced you to use your Sharingan. By this time they walked to the body and Naruto grabbed the man's leg and started dragging the man as they began walking back home. The blonde scoffed at her, oh please he didn't force me to do anything, especially activate my. He stopped as suddenly he was hit in the right knee by Kaosu. Ah Sharingan. Naruto thought as Kaosu quickly jumped back and landed meters away from the blonde. The blow didn't have enough force to have his bone force itself out of his leg, but it was strong enough to break said bone. Ah ha ha ha, fighting you is the most fun I've ever had in my life. The man said laughing as he began a series of hand seals. 
Akuma no Shiji Sha, devil's advocate, this time his skin became pitch black in color, and his head was shaved, and two gray lines traveled from behind the ears, and connected to the edge of the lips, where four large teeth were seen poking out of, two from the bottom and two from the top. Seeing Hana about to foolishly charge at the man, Naruto extended his arm stopping her. Why did you stop me Naruto-kun you're too injured to continue fighting. And you'll fare even better, not just stay back and let me handle this. This is my fight. He said as the red in his eyes grew more prominent and three appeared around his pupil. Hana growled and grabbed the blonde's collar, no I won't back down. She yelled at him, anger obvious in her voice, he hurt you, my alpha, I won't allow him to live any longer. She set about charging at the man once more. You will do as I say. Naruto's voice penetrated through everyone's ears. He was truly angered at the moment. He focused his attention on his leg for a quick second to find it quite numb, and his bone was being reconstructed by the fox. He walked over to Hana who had only traveled a few feet. Let me handle this, why don't you go to the nearest town and wait there, I won't be long. He said his voice was far softer, but still dominant in tone. Hana and her dogs whimpered for a moment before shooting the transformed Kaosu a glare before retreating like Naruto said. How much longer Kaiubi? Not much longer Kit, next time don't be so foolish to lower your guard near an enemy. The fox berated his container. Don't worry it won't happen again. He thought, looking at Kaosu inspecting his appearance. What do you suppose this new appearance will bring? He asked. I was worried about this since I saw him do the first stage of the technique. Bijuu said a little vaguely. Naruto glared at the Iwanin, taking off his vest and throwing it to the side, the small tremor caused the transformed man to grin widely at that. Are you ready, team? The man asked the blonde. What the fuck do you mean by that, you fucking fox, that technique has stages. I thought it was a completely new technique. He ignored the man's question, but still remained aware. The beast ignored the blonde's previous statement and focused on the latter of the two, trust me kit, it is a new technique, in both power, speed, and everything else you can think of. I always thought it to be a rumor, but now I realize it to be true. The devil, the ruler of hell, has bestowed his power to a few humans. Naruto was shocked at the statement made, what the fuck do you mean, the damn devil gave his powers to humans. I never thought that was fucking possible, considering he's a demigod and everything. Meanwhile Kaso sneered at the blonde for ignoring his question, and Chakra was immediately expelled from his body, it changed the landscape and caused the trees to catch on fire. You will pay attention to me. He yelled charging at the blonde. Naruto cancelled his conversation with his tenant and promptly activated his Manjiku Sharingan. The forest of Hai no Kuni, currently Hana was far away from Naruto and Kaosu. She was seething at having to leave Naruto's side like that, leaving him to that monster. She dropped to the ground and entered a small village. Not long after entering did she feel a large amount of dark chakra being used from where she just left. She was about to run right back when her nine dogs barked at her to stop and stay, lest they get yelled at by Naruto again. Hana was reluctant in listening to her kin, but backed down and slowly walked through the town in search of an inn she could rent. On Hagakur, the shatter was heard throughout the office of the Hokage. His teacup shattered and he grew worried, he called his assistant and ordered that both Itachi and Kakashi be brought to his office. Minutes later both men appeared and saluted their leader. You two have a new mission. I recently sent Naruto-kun on a mission to receive one Jishin Kaosu of Iwa and bring him to this village to strengthen our ranks. The man said, causing the two Jounins to give a look in surprise. Jishin Kaosu, that fool actually accepted that mission. Who else went with him? Kakashi quickly asked his Hokage. Chuanin, in Yuzuka Hana, only to act as the tracker of the man. You sent a Chuanin with him. What are you senile with old age? Even alone Naruto cannot stand against a man, even with your training and everything else he went through. Kakashi yelled at the old man. I agree with Kakashi Senpai on this one, Naruto should know that a fight with a man as dangerous as Kaosu is about as dangerous as fighting all three of the Sanin at the same time. Itachi chimed in with his own opinion on the matter. The Sandane calmly sat in his seat and stoically stared at two of his strongest shinobi. Are you finished? He asked as the Sharingan users gulped for a quick second. Good, now I know what I'm doing and believe it or not, but Naruto also knows what he is doing. He accepted this mission with full knowledge about what he was getting into. He knows of the man that was said to do just as many S-ranked missions as even the Sandium Tsuchikage himself and come back relatively unscathed. He knows of the man's bloodlust for battle and wishes to test himself against such a man. A man that doesn't have the word restraint in his vocabulary. Sandame said, now don't forget about our blonde, I'm sure he has far more tricks up his sleeve than this man does. After all, I trained him myself. Now to business, I'm ordering you two to track down, find, and bring both Naruto and Kaosu back here, I'm sure they'll both be out of it by the time you arrive. He said waving his hand at them. The two Sharingan wielders left the village immediately in search of Naruto. 
Kakashi summoned Pakin and ordered the Nin dog to track the blonde Jounin. No problem Kakashi-san, but first feel my paw pad. He said showing the bottom of his paw to both Kakashi and Itachi. Thick marks appeared on the silver-haired Jounin's head. Itachi slowly looked at Kakashi, I'll find him on my own. He said slowly disappearing into a flock of crows. Come on Kakashi I know you want to feel it, you can't resist. The dog said to the cyclops. The tick mark grew in size before Kakashi sighed and proceeded to feel the animal's paw pad. Excellent, now I'll find Naruto-kun. The dog said sniffing the ground and promptly rocketed into the forest. Kakashi hung his head at what just happened and body flickered to his summoner's position. Hi no kuni clearing, the battle had been going down for about 10 minutes and both parties had yet to show signs of stopping. Naruto sent about a dozen punches, laced with lightning from his Shijeki Takina Kabushi, shocking fist, into the man's sternum. The lightning pierced through the man's defense and connected. His Manjiku eyes could see everything the man was going to do, so after sending his dozenth punch, he tilted to the left and did a quick handstand and used his foot to kick the man into the air. Instead of following up with more Tajutsu, the blonde began a series of hand seals, Futen. Boryoku Takina Kuki no Nami, Violent Airwave. The wind expanded the blonde's lungs to dangerous proportions before it was violently blown out of the Kanoha Jounin's mouth. A sudden violent storm engulfed the devil-powered man and he rocketed even higher into the air. Naruto continued to stare at the sky, seeming to relax the more he gazed, suddenly he became tense when his magnificent eyes witnessed broken pieces of the earth falling from the sky. He was just as suddenly swept from his feet when Kaosu appeared behind and he kicked at his legs, making the blonde do a backflip. The blonde landed on his stomach and coughed up blood onto the dirt when the Iwanin's boot crashed down on his back. Said man did a few hand seals, Doton. Chikyu no Kusari, chains of the earth, literally chains made of earth appeared out of the ground and bound every one of Naruto's limbs, including his torso. He lifted his foot once more and brought it down just as hard, causing more blood to exit from the blonde's mouth. He took his foot off and began another series of hand seals, Akuma no Yari, the devil's lance. A large spectral and fiery lance appeared above Kaosu's right hand. This is the end, it's been truly fun Namaka's Yuzumaki Ichiha Naruto. And by the way your name is way too long. He said, throwing the lance at the prone figure in front of him. Said lance was suddenly blocked by a fiery rib cage. a small struggle for dominance was performed, and when muscle, skin, and armor was added to the skeletal figure the lance was bounced off, shocking the man. The earth in chains were dissolved as Naruto slowly stood to his feet, his back facing his opponent. Your not so ultimate defense will meet my absolute ultimate defense. He said slowly turning around. Here meet Susanoo. He set his eyes in the form of his Iron Manjiku Sharingan. The armor covered skeletal figure brandished both his sword and shield and slammed said shield in front of the blonde. The giant figure was covered in a deep crimson layer of fiery chakra. Susanoo swung his sword at the man in a horizontal strike. Aosu jumped high into the air to dodge the strike from the fiery looking sword. Naruto saw this long before it was even performed, and a large fire dragon was already in Kaosu's face. Kaosu screamed in pain and fell to the ground and went straight into the ground. Going under me won't do a damn thing. Naruto growled, having Susanoo slam his sword into the ground, where another yell was heard, although it was muffled. Kaosu rose from the ground, at the end of Susanoo's sword, he was still screaming in pain, due to the flames entering from his shoulder. Kaosu began to move closer to Naruto without Susanoo moving an arm. From behind the shield Naruto walked closer to Kaosu, who was glaring daggers at Naruto. Jigoku no Kusari, Chains of Hell, Demon Enhanced Chains rose from below Kaosu and proceeded to wrap around every limb in his body. Slowly a cross rose from the ground and Kaosu was placed on the cross, the chains melting through the wooden cross and melding with it. Now Kaosu was on the cross with chains with deadly spikes wrapped around his body. Naruto shooed Susanoo away and walked closer to Kaosu and finally unsheathed his sword and looked Kaosu right in the eyes. Now you're in my world. Have fun. He said, piercing his sword through the man's stomach, causing the man to scream in pain from the penetration. He screamed yet again when he felt it happen again. He screamed when he felt it again and again and again, why isn't my defense working against his blade? No lightning chakra is surrounding it and it's not special I can see that. So why? As if reading his thoughts Naruto spoke up, I bet you're wondering why you're feeling such pain from simple stabs. The answer is simple. You're in my world and in my world your pain receptors are through the roofs and the smallest prick from my blade will make you feel unbearable pain. And you have about seven swords in you. He said, raising the next sword and thrusting it into the man's leg. The man gasped in pain blacked out. He suddenly awoke when he began to feel the swords exiting his body. What just happened? Why are you taking the swords out of my body? He asked himself more than Naruto. Naruto thrust the blade through the man's kneecaps, causing the man to scream in anguish. I thought I already told you this, you're in my world. 
he said, twirling his finger in a circle, making the man look around him to see. Nothing, just black and a crimson moon with a blonde's iron manjikusha ring and projecting from it. Now I took the swords from your body because I don't feel like killing you just yet. He said taking a step back and slammed his hands on a non-existent ground, causing a thousand hornets to rise from the darkness. The man showed balls and scoffed at the sight of the hornets. What are you going to do with those little bees? Their tiny stingers won't be able to pierce a single fiber of my perfect skin. He said laughing at the fact. Of course I could just make the stingers go through. Nah. I got something better. He thought, eyeing the man. You know you're right, that just means I got to find another way to torment you. He said thinking about it. The laughter stopped at what the blonde just said, damn it me and my big mouth, now I don't know what to expect. The eye would jound in thought as Naruto snapped his fingers. I got it. He said, commanding his hornets forward. One of the hornets went straight for the man's neck. Kaosu screamed as he felt the pain, that scream allowed the rest of the hornets to enter his mouth. It continued until the man exploded freeing the hornets. Everything went dark and Kaosu appeared yet again. Congratulations, you just endured one second of my Tsukiyomi. You have 71 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds left. Have fun. He said, causing the man to scream in pain for days. Real world, a second passed by and Kaosu's head dropped, his chin meeting his chest. Naruto released the chains, and Kaosu's body dropped to the floor. The trail of blood was dripping down from both of Naruto's eyes, his left more than his right as he had just used Tsukiyomi. He took a deep breath and promptly dropped to his knees and held both of his eyes in slight pain. Just because he couldn't go blind from prolonged use didn't mean that it didn't hurt like a bitch. He began whipping the blood from his face and walked over to the unconscious body and for the second time that day, began dragging it. That was most likely the most intense fight in my life, don't you think Kayubi? Naruto asked the fox, feeling like he was about to pass out. Yeah kid, the from I would gave you a run for your money. It's almost pathetic that you had to resort to such extremes to defeat him. The ancient being chided his container. What do you mean resort to such extremes? The last time I checked I didn't use not one tail, and I barely used any of your chakra. The only thing that's pathetic was that I had to use my eternal Manjikusharingan, but then again that was inevitable. I did learn that Taransu Jijin Kaihi, trans-dimensional evasion, isn't ready to be used in battle. He fired back at his tenant, rubbing his ribs from where Kaosu punched him extremely hard while he was trying to phase through the attack. Like I said pathetically, you should have used my chakra. But I am glad you didn't, like I always say, I don't want you relying on it, because one of these days you're going to encounter someone that can seal it off. I know, quit reminding me, how many times have you told me that? I think this'll be the 346th time. And you don't think I wouldn't have remembered it by now. He said cutting their connection in irritation. He continued walking until Itachi materialized in front of him, the last raven melding into his hand. Ah Naruto, I found you. Where's that Hana girl you were supposed to be teamed with? He asked looking at the unconscious man his little bro was dragging. Before Naruto could respond Kakashi and Pakan dropped down from the trees. Yo. Kakashi said, putting a hand into his pocket. The blonde half-heartedly glared at his old man. I sent Hana to the nearest village, which Pakan should be able to find easily. And as you can see he said before he dropped to the floor in exhaustion. The two Konoha ninjas sweat dropped and Itachi grabbed Naruto, while Kakashi grabbed Kaosu. After getting the bodies settled, Kakashi motioned for Pakan to locate the girl. After finding Hana sent the dog set off in its general direction, with the others following him. Chapter 15. Recuperation and Infiltration. Hi Nomura, Village of Fire. Itachi and Kakashi landed just in front of the gates of the village and began leisurely walking, while Pakin sniffed out Hana and her dogs. So how long do you think Naruto-kun's been fighting this guy? Pakin asked while sniffing the ground. Kakashi looked at Naruto on Itachi's back and looked over his wounds. Well I really can't tell, just from his wounds, but this is Naruto. He said to remind them of the fact. We can only guess that they've been fighting since they've met each other, eye to eye. Akin took a short break from his sniffing to look at Kakashi, so how long do you think he'll be out? Judging from the amount of dried blood on his face, coming from his eyes, I would say that he used the Manjiku techniques. Itachi said joining the small conversation. Akin looked at Itachi confused, that doesn't really. Those techniques empty the user's chakra reserves, like nobody's business. He interrupted Pakin. So he'll be out for at least a couple of days. Not to mention that he was fighting this brute right here. Kakashi said, pointing a thumb at Kaosu on his back. So add maybe a day or two, unless the Kaiubi puts an overtime to refill Nado-kun's already large reserves. Akin nodded his head and got back to sniffing the ground. Speaking of Kaosu, why is it that he isn't dead? I would have been sure that without an acceptance, Naruto-kun would have killed him. Itachi said knowing how Naruto felt about facing enemies, he liked not giving them a chance to enact revenge on him. 
We'll ask him when he wakes, which reminds me of something. Kakashi began as he scratched his head. Now with Naruto, temporarily, out of the picture. Do you still want to have the fight without him? Kakashi asked the conscious Acha. The Anbu captain began thinking, without Naruto, it wouldn't be as challenging to just focus on one opponent. That's the only reason why it's always been a triple threat, to keep us alert of another enemy. But if you want we can still go and the victor can face Naruto whenever he's at full health. The Kashi smirked behind his mask, would you shut up? I've finally pinpointed the girl's end. Packin said below the two Sharingan users before leaping on the rooftops. The two nodded and followed the dog, following it on the rooftops. Eyes T and Dango, Hana was miserable at the moment, she could sense the fight between Naruto and Kaosu was over. But Naruto had yet to return to her. Where could he possibly be? She thought slowly spinning a straw in her full teacup. So this is where you were? A voice said behind her. Anna perked up at catching a whiff of a highly familiar scent. She turned around, not to see Naruto. The way she expected. Hana ran to Itachi and caressed Naruto's head. Sweet Kami, please tell me he isn't dead. She told Itachi. Itachi shook his head. He isn't dead, he's just extremely exhausted from his fight with Kaosu. The man said, reassuring the lady. At that point a middle-aged woman walked up to the group. Hello, unless you're going to order something, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. You're dripping blood on the floor. She said pointing to said floor. All the ninjas looked at the floor to see a small puddle of blood below Kakashi. Oh that reminds me, Hana did you find an in yet? We need to patch these two up. He asked her. She nodded and they began walking with Hana and her dogs leading the way. The forest of death I stood in front of the gated forest. Both of them were armed to the teeth and equipment. Are you sure this is a good idea, an unsupervised trip to the forest of death will most likely kill us. I said loud enough for her team to hear, her ponytailed hair blowing in the wind. She was dressed in a dark green shirt, short enough to show her midriff. A short dark green skirt with black biker shorts underneath. On the back of her left hip was her ninja pouch. A shuriken holster on her left leg and black boots topped off her complete attire. The node sat on a rock drawing seals in a scroll, well just in case, I'm making a chakra storage scroll, in case we run low. She said with her silver hair also blowing in the wind. She too was also dressed for battle, she wore a black sleeveless leotard, with the top part of it being mesh. Over her leotard she wore a short dark green blouse and a pair of black pants and black sandals. She wore a large pouch that took up her whole hip that she used to carry all of her scrolls. On each of her wrist and ankles were weights, each weighing 50 pounds each. But these weren't like weights Lee uses, these were tattooed seals she herself drew. So she could cancel them any time she wanted. Don't worry I-chan, all we have to do is survive for two days. We're Naruto-sensei's genin squad, the best squad since the legendary Sanin, we can handle this. Hijeshi said, sitting on a nearby tree branch. He wore the same color scheme as his female teammates, with a loose-fitting kimono and hakama. On his lap was one of his blades, it was plain in design, but in his hands, it could cause all sorts of damage. He was in the process of sharpening said blade, with his teammates not caring about the sound it caused. Yeah I know we're good, but, still, no one doesn't even knows we're going in there. And plus a lot can happen in two days. I said, now pacing in front of the gate. What if we run into a horde of icky spiders, or any other bugs, then what do we do? She screamed frantically, revealing her fear of insects. Now finished with her last seal, Hinod let out a laugh, are you serious? Bugs. You're more scared of bugs than surviving in the forest of death, not to mention bugs are barely bigger than my big toe. She said looking at Hijeshi as they shared a laugh. The blue net blushed in embarrassment, yes so, oh, I'm afraid of bugs, what girl isn't? She said. Well I'm not sure, also you have the females in the Aburum clan and any other real Kinoichi. She said counting off her fingers. After hearing Hinode's statement eyes left eye, hey it rhymes, twitched in concealed anger. Did you just insult my status as a Kinoichi? She spoke with malice leaking off of her in waves. The Jeshi, not needing to be able to sense the anger coming from his blue-haired teammate, dropped from his branch and landed between them. All right that's enough, let's get inside that forest. No need for ill will to be between us when we need it most. He said looking at I. Said girl began to glare at her male comrade. Fine, but when we get out, I'm killing her. She said, stomping towards the gate and jumping over. The male genin let out a sigh, like she could kill me. Hinode said behind him as she too moved towards the gate. I'll just throw a grasshopper on her. She said before jumping over. An hour later, in front of the three genins was the remains of what used to be a large, very large centipede. Its blood everywhere, mostly around its severed segments, where even more and shurikens were pierced into. The Jeshi was busy swinging his sword to flick the excess blood off of it while I was glaring at Hinod. Barely the size of your big toe my ass. She said as the Hayuga had the decency to blush in embarrassment. Well how was I supposed to know it was going to be the size of a tree? 
It's my first time in this place. She said as the veins around her eyes became less pronounced. Judging by the size of this centipede, I can only guess the rest of the wildlife is the same size. The brown-haired male said, sheathing his blades into the sheaths on his right hip. I look terrified, that means we have to get out of here. There's no way I'm staying in this nightmare. She said, trying to make a run for it. The male genin grabbed one of her shoulders, preventing her escape. Would you quit being a scaredy cat, we're here to protect you. Also even if we get separated, you still have your tiger summons. He said relaxing his teammate. I thanked her teammate, and they each set out to look for a safe place to set up camp. Okage's office, Saratobi stood in front of his large window, stared out his window as a pair of clones did his paperwork. He puffed on his pipe and blew out a puff of smoke. They should have been back by now. What's taking them so long? Thought as he started walking around his office. He sighed, blowing out a stream of smoke as he dispelled his clones and sat in his chair, pushing the spare to the corner of the room. As he sat down, a trio of people entered his office. The old man looked at the youngsters before their sensei walked in the room. Hello, Tusama. Asuma said. Hiruzen smiled at seeing his son, hello Asuma-kun, to what do I owe the pleasure? He said refilling his pipe with new tobacco. The Jounin shrugged his shoulders. Nothing really, we just came to get a mission. The Sandame rose a brow, really? Why have you come to me personally, when you could go to the mission hall? At this Eno spoke up, because every time we go there, Haruka sensei gives us some crappy D-rank missions. I, for one, am tired of those missions. She said with a large tick mark on her forehead, angry just by thinking of picking up trash again. I hate to say it, but I agree with Eno on this one, picking up trash is a drag. Shikamaru said slowly scratching his head. Doji just picked up a handful of chips and stuffed them into his mouth, not needing to say anything to express his agreement with his teammates. Saratobi stared at his son, I've got to admit, in only a week they met the 15D rank quota, before asking for a C rank. He sighed before looking at the team. They each had the look of readiness on them, even Shikamaru. Saratobi could tell that during the past week they had reluctantly trained hard in anticipation of this moment. He mentally shrugged his shoulders before he dug through one of his drawers. Ino's eyes lit up at seeing her Hokage dig through his desk, mostly likely looking for a mission scroll. She wasn't disappointed when the old man raised a small scroll above the desk and opened it, browsing through its details, before putting it back inside the drawer, in hopes of finding a better mission, not involving any enemy ninja, but one that'll fit this team's specialty. Ah the old man sighed out, after reading through the latest scroll. All right, here you go. He said tossing the scroll to his son. Ino jumped and caught the scroll before her sensei could catch it. Let me see this. She muttered reading the scroll. What's the scroll saying Ino-chan? Choji asked with a new bag of chips in hand. The blonde looked at her plump teammate. Well, simply a group of bandits have been attacking the villages on the edges of the country and retreating to the nearest country to escape our wrath. That's where we come in, we're being sent to what is their next target, near the border of Yuno Kuni. She explained perfectly. Why do young Kinoichi you have there? Hiruzen commented on Ino's analysis. Asuma released a puff of smoke in pride, yup, she sure did change after a week of doing meaningless chores huh? He said laughing with his hand rubbing her head, ignoring her shouts about him messing up her hair. Alright Team 10, this will be your first real mission. I wish you luck. He said as they nodded and headed to pack up for the mission ahead, only Asuma was left behind. Protect them Asuma, they'll need your guidance. He said as his son nodded and left to wait for his team at the north gate. The forest of death, the two females in the team watched as their male comrade plopped himself on the ground in front of a river. Do you think he's going to be okay? Hinode asked as the swordsman ripped off his shirt, where three diagonal bloody slashes were seen, starting from his right shoulder and ending just in the middle of his chest. I looked at the ground in guilt, I hope, after all it was my fault all this happened. The Hayuga smacked her friend in the head, now don't go and start accusing yourself for what happened. It was my job to keep a lookout for threats like that panther. Even with that statement I still seemed sad that Hijeshi got hurt because of her. It's okay you two, I'm alright. Hijeshi said from his spot in front of the river, currently splashing water on his wound. Luckily the wound isn't as deep as it looks. He added. At this I reluctantly nodded her head, still feeling guilty about the turn of events. Neru sensei was going to be so disappointed in them. Hinode walked up to Hijeshi and crouched next to him, digging into her pouch, getting a sealing scroll from her pouch. And from the pouch she unsealed a small medical kit. After about 10 minutes of careful work, Hijeshi's upper torso was wrapped in gauze. Have I ever told you I love that you're not stuck up like the rest of your clan? Hijeshi asked his silver-haired teammate. Hino chuckled several times. She said, patting him on the arm as she stood. I summon your tigers and have them watch the perimeter. She said looking at her female teammate. I scoffed, who died and made you leader. She said regaining her usual disposition as she did a couple of hand seals. 
She slammed her hand on the ground and six, four foot tigers appeared. Nice to see Isama again. A tiger with a scar going vertically across his left eye said with a deep voice. What is it that you want from us? Asked a tigress. I'm going to need you six to watch the perimeter while we have lunch. I said as Hino began to unseal their rations. You know, maybe we should have brought that panther with us, it would have been better than eating our supplies. Hijeshi said from his spot by the lake. And who exactly was going to carry it here? Hinod said in an annoyed tone. Not only was it bigger than us, but it most likely weighed half a ton. I rolled her eyes and turned her attention back to her summons. Yeah, how about after the food is all done and eaten, you can go and find that panther or anything else you find in this place. She said as the tigers nodded and left the area. The village of fire. For the past hour and a half the trio used their knowledge of medicine to patch together the two fighters. As they finished Hana began her story about how the first half of the fight went. The two Sharingan users were engrossed into the story, finding it unbelievable about how devious the Iwanin was. And that's when he ordered me to leave. Chuanin said with her head down. As I was leaving I felt an ungodly amount of chakra feeling the air, I would have gone back, but I knew I was only going to be in the way. She added brushing a strand of hair from in front of the blonde's face. What's truly amazing is that was only the first half of the battle, only those two know how the rest of the fight went. Kakashi said, looking at his little brother. Itachi just nodded too busy looking at Kaosu, who was resting on the other side of the room. I'm going to have to test my own skills against this man, just like Naruto-kun. He thought. Because he knew that, even though the three of them have their fights every now and again, they never got ultimately serious and tried to outrightly kill each other. To do that would lead the winner to commit suicide because of the guilty depression. Ugh, my head is killing me. Everyone heard a voice say, only to look down to see Naruto holding his head while his eyes were shut tight. As soon as realization dawned on everybody, Hana pounced on him, crying tears of joy onto his bandaged chest. Everything she said was a mumble as she was buried in the blonde's chest. The only thing Naruto could do was yell in pain, but Hana didn't care, she was too happy. Hana-chan. Get. Off of me. Naruto rasped out as he tried opening his eyes, only to get temporarily blind because of the bright light. Ah. He dramatically screamed immediately shutting his eyes. Hearing his scream, Hana got off of Naruto and began checking on him, are you okay? Tell me where it hurts. Oh please be okay. She said, freaking out. Itachi put a calming hand on her shoulder and it did its job in calming her down. Naruto, this is Itachi, tell me what's wrong. Naruto moved his head in Itachi's direction, knowing that's where his voice was generated from. Uh, isn't it obvious? I overexerted my eyes, I'm going to be blind for a while. Don't worry though, our fight is still on for tomorrow. He said, giving him a thumbs up. Are you crazy? You're not fighting anybody, not after what you just went through. After we get you and Kaosu to the hospital in Konoha you're going to have to sit out the fight. Kakashi said from Naruto's right. I agree with him Naruto-kun, even with your advanced healing ability, it'll take at least a week to not only become 100% again, but to also regain your eyesight, well at least to safely use your Sharingan again. You'll be able to see in maybe a day or two. She said after doing a diagnostic scan on his eyes. Even though her skill revolved around animals, she could also do a couple of things for humans. Even without his sight, the trio could sense the disappointment in Naruto's eyes. Well, that means that I'll just have to see without seeing, for the meantime huh? He said softly mostly to himself. So when we hit the road, I don't feel like staying in this place for a long time, I would like to sleep in my own bed. The blonde said, trying to get up. He was prevented by Na's hand, you sir, are going to have to deal with it. We're going to stay here for the rest of the night. Doctor's orders. She added, taking her hand off of his chest before going to check on Kaosu's current state. The Kashi and Itachi stared at Naruto, knowing what he was talking about, it was taught to every Anbu to memorize every part of their surroundings. To see without seeing is to extend one's own chakra in an outward sphere around yourself. When the chakra hits an object, said object is processed within the mind and the person can then see without seeing. It is a risky technique to use because it forgoes the art of stealth because your chakra acts as a homing beacon for anyone that can sense chakra within distance of course. Even though it is taught, it was only mastered by the absolute best that the distance of the sphere goes from arm length to a maximum of 15 feet. No one thought of a name for the technique, even with its simple and yet complex characteristics. They both thought, each of them only ever achieving basic skill with the technique, as they preferred other skills. Currently the blonde was looking at the ceiling, concentrating on extending his chakra. I would advise against that kid. The voice of the fox and a mild feeling of pain stopped Naruto from trying to see. And why would I do that? I need to see furballs. The fox let out a sigh, I'm sure you felt it, because I felt it. That painful feeling was because not only did you overexert your eyes, but also your chakra coils. 
You should have dropped immediately after your fight was over, but you were still running on adrenaline. The fox explained. I know that now, I've been thinking about something though. Naruto inquired. Care to share? My purpose for fighting. Kaiubi stayed quiet, prompting Naruto to continue. Before I was even able to fight, what was my purpose to learn? He asked his tenant. Self-defense. Strength. The list is short, but I believe I know what you're talking about. You need a deeper meaning to fight. The fox began as he began thinking on the subject while viewing his container's life. Try fighting to protect, not to just protect your village, as you did in Anbu. Fight to protect your most closest and precious friends, your family, your lovers, your team. Fight to protect them, at all cost, because you know they'll do the same. Kaiubi ended his speech, leaving Naruto speechless. Wow furball, I didn't know you were that deep. The blonde thought in astonishment as he began to think about the people the fox listed. The forest of death, ah. Get it away from me. A certain blue-haired girl screamed as a man-sized praying mantis was currently dueling against the trio of Genin. The node could see I freaking out with her active Byakugan. Would you get it together, just do what you're good at. Launch a technique at the bastard. She growled ducking under a very sharp appendage. I swear after this is all over, I'm tossing you in the Aburum compound. Hijeshi said, backing away from another swing from the large and fast insect. It's not my fault. I hate bugs. I screamed again. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.